and the live stream marathon. It works on YouTube. Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Um, so this is our fourth uh, Ask Me Anything session uh, at Eurosys, the first one for today. Uh, so just to remind you, uh, we have a Slack channel for the Ask Me Anything sessions, hashtag uh, AMA. So there is a pinned post uh, over there for today's Ask Me Anything session. Please go ahead and uh, post your questions uh, there for our guest. Uh, and with that, I will um, give the floor to Oana to introduce our guest 
and get us started. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, Ask Me Anything session. I am uh, Wana Balmo. I'm an assistant professor at uh, McGill University. And, uh, my research is um, at the intersection of uh, computer systems and uh, storage systems, uh, mostly focusing on data intensive applications. And uh, today I have the great pleasure to uh, moderate the Ask Me Anything session with uh, Hajit Atia, who um, obtained the PhD at the Hebrew University in 1987. And uh, after a postdoc at MIT, joined the Technion at, um, in 1990. Uh, her research is distributed computing and uh, particularly in recent years, uh, she has been working at the intersection with formal methods for the specification and the design of distributed systems. She's also editor in chief of uh, Springer's Journal of uh, Distributed Computing and a fellow of the ACM. And last but not least, she is a co-winner of the Dijkstra Prize in Distributed Computing for the ABD algorithm for implementing false tolerant shared memory in message passing systems. And, uh, it's, um, I'm really excited about this session. And I'm going to uh, start looking at, the, um, at our Slack channel here. Uh, so uh, welcome, Hajit. <laughs> hey, thanks. Thanks for having me. It's a unique pleasure to be in yours, especially since I don't consider myself to be a real uh, systems person at all, actually. Yeah. So let's, uh, let's begin with the first question that has the most upvotes on Slack uh, from um, Karim uh, Manawil from uh, University of Edinburgh. Have you ever come across an idea and you told yourself, oh, this is such a great idea with such a huge potential, but to our day, you've uh, never seen it come to life? Hmm. That's uh, a real tough one, to be honest. Um, so, so one thing that I think have been done and, and is used a lot, but I feel maybe not to its full potential is actually uh, log structured uh, systems. I think you might like it. Uh, but uh, I mean, that there are log structures, uh, structured file systems and storage and whatever, but uh, uh, log structured uh, uh, things, whatever, uh, have a great potential, both because theoretically they have behaviors that are uh, interesting. And I, I dare say uh, they have a great potential uh, in, 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 in the architectural side. Uh, side. So, I mean, again, it's done, but I feel that there's more to be done there, uh, to be had there. Mm. Yes, and I personally definitely uh, like this answer <laughs> since uh, that's, uh, that's uh, what I've been doing for the past five years. <laughs> All right, uh, thank you. Let's, uh, let's move on to uh, the next one here from uh, Antonios uh, Katsarakis, from, also from the uh, University of Edinburgh. Uh, after all your work at the intersection of theory and practice, what is your opinion on the relationship between theory and practice? Is it pure synergy or it also contains tension? For example, uh, see the quotes below. Misunderstood theory is or equals bad practice and pre-existing theory limits creative practice. Um, so that's a good one. Uh, and something that I thought about quite a lot. And uh, one cannot say that we have a uh, great uh, synergy between theory and practice. And I think both uh, sides are, uh, are to blame in some sense. Uh, um, I think theory uh, should be more aware of what systems uh, are, what kind of systems are being built, what's necessary, what are the concerns what are the uh, targets and goals and, and, and where people are, want to go and should be informed about that. Um, on the other hand, I feel sometimes that um, systems people are too easy to ignore, uh, to, to, to quickly ignore uh, what's done in, in the theory side. And again, the blame is on both sides. Uh, I think theory uh, theoreticians should work harder 
to uh, communicate uh, what they are doing. They should also work harder to be informed about why they are doing what they are doing and be aware of, of why, uh, whether stuff is relevant or not. And again, on the other side, systems people should not uh, dismiss uh, theory uh, as quickly. I mean, I think it's easy to say, okay, here's this impossibility result or algorithm, uh, you go and take it. Uh, I think uh, we should communicate and interact around this result. We should, uh, and then understand how it applies to, to system building and make sure it's interpreted in the right way. So an impossibility result, not all, usually don't say that you shouldn't be doing something. It actually says, you should be careful about how you are specifying your problem, or maybe there are uh, more, uh, more uh, features in your system that you could be exploiting and so on and so forth. And same for algorithms. They give you like uh, an idea where you could be going, but then actually deploying them is, is a challenge. Hmm. I could say more. I think, uh, I think we could, uh, the general distributed, uh, distributed systems, uh, community could learn some more from uh, the database community, where I think the, they are more successful at uh, at uh, maintaining the interaction and the, I don't know if synergy is a good word, but the synergy between theory and practice. And I think both sides are, are uh, benefiting from that. Yes, it's definitely very valuable to combine, I think, theory and practice. And uh, actually, I'll follow up with a question uh, from uh, me <laughs> that I, uh, I meant to ask you. So. For, for junior PhD students who are, let's say, more versed in computer systems, what advice would you give to blend more theory insights into their research? So where should they start? Um, you know, start by taking a good uh, distributed computing class. And I would suggest to read the papers. I mean, it's, I, I actually find it surprising how, very, uh, how little people really read the class, so to speak, the classics. Uh, classic papers, so you know the the Dykes Award papers or, or whatever. So there's a, a canon of papers, and I, I see people citing papers, uh, and I always have a suspicion that they haven't really read them. So uh, <laughs> I, I think I have better advice to say to the theoreticians on how to follow on systems uh, to to strengthen their uh, systems benefits, but. Uh, but I think start by just following and, and then just don't feel you don't have what to learn from theory work. I think that's mm. the most important. All right, uh, let's uh, switch gear a bit. So um, have here um, more uh, uh, technical questions for, from uh, Karim uh, Manawil uh, from uh, Edinburgh. Uh, do you think distributed shared memory operating systems are worth it in the present time? That's um, you know above my pay scale. I'm, I'm, I'm not the person to ask to, to answer this question. Uh, to be honest, uh, I, I I don't know. I just don't hmm. know. All right. Which is another thing that theoreticians uh, should be uh, careful about is is to be uh, aware of our limitations uh, to answer practical questions uh, questions about practical systems. Uh, let's. Um... Uh, let's go with another uh, uh, another uh, technical question. This time from uh, Pramod uh, uh, Batutia from uh, TU Munich. Uh, how do you see the advancements in formal verification techniques for distributed systems? So, what are the interesting opportunities? So, this actually, I think, is uh, at least from my experience, is a is a really good crossover uh, or, or gateway. Uh, uh, for for theory and uh, and practice because formal uh, methods in general uh, are kind of living in between they they can speak easily to theoreticians and they speak often to system uh, building um, I think any uh, so, so we've seen these days um, several big challenges for distributed computing uh, the the easy ones uh, are uh, in in uh, uh, blockchain systems, obviously, and large-scale replication uh, in general. And the other is in applications to machine learning, uh, like the, the actual computation of, of uh, uh, big machine learn learning algorithms in, uh, in distributed environments. And I think both uh, pose uh, um, 
different challenges, uh, both algorithmic uh, wise and, uh, and definitely I think formal methods and, and things are happening. More for, for blockchains, I think uh, distributed uh, machine learning is still yearning uh, for, for more formal methods and more algorithms actually. Hmm. No, not just engineering, so to speak, or heuristics. I, thank you. Um, I'm uh, looking here, uh, trying to group these questions, but uh, let's um, let's jump a little bit from um, to a um, uh, uh, personal question from uh, Vasiliki uh, Vasya Kal Kalavri from Boston University. How did you start your research career? Uh, you know, like everyone, I finished. Uh, uh, so actually, I, I, I did my uh, master's in a very different uh, topic on nat natural language processing and, you know, very kind of old, old fashioned AI, but I wasn't happy with my advisor and I, I just, it just wasn't working for me. And uh, my, one of my uh, friends actually was a PhD student with Danny Dolev, Amots Varnoy, actually. And he said, well, why, why don't you speak with Danny about uh, the possibility of a PhD? And uh, Danny got to be on my, uh, my, exam, my master's exam committee. And this was like June or something. And Danny at that time used to leave for the whole summer uh, to work in IBM Malmaden. And kind of exam, he said, well, I liked what I saw. And here I leave you in my office, like a stack of papers, like really, truly that high. And he left for three weeks, three months. You know, here I am alone in Jerusalem with that stack of papers, like actually the classics, really. And I was, you know, <laughs> left to fend with these papers and um, and speaking with the uh, Amots, of course. And uh, so that's how I started my PhD. And uh, and then from there, things were pretty routine, nothing interesting, I mean, pretty common. But, uh, yeah, it's um, it's interesting to hear about uh, these uh, these switches in the beginning, about yeah. uh, uh, jumping from one uh, one field to the other. Um, let's see the next question here we have from uh, Animesh Trivedi from VU Amsterdam. So uh, similar to the questions asked before in the last couple of days. What is your favorite project or paper that elegantly puts theory and practice together? Of mine or of other people? I can answer both. I think uh, I think it's of others, but uh, I don't see why you wouldn't include yours as well. I'll, I'll answer first the others. <laughs> Let me be uh, humble. So definitely, I think that's probably the, 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 the best of the best is for me, uh, FLP is, is just such a, such a lovely paper, actually. I mean, the, I mean, the result is, is fundamental. And actually, as I mentioned before, I, I, even I haven't read this paper for a while. And I've, I went back to it a few, a few months ago and I realized how short and succinct and, and just really a pretty paper. And the result, of course, is totally meaningful and is stated in the most uh, uh, elementary way. So you can see how it carries over uh, to so many uh, situations. And, and it's really a truly fundamental paper. Um, and my own uh, work, if I, uh, is, the, uh, is a paper from about 10 years ago, uh, the Laws of Order uh, paper with Rashid and, and others. And um, so again, I, I, I actually want to speak a little bit about how it came to be, uh, because I think it, uh, it tells you how theoreticians can uh, get across to, to, to systems people. So I was, uh, somehow I got to work, I worked on other work, uh, on other things uh, with people doing uh, verification. And I met uh, Martin Vechev and uh, who was working at uh, IBM Yorktown uh, at the time. And I got to visit him and, uh, and Mug and Michael, and they sat with me and said, oh, you have all these uh, impossibility results. And then there's the Spurns and Lynch paper and all very complicated results. And he said, but we are trying to implement this, uh, um, this uh, non-commutative, uh, non, um, 
a faithful uh, queue and we are not able to do this without uh, inserting a fence there. And we have this algorithm that does a, does a queue without a fence, but uh, it gets duplicates and we want to show that it's necessary and so on and so forth. And you know, the whole thing was phrased in a very ad hoc and, and very uh, from their own experience uh, manner. And I went back uh, and, and started thinking about it and stripping away all the, all the stuff, all, all the, the baggage and all the ornaments that was uh, around this. And, and it's, it's really hard to define what the fence is in a theoretical sense and so on and so forth. And working more and more uh, on that with Rashid and with the other authors uh, on, on the paper and the theory side, uh, we ended up uh, proving that uh, you must enforce a read after uh, write uh, operation unless you have an anatomic uh, operation. And, and kind of the proof revealed itself and the proof mm -hmm. also revealed what would be the condition on the type of objects that are uh, uh, susceptible uh, to this lower bound. And, uh, you know, there's um, a few years ago, I was, I, I'm getting this uh, email message from a friend, uh, Dan Safir, actually, who's probably somewhere on this uh, conference. And he says, I'm here in SOSP and somebody had your name on a slide. It's like, uh, oh. Uh, so, um, so I guess uh, it's uh, extremely satisfying to know when your work uh, gets across your close uh, community and makes an impact in, in a larger scale community. That's such a great story. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, I can imagine it's uh, really satisfying to see, to see the broad reach. Yeah. And uh, to follow up on that, another uh, personal question. Uh, so uh, given this work, this intersection between the practice and the theory and what you just said about it being satisfying to cross the boundaries, how do you pick your research questions now? Uh, so I guess there are, um, I guess I would say on three trajectories. Okay. So first I have this like uh, small set of really hard theoretical problems that have been with me for a long time. I wouldn't mention them here. I mean, like, uh, you, you know, things that are highly theoretical, uh, like, can we beat the particular lower bound for uh, doing atomic snapshots and can you do renaming and very few names and so on and so forth. So these things I keep coming back whenever I learn a new uh, technique, I try to see if it applies there. Uh, the other way, more relevant, is actually I follow the, the literature or attend conferences or, or listen to talks and so on. And, and I really listen and I interact with people to see whether, whether they have questions and, uh, or whether I uh, can I articulate questions from uh, the, the lectures I'm hearing. And then once I'm on a particular topic, uh, one thing that I really like to do is to put together all the pieces that I know. So I actually even draw maps or, or tables or things like that to identify what I already know, what is, what is already known, and to see connections and see where there are uh, holes or, or places that are un uncharted. And then I try to like see what are the boundaries and where, where I should play, where, where the game is playing and maybe by that figuring out what should be used there. Mm. Yeah, it's really, really great to hear this uh, visual style yeah. of, uh, of detecting yeah. the boundary between knowledge and new knowledge. And, and knowledge, <laughs> yeah. And I think yeah. it's, once you are in, in a problem, it's a really good way to see what can be done or should be done, or maybe even some, some uh, ideas how to attack a problem. Mm. And, uh, I think we have time for just one more from um, Amir uh, Kordadi from the University of Edinburgh. Uh, despite having so many great works on distributed systems, shared memory, etc., you just said at the beginning of the session, I don't consider myself uh, a systems researcher. So uh, who do you consider to be a systems researcher? Well, so here's why I don't consider myself to be a systems researcher. It's because I never built a system. And I, I don't, I mean, I, I have implemented algorithms, but only for a brief time. And actually it was when I was on a sabbatical at the startup company. So not as part of my real research. Uh, and uh, so that's, I think if you haven't uh, dipped your hands in, in, in doing uh, 
building a system or at least, uh, you know, implementing algorithm that runs from start to beginning, uh, I, I will not consider myself to be a systems researcher until this happens, which probably wouldn't <laughs> by now, but who knows? There's a, you know, never say never, right? <laughs> never say never, exactly. Because, yeah. All right, so I see here that we actually have 10 more minutes to go. I thought it was a, a 20 minute slot, but uh, if there is more time, I would actually love to uh, ask you something about um, non-volatile memory. So I um, I noticed uh, so that your recent uh, research interests revolve around using um, this new technology. So uh, in your opinion, what do you see as the main challenges and the main opportunities that uh, uh, non-volatile memory brings to us? So there's the near-term challenge that I think many people concentrate on is the fact that uh, non-volatile memory uh, is not immediate, that, that you writes to the non-volatile memory are not immediate. Uh, I actually, I mean, so we need to address that, but I actually feel that uh, uh, the architectures, uh, the, the chips, whatever, uh, will be there soon or, or sooner or later. So, so I feel that that's a, a hiccup that will be over in some time. Um, I think this, this uh, actually, uh, I, I've listened to Peter Alvarez uh, talk yesterday and, and I think uh, thinking of, of the memory as easily accessible and there all the time, means we need to think differently about uh, uh, recovery and fault tolerance, for example. And, uh, and we also need to think of the computation uh, as being resumed, not necessarily by the same agent that performed past computation. This also means that's actually even until they'll solve, resolve this uh, timeliness of, uh, of persistence, uh, we need to think about uh, computations uh, not being totally precise. So we need to pick mm. up the computation, not at exactly the same place where we left it. And I think, uh, you know, uh, coming from the theoretical side, the, the, uh, the theoretical problems of uh, approximate agreement, for example, uh, and, and other problems, I think uh, more computations are amenable to, uh, to being not exactly precise, uh, working with not exactly precise data. It actually ties also to, to issues of machine learning. Uh, but th there are many computations uh, that, that could use uh, high, high, uh, big uh, geo distribution uh, that need not be totally precise and synchronized. So where you could pick the computations, not exactly where you left it, and you can rejoin a computation, not exactly where you left it. Mm. I think understanding that uh, could lead to uh, a lot of benefits. Yeah, that, that's a that's a great take actually for approximative computation. Do you think that there would be room for this kind of uh, uh, approximation even in the way that we store the data? So maybe maybe we are we can afford to lose certain uh, certain items or yes, I, I I mean my shallow understanding of some of these uh, mathematical computations is that. Uh, they are almost inherently robust and almost inherently can use, uh, uh, handle imprecision. Uh, and uh, you could uh, exploit that imprecision in, in, and it would be interesting to do this in a systematic way, not in an mm. ad hoc yep. uh, problem specific uh, way, but probably the way to get there is to think about some particular problems and, uh, and then uh, generalize. So would the, this uh, high performance computing uh, uh, project be something that uh, you think is amenable to um, to these kinds of approximations? Probably, that's mm -hmm. my, my say, I guess, an educated guess. Yeah. Uh, well, oh, okay. I see a new question here from um, Muhammad Usama Sardar from the University of uh, Dresden. What is your perspective on process-based TEEs versus uh, VM-based TEEs? Will VM-based TEEs be the future? Um, this is, uh, I, 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 you know, again, 
I don't feel uh, qualified to, to really say something about that. That's uh, not my expertise. And, uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, I believe that um, this is uh, this is all the questions that uh, that we have in the Slack, and um, uh, it was uh, it was really uh, really a pleasure to uh, to talk to you today. Same here. And thanks uh, for inviting me. And I'm really happy to have had the opportunity to speak with you personally and uh, through you with the community. Pleasure. Thank you, every, uh, everyone. Thank you, Anna and Hagate. It was a pleasure to uh, hear the two of you. Uh, so with that, I guess we uh, pass it over to the chair of the next session. So just to remind everyone, we have another Ask Me Anything uh, session uh, later today with Peter Drussel. So see you there.
everyone. So let me see. Just wait for one minute. So, um, hello everyone, and welcome to the first session of technical session of today's uh, Eurosys. Uh, so today we have now we have session four on uh, cloud and ML, and we have six very exciting papers on the topics of cloud uh, resource management, machine learning, and uh, internet traffic control. And um, we will uh, start with the first paper on smart harvest, uh, on harvesting idle CPUs safely and efficiently in the cloud. Uh, the presenter of this paper is Yawen Wang, um, who is a fourth uh, year PhD student at Stanford University, and her research work focuses on leveraging ML-based methods to efficiently and intelligently manage resources in the cloud. Um, also, let me remind you that uh, we have the channel on Slack on Conf session four. So please post your questions there and uh, we will talk about those after the end of the presentation. So let's have the first presentation, please. Hi everyone, this is Yawen Wang from Stanford University. Today I will present our work on Smart Harvest, harvesting idle CPUs safely and efficiently in the cloud. This is joint work done in collaboration between Stanford University and Microsoft Research. Cloud computing has emerged as the dominant platform for computing in recent years. However, despite its growing popularity, the underlying resources in the cloud are not always getting effectively utilized. This figure shows 2017 data from Microsoft, which reported that 60% of the VMs running on Azure has an average CPU utilization of below 20%. The common reason for CPU underutilization in the cloud is that users often over-provision their VMs based on the peak load. And this is especially true for user-facing workloads that require consistent low latency. One common way to improve CPU utilization is to use spare resources from latency sensitive workloads to run batch processing tasks. In order to do this safely without violating performance constraints of latency sensitive workloads, prior works have either required extensive offline workload profiling or knowing application level characteristics. Unfortunately, these prior approaches are not applicable in public cloud. And this is because VMs are often opaque boxes in public cloud. Cloud providers have no knowledge of what is running inside the VM. Therefore, in public cloud, we can only monitor VMs with low level counters such as their CPU usage. And to be more careful when borrowing cores from VMs, we should be conservative and assume that any VM may be running latency sensitive workload. We are proposing a new solution called Smart Harvest to improve CPU utilization in the cloud. It uses online learning to continuously learn and predict future CPU usage of opaque customer primary VMs based on their past usage. It safely harvests unused cores from primary VMs to run low priority batch processing jobs inside a new type of VM called Elastic VM. It uses a two level safeguard design to help reduce performance impact on primary VMs when the learning model frequently under predicts their CPU demands. At runtime, Smart Harvest dynamically allocates cores among VMs to minimize impact on primary VMs while maximizing the number of cores harvested. I'll next describe Elastic VM, a new type of VM that we're introducing. Elastic VM runs batch workloads on idle cores unused by primary VMs. It has a minimum set of guaranteed resources. It will not be launched if there's not enough resources on the server to meet this minimum. It has lower priority than primary customer VMs, and the number of cores assigned to it will change dynamically based on CPU usage from primary VMs. Lastly, it's configured to have as many virtual cores as the total number of physical cores on the server, so it can always make effective use of any harvested cores. Let's now go over the high-level design of Smart Harvest to see how it works. 
In this diagram, the orange box shows a 10 core primary VM that is currently using five out of its 10 allocated cores. The green box shows the elastic VM, which starts with a single core. The gray box shows the main root partition of Hyper-V on the server, where we run the EVM agent. The EVM agent is responsible for monitoring server-wide CPU usage, learning and predicting CPU usage of primary VMs and reassigning cores among primary VMs and the elastic VM. Let's suppose that the EVM agent predicts the primary VM will need a peak of seven cores for time window TI. Then the agent can shrink the CPU size of the primary VM to seven and reassign the remaining three idle cores to the elastic VM. This leaves primary VM with an idle buffer of two cores. The idle buffer can help absorb any bursts from primary VM during time window TI. If at the end of TI, we observe that the peak usage of primary VM was six cores, then we have provisioned enough cores to observe the true CPU peak usage of the primary VM. And we now have full feedback for the agent to update the learning model and make a new prediction for the next time window. Based on the pre a predicted peak, the agent can then adjust the VM sizes accordingly. Let's now consider a different situation. Let's suppose the primary VM uses up all its assigned cores during TI. Then we have a safety violation because the primary VM could have needed more cores, hence suffering from performance loss. In this case, we don't know what the true peak usage of the primary VM is. So we only have a partial feedback. Without knowledge of the true peak, we will not update the model. The agent now conservatively estimates primary VM CPU peak for the next time window to be one plus peak observed over the last second and return cores from elastic VM to the primary VM. We call this actions as a short-term safeguard in smart harvest. And it is triggered when we don't have full feedback information to utilize the learning model. Additionally, the EVM agent monitors the primary VM's vCPU wait time to be dispatched onto physical cores. And we use that as a proxy for VM performance. When the primary VM experiences long vCPU wait time, the agent returns all its cores back. We call this a long-term safeguard. It is triggered when we can infer performance degradation of primary VM from long vCPU wait time. This could happen if the workload run inside primary VM is unlearnable and the agent continuously underpredicts its CPU usage. Next, I will discuss how Smart Harvest predicts VM CPU usage to help safely harvest un unused cores. The constantly changing CPU utilization of VMs makes it challenging to accurately predict future usage. To address this challenge, we use an online learning algorithm in Smart Harvest, which updates the model with each newly observed data point. The online learning approach avoids offline training and profiling, making it possible to learn different workload characteristics after they've started. We also choose to make predictions of CPU usage of primary VMs on a fine time granularity of every 25 millisecond. This helps the learning model quickly detect changes in CPU usage patterns and adapt to them. The prediction target is the peak CPU usage in number of cores of the primary VM for the next 25 millisecond. The set of features we use include five simple statistics, average standard deviation, minimum, maximum, and median, computed from past CPU usage data of the primary VM. We considered additional features such as different percentiles, but found this five features to be the most useful. When deciding what model to use for online learning, we considered two requirements. First, we want the model to be simple and lightweight, so it takes less computation resources and can make frequent predictions. This leaves complicated models such as neural network out of consideration. Secondly, we want to be able to differentiate between under and over predictions when updating the model. Under predicting CPU peak of primary VMs is a more severe problem because it could negatively impact primary performance. With these two requirements in mind, we decided to use a cost sensitive multi class classification model in Smart Harvest. It trains a separate linear regression model for each class, where the class label represents the peak number of cores needed by the primary VM for the next time window. The class with the lowest predicted cost is chosen as a prediction. It allows flexible cost assignment to different class labels. It also provides fast prediction and update times, which take less than 15 microseconds on average in our implementation.
When we know the true peak CPU usage of a primary VM from a time window, we have full feedback to assign a cost to each class label and update the model. This figure shows the example cost function we use to assign cost to class labels for our six core primary VM. The cost linearly increases as the class label becomes further away from the true peak. Based on the true peak usage, classes that were under predicting are penalized more to skew the model away from aggressive harvesting. On the right, it shows the cost assignments for a six core primary VM, where the true CPU peak for a given time window is observed to be three cores. We can see that classes that would underpredict have significantly higher costs than classes that would overpredict. For evaluation, we run four different latency sensitive workloads in the primary VM. We look at the P99 latency to measure the impact of harvesting on their performance. For the Elastic VM, we run CPU Bully, a synthetic CPU bound workload that helps estimate the number of harvest cores. We compare smart harvest with two alternative harvesting policies. The fixed buffer policy dynamically adjusts primary VM CPU size to ensure there's always a fixed number of cores in the idle buffer. The previous peak policy simply estimates peak usage of the primary VM based on the recent peak observed over the last 25 milliseconds. We conducted our experiments on an Intel server running the Hyper-V hypervisor. Let's now look at some results when we co-locate a single 10 core primary VM with an elastic VM. For each experiment, we run a different latency-sensitive workload in the primary VM and the CPU bully inside the elastic VM. Each experiment lasts for a minute. The set of figures here shows the baseline P99 latency for each primary workload when no core is harvested. The horizontal line marks a 10% increase from the baseline P99 latency. Let's first look at the performance of different fixed buffer policy. Each data point is denoted with the corresponding fixed buffer size next to it. The general trend for the fixed buffer policy can be observed across workloads. As we inc increase the size of the fixed buffer, the impact on the P99 latency decreases, but it also harvests fewer cores. When we pick out a single best fixed buffer size that harvests the most while staying below the 10% increase, it is different for each workload. This is expected as each workload exhibits a different CPU usage pattern. For the previous peak policy, we noticed that it can significantly increase the P99 latency for some workloads. This is due to sudden increases in CPU usage that is not captured from the recent peak usage. Finally, let's look at the results for Smart Harvest. With the predictive power of online learning, it consistently harvests 1.5 to 3.5 cores across different workloads without per application tuning or any knowledge of application level information. At the same time, Smart Harvest also has less than 10% impact on P99 latency for our workloads. When we look at all the results side by side, we can see that Smart Harvest all performs alternative policies by harvesting a good amount of idle CPU's resources while maintaining a small impact on different latency sensitive workloads. We have completed a more thorough evaluation of Smart Harvest Due to the limited time, these additional results are not covered in this talk, but we invite you to read about them in our paper. In conclusion, we have designed Smart Harvest to manage CPU resources in the cloud with online learning. It automatically learns and adapts to CPU usage of different applications and varying load patterns inside opaque primary VMs. It harvests spare CPU cores while minimizing performance impacts on primary VMs. And the evaluation results show that it can effectively improve CPU utilization in the cloud. Thank you, and you can contact me via email for any questions. Um, thank you very much, Yao Wen, for this uh, very interesting talk. Um, let me see. So uh, do we have any questions? Hello. Uh, let me see. So we don't have any questions of the channel so far. Uh, so let me ask you the first question um, on this work, which I think it's a, a quite refreshing solution on a, on a, on a very uh, research topic over the last many years. Mm -hmm. um, so um, your method uses a safeguard mechanism, a long-term safeguard mechanism. And let me just remind us that it's, it relies on the virtual CPU wait time, basically. And this is above a certain threshold as far as, far as I understand. 
it triggers um, uh, more allocation. So um, I guess this, this can be quite important in the flow of, your, of the algorithm. So however, virtual CPU wait time can be quite noisy and can be very different across workloads. So how can you, do you like um, have a fixed threshold across all workloads and how do you come up with a certain number? Yeah, that's a really good question. I agree that the vCPU time can be noisy. Um, so for our experiments, we tuned that we are using a fixed threshold and we tuned that threshold based on um, MemcacheD, which was um, the most latency critical or sensitive workload in our experiments that has um, microsecond um, latent, P99 latency. Um, so we, Although it is noisy, but we were noticing like a clear increase from the vCPU wait time when um, the memcached DVM were not given um, enough CPU cores to complete its work. Um, and I think there could also be other reasons um, for why this increase of, of vCPU um, time exists. For example, it may not be that the learning model is making uh, incorrect predictions, but instead it could be that the primary VM was uh, initially not allocated enough cores. So for that case, yes, you will also see the increase in the vCPU time, although that's not a direct result from employing this learning-based solution. However, since we already noticed that regardless of the reason, if the primary VM was not um, giving enough or sufficient number of cores as it would have lacked, we were going to be safe and disable learning. Because whenever you are going to enable learning, there is a possibility that the learning algorithm could underpredict, um, and uh, that could result in a negative impact. And I think the primary goal for this work, although we definitely want to increase the CPU utilization, at the same time, we definitely don't want to um, impact significantly impact the primary VM's performance. Sure. Okay. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank so you. I I don't think we have any other question from the audience. Uh, so I I think at this point um, I would like to thank Yeah, when Unfortunately, we don't have time for more questions, but you can uh, people can read your papers, and I guess uh, uh, we can have uh, more questions. But there is one question um in the chat so one by Di diana andrea popescu um can this approach be extended to other types of resources such as network storage yeah um that's also a good question so i do believe this um learning based uh, solution or the learning algorithm we used in the solution is general enough to apply to other types of resources so for example we sort of we Kind of considered uh, applying this to also harvesting spare memory. Uh, but I think the learning approach would also be applicable. Um, and the challenge there is more like engineering efforts of how you ensure that whenever you're resizing that type of resource, there is no um, negative consequences left behind. For example, if you're harvesting memory, like you need to make sure that um, all the pages are cleared and updated so that um, whatever the change is want to uh, be taken, it should be taken um, more like immediately and not affect what is happening next. Okay. Um, I'm just gonna ask one more question, uh, one more question from the thread. Um, so by Marco Canini, um, have you analyzed the reasons why the model mispredictions, and if so, what are the main ones? Um, uh, sorry to repeat the question. It's uh, have you analyzed uh, the reasons why the model has mispredictions, and if so, what are the main ones? Mm, yeah, we haven't um, done a um, extensive analysis on the reasons why the model would underpredict. Uh, but to me, I think the uh, main reason would be that um, there is basically too much variation in the workload. And it is, for example, like the model is learning based on the pattern it has seen in the past. However, if there's a sudden change um, of characteristic in the workload, there's a like, sudden burst that has never occurred in the, in the past, then the first time that's happening is going to cause the model to underpredict. However, after that has happened, the model could leverage this information to make better predictions in the future. Okay. If, the, if this pattern, 
pattern persist in the workload. There are definitely workloads that are more un unpredictable, uh, just in essence. And we have uh, found some workloads of that type and we talk a little bit more about them in the paper where the long-term safeguard helps. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, Wen, thank you so much for the very interesting presentation and the and your work. There are a couple more um, a couple more questions on the Slack on this channel, so please um, do follow up um, on those. So let's uh, continue with the next uh, presentation, please. So the next presentation uh, is on. Um, uh, yeah, the next presentation uh, is by Abhinav, Abhinav uh, Jangda, sorry for the pronunciation, on, and the paper is on accelerating graph sampling for graph machine learning using GPUs. So Abhinav is a PhD student at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, and his research interests are at the intersection of programming languages and high performance computing. So let's start with the video, please. Hello, I'm Abhinav. I'm a PhD student at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. I'm going to present our work on accelerating graph sampling applications using GPUs. Graph data is widely used and several kinds of data can be represented in the form of a graph. For example, social networks is a graph where a person represents a node and edges between two persons represents a relationship. Knowledge bases and relational data are commonly presented as graphs. Machine learning on graphs is used to predict outcomes based on the structure of the input graph data. Machine learning on graphs is used in many places. For example, a recommendation system combines features from multiple products and users to recommend product to new users. An emerging application of graph machine learning is in search. A search technique can utilize the connection between different words in a knowledge graph to improve search results. In graph machine learning, there is a graph neural network which encodes the vertices of the input graph to an embedding in an n-dimensional space. There are, these embeddings are then decoded and used for downstream tasks like clustering and product recommendation. There are two types of graph neural networks. First is a sampling paste which samples the input graph and train using these samples. Second is the whole graph based GNNs that train on input graph directly. In this work, we focus on sampling based GNNs because they are more common. In more detail, a sampling based graph neural network contains two stages. It first samples the input graph using a graph sampling algorithm. For example, the algorithm here samples two hop neighborhood of different vertices. These samples are then merged into mini batches. In second stage, each mini batch is used by neural network to obtain the final value. Sampling here enables data panel trailing. There are several graph ML and GNN algorithms that use different types of sampling algorithms. For example, DeepWalk and NodeWalk performs a random walk of fixed length starting from an input vertex. Two hop neighborhood sampling of a vertex is performed by GraphSage. Fast GCN and Ladies samples fixed number of vertices for graph for each layer. And cluster GCN divides a graph into many clusters and samples one or more of these clusters. Hence, developing new graph sampling algorithms is an active area of research. Since it is easy for domain experts to implement graph sampling on CPUs in existing DNA systems, graph sampling is performed on CPU. And these samples are then fed to neural network running on the GPU. However, this easy to implement architecture limits performance. We evaluated six GNNs on a 32 core CPU and one GPU and found that sampling can take up to 60% of total training time. With multi GPU training, which is common in distributed machine learning, the overhead will increase substantially. Hence, sampling is a bottleneck of the GNN training. So how can we provide best of both worlds to domain experts that is easy to write and fast graph sampling applications? Our answer to that question is Nextdoor. So Nextdoor is a system to accelerate graph sampling on GPUs. It contains a simple and powerful API to express several kinds of graph sampling algorithms. It contains an approach to parallel graph sampling 
which we call as transit parallel. It performs load balancing and caching to optimize GP utilization and improves end-to-end -end -end time of GNS by up to 4x. So let's look into the Nextdoor's abstraction for graph sampling applications first. So in our abstraction, our graph sampling application runs for k-steps. For example, a two-hop neighborhood application on the right runs for two steps. The application has one or more vertices in the beginning. In our abstraction, we define a transit vertex at a step i, whose neighbors may be sampled at step i. At the first step, the transit vertex is the root vertex. At each step, the application samples at most m i vertices of each transit vertex. So here, each, at each step, two neighbors of a transit vertex are sampled. So let's look at how two hop neighborhood sampling can be represented in this abstraction. At step 0, the transit vertex is 2 and two neighbors of the, of the transit vertex need to be sampled. And these two neighbors are 4 and 1. In the next step, the 4 and 1 becomes the transit vertices. Again, the application performs the sampling of the vertices of 4 first and then the vertices and then the neighbors of 1. So finally, the application has performed the sampling and it is finished. So next door contains a simple and powerful API based on this abstraction. On the right hand side, we can see that the, this API Using this API, a two-hop neighborhood application can be represented in 10 lines of code. We have implemented 10 applications in the API, such as layer sampling, several kinds of random walk, importer sampling, minimal variance sampling. So this API provides two necessary information to Nextdoor for efficient execution. First, a distinction between the sample and transit is provided by this API. Second, it provides the number of steps and number of vertices sampled at each step. So how can we implement this API on a GPU? For that, let's first look at the organization of a GPU. So a GPU contains several multiprocessors. It also contains a large but high latency memory. And each simultaneous multiprocessor can execute a thread block. Each thread block has a private small but low latency memory and has several numbers of threads. So this low latency memory can be utilized using as a software managed cache. So let's look at the efficient way to access lower memory, which is which happens when consecutive threads access consecutive memory locations. And this access can take up to 200 cycles. The inefficient way is if consecutive threads performs random memory accesses, which takes 800 cycles. So now let's look at our proposed approach of transit parallel sampling, which assigns consecutive threads to samples with common transits. This helps in achieving regularity. So we will see this approach using the two-hop neighborhood example, which has three samples, and at step one, these are the transit vertices. In transit parallel sampling, we group samples related to same transits and create a map of transits and samples using a hand-optimized GPU kernel. This map is used by the sampling kernel to assign samples of each transit to consecutive threads. For example, all samples with transit 4 are assigned to consecutive threads, similarly for transit vertex 1 and transit vertex 6. Edges are stored in lower memory. Each thread writes a neighbor to its corresponding sample. And in this case, let's see how are the memory access being performed by consecutive threads. So here, consecutive threads perform accesses to the same edge list. So this regularity helps in uh, to coalesce memory accesses and it can cache the neighbor's edge list in shared memory registers. So next door improves transit parallelism by doing load balancing and caching of neighbors in a transit. So the load balancer takes the transit to sample map as input and launch three kernels. The grid kernel is for transits with more than 256 samples. In this kernel, the neighbors are cached in shared memory. 
Third block kernel is for transits with samples between 256 and 32. In this kernel, the neighbors are cached in shared memory again. Finally, sub op kernel is used for transits with sample less than 32 and neighbors are cached in registers. So this technique helps to completely utilize GPU's computation and memory resources. So in the implementation, Nextel utilizes parallel radix sort, GPU-based parallel radix sort and prefix scan for group by operation and load balancing. It is implemented in CUDA 11 and C++14 and is publicly available at this URL. Let's look at the performance evaluation of Nextdoor on 10 different sampling applications. The baselines that we used are Night King, which is a system to express random walks and execute them efficiently, and the samplers in existing general systems. We do the evaluation on four real world graphs and use a dual socket 16 core Intel CPU and uh, four NVIDIA Tesla V100 GPUs as our evaluation system. So we first integrated Nextdoor graph sampling implementation into GNS and found that Nextdoor can achieve up to 4x improvement over the Mandela GNS. And this is substantial on large graphs. This is only possible because next because of Nextdoor's fast graph sampling implementations. So we evaluated Nextdoor against the existing baselines of graph sampling. And for Night King, it achieves speed up, up to 50x, and for other GNN implementations, it achieves up speed ups up to 2000x. Hence, Nextdoor achieves orders of magnitude speed up over CPU baselines. So, in summary, graph sampling can take significant time of training in graph neural networks, and efficient graph sampling on GPU is hard. Hence, we developed Nextdoor a system to write the graph sampling applications efficiently and a runtime to optimize the memory accesses in GPU and effectively balances load. We found that Nextor achieves orders of magnitude speed up over existing solutions and improves the end-to-end -end time of GNS by up to 4x on large graphs. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um Ambino <laughs> for yeah. the very interesting uh, talk on this topic. Um, I guess I'll, I'll ask one question. Um, if there are any questions, please post them on the thread channel. Um, so I think what, what I'm interested here is, is how, um, what was the main challenge in your work in terms of actually implementing this and going from the idea to the real thing? And what, what did you find as the main challenge there? Um, so the main challenge here is, so there are two kinds of approach, the transit parallel approach that I, that I just mentioned. And, um, and there is another traditional approach that is used by these GNN systems that you can, go, that you can implement on the GPUs. And basically you have each thread uh, doing doing the sampling for each sample. Uh, now, uh, now that has random memory accesses because each sample can do their own different vertices and threads are consecutive threads are uh, are expanding neighbors of the vertices. Um, so that's the main challenge. That how do you actually optimize the memory accesses? How do you make sure that um, that the that you can actually you can actually use the different kinds of memories that GPUs provide to improve the execution. And, and with transit parallel sampling, we found that if we actually uh, do this group by operation, which uh, fortunately can be done very efficiently using handwritten kernels, um, we can achieve significant speed up. Okay, thank you very much. Um, there was one question, uh, but was deleted. Unfortunately, I cannot see it anymore. Um, so if there aren't any questions at this point, I think I'm going to, we have to move to the next presentation. Um, Abhinav, thank you so much thank for you. the presentation and your work. Thank so you. we now move to uh, the next uh, presentation and the next paper on rubber band cloud-based high parameter tuning. And the presentation is by Lisa Dunlap. 
um, who recently graduated the undergraduate school at Berkeley Math and Computer Science and now works as an ML engineer at Splunk's Applied Research Team. She's also part of the RISE lab at Berkeley, uh, where she works on interpretable ML and distributed systems for ML, and will be returning to Berkeley in fall for a PhD. And it might be that Lisa is actually the youngest presenter in Eurosys in terms of years in graduate school. So let's start the presentation, please. Hello, my name is Lisa. I'm going to be a first year PhD student at UC Berkeley. And today I'm really excited to talk to you all about Rubberband, the cloud-based system for hyperparameter tuning. So cloud computing is huge and machine learning developers have been moving a lot of their ML workflows onto the big cloud providers. And a lot of the operational costs of these machine learning companies are going to cloud compute. So the question is, because compute is so expensive, on these providers, why are we still doing really computationally expensive procedures like hyperparameter tuning in the same way that we would in a data center environment where we have a fixed pool of resources and we frankly don't care as much whether we're underutilizing them? So what is hyperparameter tuning and why are we doing it incorrectly? Well, hyperparameter tuning aims to determine the optimal configuration of model hyperparameters by repeatedly training different candidate configurations or trials and selecting the one which yields the highest accuracy. So there are many different ways in which you can go about doing this hyperparameter tuning. We're specifically going to focus on what are called early stopping techniques in which you launch a ton of trials and you eliminate them in stages. So we're going to focus on what's called the successive halving algorithm which simply halves the number of trials for each stage, eliminating the ones with low accuracy. So these techniques tend to exploit stage level parallelism, which reduces overall job completion time by running training and evaluation concurrently for all trials within that stage. However, these techniques thus far have only focused on exploiting parallelism over a fixed pool of compute resources. So why can this be a problem in the cloud setting? Well, when you're running this all on a fixed pool of resources, this can lead to a degradation in cluster resource utilization throughout the experiment as the numbers of trials decrease. So either you can have the number of resources per trial or the trial level parallelism stay the same throughout the entire experiment in which you're going to leave a lot of resources idle for a lot of the experiment, or you can increase the trial parallelism as the poor performing trials are eliminated, which is a better option, but leads to significant communication overheads and thus the model throughput will actually scale sublinearly with the number of machines that you get it. So either way that you do this, you are effectively wasting resources when you run these early stopping algorithms with a fixed pool of resources. So this may not have been a problem in your traditional data center, but when you're running on the cloud where say training BERT takes $7,000, this can quickly lead to wasting so much money. The most cost-effective solution here would be to simply run each trial with one resource for the entire duration of your experiment, deprovisioning instances as they are no longer needed. So while this is quite cost-effective, it is not time-effective, as most times your duration of your experiment will be quite long. So many machine learning developers are willing to sort of trade off the efficiency that comes from not scaling your model in order to get a shorter job completion time, which is where this problem gets so interesting. So what we're trying to solve is given a time constraint, how can we minimize the execution cost of a hyperparameter tuning job? So to address this problem, we can break it down into three key challenges that we need to look at. The first is how to accurately model the job completion time and cost of a given allocation plan. 
The second is how to navigate the large search base of possible allocation plans to find one that finishes on time and is also low cost. And the third is how to execute this allocation plan in a way that we maximize cluster utilization and worker co-location. To address these challenges, we design rubber band, the first framework for cost-efficient elastic execution of hyperparameter tuning jobs on the cloud. First, let's look at how we address issue number one, modeling job completion time and cost. So for this, we're going to address it in two ways. First is by doing a profiling step before the experiment uh, in which we're going to capture both model level metrics and cost model level metrics. These are things like training latency, model scalability with number of machines, as well as things like instance initialization latency, your billing model, the price of your instance or function, and the potential data movement price. So for each potential allocation plan, rubber band is going to use this information to synthesize a directed acyclic graph that incorporates the cost and latency of initializing an instance, scaling up or down, training models for a specific number of epics with a specific number of resources, and evaluating the model at the end of the stage. So, once this DAG is generated, our planner can predict the job completion time of a candidate allocation plan by just computing the critical path, and cost can be calculated in a very similar manner. So now that we have a way of simulating the job completion time and cost of a given allocation plan, we can work on issue two, finding a low-cost allocation plan that finishes on time. So this is done by Rubber Band's Resource Allocation Planner, which uh, does a four-step process. The first step is generating a new set of candidates from our current best allocation plan. The second is to predict each of their job completion times and costs using Rubber Band Simulator. The third is to greedily select the new best candidate based on maximizing what we call the cost marginal benefit, which is the reduction in cost normalized by the increase in runtime. And then the fourth step is we're going to iterate on this with the new best candidate until we reach a plan that is no longer feasible. Now that we have both our simulator and our low cost allocation plan, we can move on to issue three, how to effectively execute this allocation plan in a way that optimizes for worker co-location and maximizes cluster utilization. So this is done by Rubber Band's executor, which is comprised of a scheduler, a cluster manager, and a placement controller. So at the end of a stage or whenever a cluster needs to be changed or resources need to be reallocated, the scheduler will request the cluster manager to provision new nodes or to deprovision existing ones. And then to relocate workers, the placement controller will convert the resource quantity allocated to each trial into physical resource assignments for its workers. So what this placement controller is going to do is it's going to place parallel workers of a trial onto a single machine or at least packed into a minimal set of nodes. Why do we want this? Well, by co-locating workers, the distributed training algorithm will avoid incurring any unnecessary network overhead. So here we've depicted the system architecture of Rubber Band. It's built on top of Ray, which is a distributed computing platform. Pink arrows are going to represent invocations, while gray arrows are going to represent object dependencies. So like we talked about, the profiler and the simulator are going to be the ones which model job completion time and cost of a given allocation plan. This simulator is used by the planner, which generates candidate plans and finds the one that is low cost. And then this low cost allocation plan is fed into your executor, where your scheduler is going to schedule the trials, determine which ones get to continue, 
your cluster manager is going to control the cluster, make sure it's the right size, and your placement controller is going to make sure that your trials are placed in a way which maximize worker co-location and cluster utilization. So now that we've gone through how rubber band works, let's look at what everyone's interested in, the end-to-end -end results. So for these end-to-end -end results, let's first check to make sure that the simulation that we have described in rubber band is able to accurately predict the job completion time and cost in a real world setting. So the above graphs here show the simulated predictions of the job completion time in seconds and the cost in dollars when running a 20 minute experiment training ResNet 101 on CIFAR 10. And then the orange bars represent the real job completion time and cost when running this same workload on an AWS P3 8X large instance. So here we can see that the simulation is highly accurate to what we see in real time. So now that we know that the simulation is accurate, let's check what the actual cost savings are. So here we are running again on AWS P3 8x instances, and we're showing the difference between running on a static cluster and rubber band on three different data sets with three different models. So first we have CIFAR 10 on ResNet 101, CIFAR 100 on ResNet 152, and RTE, which is part of the GLUE dataset benchmark, which is for NLP, and this is on BERT. So we can see that rubber band is able to reduce the cost by 20 to 53% in all of these instances. Well, that's all the time I have for right now. But if you would like to see some more experiments, uh, specifically ablations on the effect of our placement policy or the effect of the different aspects of your profiling information, like your instance latency, your training latency, or anything like that, please come check out our paper. I'm happy to take any questions. And thank you so much. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you very much. Really nice to see you. Um, so um, there is one question um, in the thread by Johan Hausholt. Um, is this hardware, is your approach hardware agnostic? There doesn't seem to be anything GPU specific. So this could be used with ASICs, TPUs, CPUs only system, um, they're asking. And did you study the performance per dollar um, like CPU only could much be cheaper, but slower could only be cheap could only could much be cheaper, but also slower. Yeah, so it is agnostic to the hardware. So as long as you have, since we have this profiling step, um, you could use this with any type of, of instance that you want. Um, what, was, what was the second question again? I forgot. Did you, did you study the performance per dollar? For, performance per dollar. So I guess it's um, uh, how much would you would it cost per dollar, or did you um, did you count just for the total amount of the uh, total amount of dollar at the end of the simulation? Oh yeah, so we did the the total amount per like like the total amount for the entire uh, experiment. So uh, in this work, essentially the worse uh, model scaling that you have, the, the better rubber band is going to perform compared to your baseline. Um, so I, I'm not 100% sure what they mean by per dollar, but essentially you would have to do it by experiment because if your experiment is uh, really long relative to your workload, you're just going to get to what the most cost effective plan is, which is to just run one trial on one machine for the entire duration of the experiment. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, so unfortunately, we don't have much time for more questions, but thank you, Lisa, so much. Good luck with your PhD starting at home. <laughs> uh, and uh, we'll continue now to the next presentation, please. Um, so the next paper, is by Jen She, if I if I pronounce the name uh, 
uh, correctly. So, and the paper is on Taho tree structure aware high performance inference engine for decision tree ensemble on GPU. Uh, Zen is currently a postdoctoral researcher at U UC Merced, and his research interests include optimizing, optimizing HPC applications on various parallel architectures. Um, Zen is in the job market and looking for a postdoctoral position in the HPC field in the United States. So let's start with the video, please. Hi, everyone. I'm Zen Xie, a postdoctor in University of California, Merced. In this talk, I will present a paper, Taho, Tree Structure Aware High Performance Inference Engine for Decentry Ensemble on GPU. This is joint work with my fellow students and my advisor, Professor Dong Li. So, what I'm going to do is give this in a few parts. First, I was going to talk about the background, what's the decentry inference, and then we will fall into some observations that motivated us to drive this topic. And then I will introduce the details of our framework, Tahu. It includes three main components. The framework Tahu will be evaluated using 50 datasets and the decentry symbols. And I will do some questions and answers at the end. Okay, what's the tree inference? Decision tree is a highly effective structure within which you can lay out options and investigate the possible outcome outcome of choosing those options. Decision tree inference can be used to help build automated predictive models. As we can see from this figure, this tree determines whether I accept this job or not. It includes salary, milk hour, and the free coffee. These things are also easy to understand for us. So, how is the decentralized inference actually used? A lot of companies use GPU for tree inference to average massive thread level parallelism and high memory bandwidth to provide high throughput inference. For example, Facebook uses high throughput tree inference engine on GPU to decide which notifications to send to billions of users, as well as Microsoft News select customized content to display. NVIDIA uses a high throughput tree library, FIL, on GPU to serve massive inference requests. However, to enable high throughput inference on GPU has some performance but bottlenecks. The first one is different GPU thread traverse different trees and can take different passes and access different attributes of imprint samples during the forest travels, which cause irregular memory access pattern and node imbalancing problems. The second one is that given sample of inference, each thread uses its assigned tree to make a prediction and then all thread performs a thread reduction to compute on the final prediction. It also have a high overhead. We study these problems using a random forest trained by XGBoost on a common dataset, Hages. From the first figure, we observed that the ratio of the request data to total data fetched from global memory is only 60% because of uncorrelated memory excesses. From the second figure, the reduction of operation takes up to 53% of total inference time in our example with 120 trees. This figure shows the execution time of thread in a thread block. The thread block performs inference for 1,000 samples. We use the coefficient of variation to quantify the variance. The CV equals to almost 50%, indicating a large variance in execution time across threads. To solve these performance bottlenecks, this paper proposed Taho, a tree structure where high performance inference engine on GPU. Taho designs an adaptive forest format to enable correlated memory accesses 
and the node balance. Besides, we introduce a set of inference structure, which of which can use shared memory differently and has different implications on reduction overhead. We also introduce performance models to guide the selection of the inference structure. Then we will introduce them in details. Adaptive forest format introduces two techniques to arrange nodes and trees. The first one is probability-based node arrangement. Based on the information of edge probability, it is if the left child has the lower probability to be visited than the right child. We sweep, swap the two ch children nodes. The method goes from the top to to the bottom of the trees. From this figure, the edge probability of two children nodes of the root load at the second level is 0.3 and 0.7. The right child load has highly higher probability to be visited than the left child node. Hence, we swap two children node. The second one is similarity-based tree rearrangement. We address the load imbalance problem based on the similarity of trees. We claim two trees are similar if during the inference, the two trees tend to be traversed during similar paths and access similar attributes. As we can see from this figure, the order of the tree lined in memory is T2, T3, and T1 because T2 and T3 has the largest similarity, and T3 and T1 has the second largest similarity. Then, we study how to address the problem of high reduction overhead. We also explore how to make the best use of shared memory for high performance. To avoid the reduction and explore the performance potential of shared memory, we introduce several inference structures as follows. These structures use shined memory and the reduction mechanism differently. We study the performance of the four inference structure using 50 datasets on NVIDIA P100 GPU. The result is shown in this figure. The red marks and are the method that corresponds to the best performance. For example, the direct method performs best than others on two datasets, SVHN and GSTAR. The shined forest method perform, perform better than the other, others in five datasets. We can easily observe that no single structure can perform best in all datasets. We also change the simple batch size to study the impact of it on performance. For example, for HGS dataset, when the batch size is less than 10,000, the sharing data method performs best. Otherwise, the splitting sharing forest performs best. So we can get these insights. No single structure can perform best in all datasets with different batch size datasets and forests. And the usage of shared memory and the reduction overhead impact the performance. So we need a tool to decide which method is best. Motivated by the insights, we use performance modeling to decide which inference structure you should be used for best performance. The table needs the model notation we used. It includes attributes of forest, bandwidth, and the thread number of GPUs. The details performance models are listed below. You can get more ex explanation from our paper. We evaluate this work using three GPUs, such as Tesla K18, Tes Tesla P100, and Tesla V100. The input dataset includes 50 datasets from UCI and the LibSVM, in which 60% of each dataset is using for training and 30% is using for inference. The baseline is 
a high throughput tree library FIL in NVIDIA Rapid Suite, which is a state of the art and open source library. This figure shows throughput on all datasets. It shows the performance of using two batch sites, 100,000 representing the user case with high parallelism and 100 presenting the user case with low parallelism. It shows that the Tahoe performs much better than FIL. For high parallelism, Tahoe introduced over the three times speed up on average on three generations of GPUs. For lower parallelism, Tahoe introduced over 1.4 times speedups on average on three GPUs. We use NV Proof to quantify the load imbalance and read, uh, memory efficiency. With Tahoe, the global memory read throughput is improved greatly on three GPU. We merge the average coefficient of variation of execution time across thread in a thread block in the 50 forest. The average coefficient of variation is reduced by over 60 percent percentage on average on three generations of GPUs. In particular, the biggest forest gain the largest benefit from load balancing because there is a large variance in these forests. Tahoe also remove, remove the block-wise reduction for 27 cases from 45 cases. For scalability analysis, we evenly partition each inference dataset into multiple GPUs. Each GPU has one partition. Overall, Tahoe scales very well as the system scale increases. For some datasets such as Hawk, Gist, and Porsche, the performance improvement is not scalable because these datasets are really small. The weak scanning, for weak scanning, good weak scanning will observe the result from the fact there is almost no communication between GPUs. In conclusion, decision tree ensembles play a important rules in many applications. However, how to use them effectively for inference on GPU is challenged because of irregular memory access pattern and node imbalance across threads. We introduced Tahoe, an inference engine on GPU that consider the common passes of tree travel and the similarity of tree topologies to address these problems. Tahoe largely outperform uh, industry quality inference engine. I'm done with this talk. Thanks to everyone. I'm ready to take any questions. Thank you, Shen. Thank you for the lovely presentation. Um, do we have any questions in the channel? Um, so I can ask one while people think of uh, any questions. So I'm just going to ask something, <laughs> a detail. Uh, mm -hmm. from your presentation, really. Um, um, there are lots of things, but there was one thing that's kind of like um, sounded interesting. So in the case of removing blockwise reduction, you mentioned success in 27 cases out of 45. So what made these cases successful and what didn't work for the rest of the cases? Yes, we, we, we removed the blockwise re reduction because we're using a new design and algorithms. We design new structures to remove the reduction. As in, for example, we we can we can use the reduction a lot, so we can remove the reduction, blockwise reduction. Just because we we design a new algorithm to for the tree inference, so we we remove some of the blockwise reduction. And we use a performance model to design which which structure will be used online. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, would you consider an, an evaluation against a non GPU implementation? What? Um, would you evaluate against any non GPU? Yes. You uh, you said uh, CPU or some FPGA. Oh. Yes. Uh, 
most of this work is done on GPU because we use the global memory. We, we, the main, main in improvement is we, we want to improve the memory accesses on efficiency on global memory. So most of this work is based on the GPU. So we, we can, yes, as you can see, we can use the similar algorithms on GPU or something to improve the performance. Yes, yes, it's a good idea, yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you so much uh, for the very interesting presentation on this paper. So we now move to the next um, to the next presentation, um, and uh, the next paper is uh, on the title. Of the next paper is "Take It to the Limit: Peak Prediction Driven Resource Overcommitment in Data Centers," and uh, the presenter of the next paper is Noman Bashir. Uh, who is a PhD student at the Sustainable Computing Lab, University of Massachusetts Amherst, and his research focuses on energy efficiency and sustainability on uh, large-scale computing and cyber-physical systems. And uh, the work that he's uh, presenting us today was done while he was working as a student researcher at Google during 2021. And you can find more information about uh, Noman on LinkedIn and his webpage. So let's start with a video, please. From University of Massachusetts, Amherst. I'm here to talk about our work on resource overcommitment in data centers. This work was done while I was working as a student researcher at Google. Our work focuses on overcommitment, but before I go into the details of our work, I would like to briefly describe the kind of system architecture that our work targets. The architecture I'm going to describe uses the terminology of Google's Borg scheduler. This is because our work is deployed inside Vogue, but the general architecture is used by many resource management platforms such as Kubernetes and Mesos. In Vogue, a cell refers to a group of machines that are managed by a centralized entity called Vogue Master. Various applications submit tasks to the Vogue Master. In our case, these applications are Google services such as YouTube, Gmail, plus the workload submitted by the internal users. Each task that comes to the Borg has a defined limit on the number of resources it will use. This limit on resources can be set by a user, an application, or an entity outside Borg. Once the tasks arise, Borg master schedules them onto the machine. There are two steps to the scheduling process. First step is to find the right bins that can fit the tasks. To do that, Borg Master will select machines that have the right hardware and permissions among other factors. Also, it will talk to Borglets running on each machine to ask for the available capacity on per machine basis. Once it has selected the set of machines, it then uses a bin packing algorithm to pack the selected bins with tasks. Please note that without overcommitment, the sum of allocated resources to the tasks is less than the physical capacity of the machine. Now let's take a step back and see what does overcommitment mean in this context. We say that a machine is overcommitted when sum of allocated resources to the tasks is greater than the machine's physical capacity. This is commonly used solution to increase the resource utilization and decrease overall cost. It is used by many data center schedulers, such as our very own resource scheduler, Borg. Overcommitment is also supported by many cloud resource management platforms, such as Kubernetes, GCP, and vSphere. State-of-the-art algorithms used by these platforms overcommit by a fixed margin. Such a fixed margin may be perfect for some machines, waste resources on low-utilized machines, and incur risk on highly-utilized machines. And therefore, our work focuses on developing policies that find the right level of overcommitment on per machine basis. Now that we know our system architecture and what overcommitment means, let's see where does the problem of finding the right overcommitment level fits into this setup. If you remember from slide one, there are two steps to the scheduling task. Finding the right bins and packing the tasks to the bins. In this setup, finding the right level of overcommitment is basically the task of estimating free capacity on a machine. This is because the free capacity determines how many resources are available for overcommitment. Given this formulation of overcommitment problem, 
our work is complementary and orthogonal to the scheduling problem in data centers. And while solving this problem of finding the right level of overcommitment, we make three key contributions. First, we formalize the overcommitment problem using first principles. Second, we propose a general methodology for designing and evaluating overcommitment policies. And finally, we provide tools that enable people to follow the same methodology and devise their own overcommitment policies for their production environments. Finding free capacity is a systems problem in general. For example, in Vogue, the scheduler posts the machine for the available capacity. However, if we look closely, it's a per machine peak prediction problem. Let's consider a very simple example to illustrate this point. Let's assume there is a single machine and one task is running on it. The task has been allocated all the available resources on the machine. And at some point in time, the scheduler asks the machine for the available capacity. If we estimate free capacity based on allocations, we may end up wasting resources if the task never uses all of its allocations. And if we estimate it based on the current usage, we may not have this much capacity later on if tasks usage increase. However, if we know the peak usage of the current task in the future, we can confidently advertise the free capacity to the scheduler. An algorithm that uses the future knowledge and provides the available capacity, we call such an algorithm peak oracle. Peak oracle is the safest algorithm that algorithm that provides us the most saving. Since peak Oracle uses future knowledge, it cannot be implemented in practice. However, given the peak Oracle, the task of finding the future peak becomes a supervised learning problem. This formulation allows us to use prior work on developing predictive models. However, developing practical peak predictors is our secondary contribution. Therefore, we present a few very simple and lightweight predictors in our paper. They either take some percentile of past usage or mean plus some standard deviation. While these predictors perform well, as you will see in the evaluations, there is a significant room for improvement. By reducing the overcommitment problem to a peak prediction problem, we have given us the power of running different scenarios in offline simulation to design, tune, and evaluate a practical peak predictor. This allows us to quickly iterate through multiple designs without conducting any risky and time-consuming experiments in production. I will briefly describe our simulation setup next. At time t is equal to zero, we use a given practical peak predictors to predict the future peak using prior data. At the same time, we use peak oracle algorithm to get the true peak in the future. We compare the predicted peak with the true peak to see how a practical peak predictor performs. We release our simulator as an open source software that allows anyone to design and evaluate their own predictors. The standardized interface offered by the simulator enables an easy integration into a Borg or Kubernetes-like platform later on. With the simulator in place, we need to look into the metrics to quantify a predictor's performance. The traditional metrics such as MAE, MSE, and MAPE are not applicable here because over, under, and exact predictions have different impact on our system. For example, it is fine if the predicted peak is higher than the true peak. Our system will have low savings, but there will be no performance degradation. Exact predictions are of course ideal as they give us the most saving while being safe. Finally, under predicting the peak is dangerous for the system due to the possibility of performance degradation and task evictions. We summarize these three scenarios into two categories, Oracle violations or no Oracle violations. We measure the performance of a predictor in simulation using violation rate, which is the ratio of number of Oracle violations and the total time instances. The ideal violation rate is of course zero. However, it is impossible to achieve in practice. And the level of acceptable violation rate is dependent on the SLOs defined for the tasks. So violation rate uh, quantifies the system's performance in simulation. However, in production, the quality of service is measured using different metrics. 
since uh, we overcommit CPUs, uh, CPU resources in this work, CPU scheduling latency is the metric of choice for the latency sensitive serving tasks that we focus on in this work. We conducted an experiment to quantify the correlation between violation rate and CPU scheduling latency. This graph shows us as the violation rate increases, the CPU scheduling latency increases as well. This shows that our metric of choice in simulation is representative of our predictor's performance in production. We evaluate our prediction uh, policies in simulation as well as production. In simulation, we use the latest version of Google's publicly available cluster trace, and we use our simulation to tune the parameters of individual predictors as well as compare different peak predictors. We, developed, we deployed our best performing predictor from simulation on several thousand machines in data centers that run Google's serving workload. In production, we compare our approach to Google's default overcommitment policy used by Borg in an AB experiment. In simulation, we use three metrics. First one is the violation rate that we have discussed previously. The second metric is the violation severity, which tells us how severe the violation is when it happens. And finally, saving ratio tells us how much additional capacity we generate as a result of overcommitment. In production environment, we use all the three metrics mentioned, by in, mentioned for simulation, as well as some additional metrics, such as how much more workload is being allocated to the machines, how much actual workload has increased, and finally, how do these policies affect the performance. Here, I present selected results from the production environment. This graph represents the CDF of workload for the experiment and control group. We see that the workload has increased by around 6% due to our overcommitment policies on the experiment group. We next look at the performance metric to see if the increased overcommitment has any impact on the performance. This graph shows the CDF of CPU scheduling latency. Even with higher overcommitment, experiment group performs better than the control group. And to view the additional results from simulation and production and understand why both the workload and performance increases, please refer to the paper or longer version of the talk. To conclude the talk, I will outline a few key takeaways. We proposed a general methodology for designing and evaluating overcommitment policies. We established a correlation between simulation results and performance in production. We demonstrated that our simple peak predictors outperform state of the art. There are also few uh, potential future uh, research directions. There is a significant room for improvement in our practical peak predictors. We are yet to test more sophisticated but lightweight machine learning algorithms. And if you want to use our simulator, uh, I have provided the links for the code, data, and documentation. And if you need any help, I'm not sure why the video ended abruptly, yeah. but if you need any help, uh, please feel free to contact me. Great, thank you. <laughs> it's good to have the live stream, actually. <laughs> so, um, thank Naman, thank you very much for the very interesting presentation. Um, I don't see any questions in the thread, but um, let me ask you one. Um, so this is a very interesting work, and I, I just wanted to ask, so you have worked with a few predictors at, at this point, I guess. <laughs> uh, so what is your intuition about having a good predictor and, and how the how, how good are the predictors that you've already seen? I mean, you also mentioned about the use of machine learning and so on, but at the end of the day, what what, do you, what is your intuition and, and, and experience so far? All right. So before going into the discussion about predictor, uh, I mean, in the longer version, I talk about the practical constraints that are put on the type of predictors that we can use. Since these predictors are run at each single machine and it they predict the future peak usage of the task running on the machine, they need to be lightweight in terms of both CPU and memory over uh, footprint. However, uh, since uh, the Borg scheduler in our case uh, asks for 
free capacity generally like every 5 minute or so uh, in that case like they can be a little like even if they are using more resources every 5 minutes it, it can be fine in this paper we devised like very basic uh, predictors where we take mean plus some standard deviation and they perform uh, well like they perform better than what is currently expected in the production environment but certainly there is a room for improvement and one thing uh, that uh, like my uh, collaborators at google uh, was working on is to tune the predictor to get the desired violation rate because we know what violation rate profile is acceptable so if we have a predictor where we can tune it to get the desired savings or desired violation rate this will give us more control over uh oh, like over the predictor and how it performs in production so i think i mean there is in general uh, more work that can be done on improving predictors as well as having interesting features such as controllability and tunability okay thank you um i think um there there are more questions um now on the on the channel i just um i'm afraid we don't have much time um so i think i'll, I'll unfortunately i have to ask you to go to the sure, chat can... and read these questions and talk directly to the to the people involved i'm really sorry about that okay so fine. thank I you very much for the very interesting talk and work and uh, let's uh, we have now to move to our last uh paper uh by frank gagnalossi on site-to-site -site internet traffic control. So now we slightly move on a different uh, topic. So Frank is a fifth year PhD student. Um, he's not on the job market yet, but I guess he will be in, in, a, in a couple of years. Um, this work was done a couple of years ago, the work that he's presenting today, uh, and his uh, thesis is actually on a different uh, topic on devising new systems for privacy preserving video analytics. So. Um, let's uh, hear about uh, side-to-site -side internet traffic control. Can we have the video, please? Hi, my name is Frank, and today I'm going to be presenting Bundler, which is a new system we've built for enabling traffic control between different sites across the internet. So what do I mean by that? Well, first, by a site, I'm broadly referring to any single physical location where there's many endpoints sharing the same access link to the internet. So some common examples of this would be a university campus network like MIT, a company office network, or even a particular data center from a cloud provider like Amazon's US West data center. So let's start with this company office network as a motivating example. Imagine you are the network administrator for this company and there's a lot of different people and applications using the network, each with different requirements. So there's SSH traffic and interactive web browsing that need low latency. There's cloud storage and backups that need high throughput. And there's video streaming and Zoom calls which need a mix of both. And a common problem you might encounter here is that every time Bob runs a backup session, Alice's SSH traffic starts lagging or her Zoom calls get choppy. So what might be going on here? Well, as everything is shifted to the cloud, all of these different applications typically have an endpoint in one of just a few sites. So either a data center from one of these major cloud providers like Amazon or Google, or maybe another site from the same company. So it's possible that Alice's SSH traffic is going to an EC2 machine and that her Zoom call and Bob's backup are also hosted in the same Amazon data center. Now, if these connections are going to the same destination site, even if it's different physical machines within that site, then they likely take the same path through the network and thus share the same bottleneck as well. And if that's the case, then wherever this bottleneck is, the queue probably looks something like this. So the backup has plenty of packets to fully occupy the queue, and the latency sensitive applications are always stuck waiting behind it. Now, as the network manager, if you saw this situation, the natural solution would be to implement some sort of scheduling policy. So for example, your policy here might be to give highest priority to Zoom calls and SSH, and then only send backup traffic when there's no other packets waiting. So this sort of scheduling is what we mean by traffic control. Now, if this bottleneck is occurring somewhere within your own network, you could just stick a scheduler here and call it a day. But a lot of recent work has shown that today, bottlenecks are often somewhere beyond our network's edge, for example, at a slow or congested interdomain link. And if that's the case, then the queue will actually build at this bottleneck in the middle of the network instead. 
meaning the queue back at our site will be relatively empty. And if it's empty, then there's no packets for us to schedule. So putting a scheduler here isn't going to really do anything. Now, naturally, you might wonder, um, why not just have scheduling in the middle of the network if that's where bottlenecks occur frequently? Well, first of all, many people share the public internet, and there isn't a one-size-fits-all scheduling policy. So each site might have a different set of traffic they want to prioritize or deprioritize. And this traffic is traveling between many different parties along the network path, different ISPs and autonomous systems, and the bottleneck could occur anywhere. So it might be at this one in the middle, but it could be at this link, at this link, right? So to ensure that your scheduling policy is always enforced, you'd have to coordinate with every possible provider along the path and convince them to apply your policy. So let's take a step back here um, for a second and summarize the problem so far. You have a bunch of traffic going between your site and another site, and you'd like to enforce some policy about how that traffic should share the limited network resources. But no one in the middle of the network can implement that policy for you. It really makes the most sense for you to implement it yourself since you know your own traffic best. But when the bottleneck is outside of your network, you don't have a queue to schedule. So what can you do? Well, if we need packets in our queue to schedule, but they only build up at a bottleneck, then one thing we could do is artificially create a bottleneck within our own site by putting our traffic through a rate limiter. As long as we choose a rate that's less than the real bottleneck, our rate limiter will become the bottleneck. And as a result, our traffic's packets that would have queued at the real bottleneck shift and queue at our rate limiter instead. So now that we have packets in our queue, we can implement scheduling, but how do we pick the right rate? To make this more concrete, um, let's just put some numbers here as an example. So suppose the bottleneck link is 10 megabits per second, and our company's uplink to the internet is something much higher than that. Now, if we rate limit to anything less than 10, we will build a queue, but we'll waste bandwidth because the network could have supported up to 10. If we send anything more than 10, we won't build a queue at all, so we'll be right back where we started, unable to schedule. So to maximize throughput and build a queue at the same time, we want to send at exactly 10. But of course, life isn't so simple. We don't really know that the bottleneck is 10, and it's not static. It's going to be changing constantly as network conditions evolve. So imagine, for example, that there's some other traffic sharing this link that averages about 5 megabits per second. Now if we keep sending at 10, our packets will go back to queuing in the middle of the network. So in this scenario, we actually need to send at 5 in order to maximize throughput and still build a queue within our own site. So this sort of seems like a dead end. How can we possibly know the right rate given all of these different possible scenarios? Well, if you tilt your head a little bit, this is actually a very familiar problem, right? Determining the available bandwidth in the network at any given time is exactly what congestion control aims to do. And this is the key idea behind Bundler. So Bundler is just a middle box that sits at the edge of a site. And internally, it has two components. There's a send box that observes all of the site's egress traffic and a receive box that observes all of its ingress traffic. And then the send box groups traffic by its destination site. So it treats all flows going to the same destination site as a single aggregate stream of packets, which we call a bundle. So this set of traffic going to the Amazon data center we've been looking at so far would be one example of a bundle. But we might also have another bundle for all the traffic going to Google, and then another one for all the traffic going to uh, Dropbox, and so on. And then the send box over operates over each of these bundles independently, shifting any queues that they would have built in the middle of the network back to the bundler itself. So let's take a closer look inside the send box to see how this works. For each bundle, the receive box is responsible for sending some feedback back to the send box so that it can compute measurements about the network conditions for the bundle. So this is things like the RTT and the receive rate. And then it feeds these to a congestion control algorithm. This algorithm picks an aggregate rate for the entire bundle that will cause queues to shift without sacrificing on throughput. And then the scheduling policy decides how that aggregate throughput is distributed among the flows in the bundle. So the key component of Bundler's design is how it computes these measurements for congestion control. <clears throat> While there's many ways we could compute the measurements, the contribution of Bundler's scheme is that it's lightweight and transparent. And what I mean by that is both the send and receive boxes forward traffic along without modifying the packets or disrupting the connections. To compute the measurements, the send box periodic periodically samples packets to measure, and then the receive box sends feedback for these packets out of band from the data packets. Now, I describe how this scheme works in detail in the longer version of this talk, but for now, I'll just present the key idea. Instead of the send box explicitly communicating which packets it wants to sample, which would require some sort of packet modification, both boxes use the same hashing scheme 
that lets them independently pick the same packets to sample at random. Compared to some alternative ways of implementing these signals, for example, using a TCP proxy, which would terminate the end-to-end -end connections and send the packets over its own pool of connections, our scheme has a number of benefits. So first, it requires significantly less overhead and complexity. We only need to maintain state and add feedback on the order of one packet per RTT, rather than all in-flight packets. And second, the data path functionality is far simpler. We only need to compute a single hash per packet in the data path, and the control functionality executes off the data path. In contrast, a TCP proxy needs to implement reliability in the data path. Now, the other key idea behind Bundler that I want to highlight is that shifting the queues is not possible in all scenarios. When the network looks as I described it at the beginning, everything works fine. But the internet is complex and messy, and to be fair, these conditions may not always hold. So in particular, there's two potential scenarios that Bundler needs to handle. First, we assume that all flows in a bundle share the same bottleneck in the network. But they might not, for example, if the bottleneck is using ECMP. And if they don't, then they won't be competing with each other, and it doesn't make sense to schedule them together. Second, it's only possible for a bundler to shift its queue if it's not sharing the bottleneck with any long-lasting buffer-filling cross-traffic. In the presence of such traffic, if bundler tries to operate as normal, it will significantly lose out on throughput, which would outweigh any potential scheduling benefits. Now, although we can't do anything to prevent these conditions from happening, we can actually reliably detect them, and we can do it using the same measurements that we collected for the congestion control scheme. So this actually presents a fourth benefit for our architecture. Because it's transparent to the underlying traffic, we can disable Bundler temporarily when the conditions are unfavorable, and then we can re-enable it as soon as these conditions disappear. This ensures that even in the worst case, Bundler will never hurt its traffic's performance. But of course, Bundler is only useful if it's not disabled often. While no measurement study would be sufficient to make any definitive statements about the internet at large, I can confidently say that in all the experiments we've run in our group across a number of different projects, these conditions are rare. So we really believe that in most cases, Bundler will be able to provide useful benefits. And if this seems surprising to you, then please do check out the longer version of this talk or the paper where we're able to explain this reasoning in a bit more detail. Now, finally, I wanna show you a single controlled emulation experiment that demonstrates the type of improvements Bundler can provide. For this experiment, we created a situation like I talked about at the beginning. So there's a variety of traffic between two sites that's competing at a bottleneck in the middle of the network. And this bottleneck is outside the sender's control, so it can't enforce a scheduler here. To emulate a realistic set of traffic, we generated flow sizes according to a distribution that Kaida observed in an internet backbone router. So this is representative of what you might expect to see in the middle of the network. And just to give you an idea of what this distribution looks like, the vast majority of flows, 97.6% were small, less than 10 kilobytes each, and then about 2% were medium, and about a tenth of a percent were large flows. And then we looked at the distribution of flow completion times separated into the three different traffic sizes. And what I'm actually plotting here, the slowdown, is really just the FCT normalized by the size of the flow. Now, if we look at the results here, this case is our baseline. Since we're not running Bundler, it's representative of the status quo you'd expect to see today. And the main thing I want to point out here is that the short flows, which should be able to complete in a single RTT, are taking almost twice as long at the median and more than four times as long at the tail. Now, the ideal solution in this case would be to have a scheduler right at the router where the bottleneck is occurring. As I mentioned earlier, it wouldn't make sense to do this in practice, but it does give us a reference for the optimal benefit a scheduler could provide here. So we added the scheduler, and we configured it to use a fair queuing policy to prevent short flows from waiting behind longer ones. Now, all the flows tend to complete faster, both at the median and the tail, but in particular, all the short flows are able to complete pretty much as quickly as possible. So with these as reference points, finally, we removed the scheduler and instead enabled Bundler at both sites. And we configured it to use the exact same fair queuing policy. What we can see here is that relative to the status quo, Bundler is able to reduce the slowdown of all flows across the board. And if we look at the short flows, which are the ones we're really trying to help most by using FQ, the median slowdown is close to optimal. And the tail slowdown is reduced by more than half compared to the status quo. So to summarize, Bundler is a new middle box that enables scheduling regardless of where congestion occurs in the network. It has a simple, lightweight, and transparent design, so it's realistic to consider deploying in today's networks. All of our source code and evaluation scripts are available on our GitHub, and we've worked hard to make it easy to reproduce all of our results. So please give it a try and let us know if you have any questions or issues. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Frank, for the 
interesting presentation on a very interesting topic. Um, so again, I, I am looking for any questions in the thread uh, on Slack. So um, I have um, one question. Sure. So how um, how can we implement your approach? I mean, how possible is you think that one can actually implement your approach, right? Um, could could you clarify exactly? Like, what do you mean by? Um... Like um, actually deploying on applications and I mean, you need some sort of collaboration. I mean, how, what are the changes that we need to do and, and how you think like can work in, in combination with other congestion control out there? Gotcha. So yeah, I guess, um, so the scheme itself, I didn't have a chance to, to talk about it in much detail. This, the scheme itself for doing this is pretty lightweight. So the way we've sort of implemented it is a, a Q-disk, uh, like a Linux Q-disk. So, um, Basically, you could just deploy this on like, I think the way we imagined it is that it would just sort of be a middle box that sits at the edge of a network. So you could imagine just deploying this, um, you know, in the middle box and, and route your traffic through it at the edge. And uh, so I think it'd be pretty simple to actually deploy it. And then it sort of works with any congestion control scheme. So there's some sort of constraints for what kind of scheme you need to use. In particular, you need to use some sort of like delay based scheme. But um, you know, it's not it's not specific to to any one algorithm. So you could use, um, you know, different algorithms that has sort of a, a, a general uh, interface for that. Yeah. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so I don't see any other questions, and unfortunately, we're past five past uh, the end of this session. So um, at this point, um, I would like to thank all the presenters for their very uh, very well done and interesting presentations and all of your papers. Um, I think this was a very exciting uh, session with uh, fantastic papers. Thank you all for attending this uh, session today. And uh, the, at this point, uh, we conclude uh, the session on cloud NML. Thank you very much all. Thank you.
Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the fifth session of uh, Eurosis. My name is uh, uh, Manos Caprichos, and I'm a faculty at the University of Michigan. Uh, in this session, we have uh, five papers on uh, testing, verification, and dependability, and I promise they will all be great. Uh, so before we start, let me make a kind request. If you have any questions, please post them on the uh, pin thread for the corresponding paper on Slack. Uh, and please do not wait until the very end of the presentation to do that. Um, just to make sure that we have enough time to actually ask your question and the presenter can, um, can, can answer the question uh, you know, live. So uh, let's get started. Our first paper is titled uh, Finding Heterogeneous and Safe Configuration Parameters in Cloud Systems. And the presenter is uh, Shishang Ma. Uh, who is a sixth year PhD student at Ohio State University. Uh, Shishang is uh, on the job market for an industry position. So uh, make sure to talk to him about that. Uh, all right, uh, can we play the video, please? Uh, give us a few moments while some technical difficulties have been resolved. All right. This is a joint work with a. This is a joint work with a Fan, Mike, and Yang. While many distributed systems are still using homogeneous configuration for the whole cluster, heterogeneous configurations are becoming popular for several reasons. First, heterogeneous hardware naturally calls for heterogeneous configurations to achieve better performance. For example. Many systems allow the means to set the different thread numbers, memory sizes, and the bandwidth limitations for different nodes with different hardware. Secondly, heterogeneous configuration can also occur during online reconfiguration. Online reconfiguration is a nice feature which allows the means to reconfigure the system at runtime. To achieve this feature, some systems like HDFS will provide a reconfigure command to allow the mean to update the configuration of a node without rebooting it. And the rolling restart is another solution to achieve this feature. While online reconfiguration is beneficial, it can create a short window of heterogeneous configuration. Unfortunately, the existence of heterogeneous configuration in distributed systems may cause problems. Even if each individual node is configured correctly. For example, suppose we have a parameter called encrypt, which determines whether messages between nodes should be encrypted or not. Let's say we have a configuration file f1, which says this value to be true, and f2 says this value to be false. When we assign a same configuration file to all the nodes in the system, the system can work correctly. However, when we configure some nodes with F1 and some with F2, errors can happen in the system because the communication between nodes can fail. In this work, we call this type of configuration as invalid heterogeneous configuration, and we call the corresponding parameter as a heterogeneous unsafe configuration parameter. Well, it might be obvious to some people why the encryption parameter is heterogeneous unsafe. Some other problems that a heterogeneous configuration can cause might not be that obvious. For example, 
there is a parameter in HDFS called a bandwidth per second, which is used to specify the maximum bandwidth that a data node can use for balancing purpose. Surprisingly, we find that this parameter is also heterogeneous unsafe. Let me show you with one example. Here, a system admin is trying to use the balancer tool provided by HDFS to rebalance the system by moving some data from data node one to data node two. During this task, this data node two is responsible for sending task progress message back to the balancer periodically. When both the data nodes are configured with the same value, for example, 100, the task can finish successfully. And then this is also true when we configure all the data nodes with the value of 10. However, when we set 100 on data node one, but the 10 on data node two, errors can happen because the progress reporting message will be throttled to be sent out from data node two, as it may have used up its bandwidth quota when receiving data from data node one, which has a higher bandwidth limitation. As a result, the balancer will finally time out and then report this task as failed. As one can see, this type of configuration errors is different from the problem of erroneous configuration values, which has been extensively studied before. In our case, all the parameter values are valid, and the error happens when nodes with different configurations communicate with each other. So in this work, our goal is to find what parameters are unsafe for heterogeneous configuration in cloud systems. For this purpose, we build a testing framework called ZebraConf, which uses existing unit tests to test heterogeneous configurations. ZebraConf detects 41 heterogeneous unsafe parameters in five popular cloud systems. ZebraConf uses the classic software testing approach. It will test the target application with different heterogeneous configurations to see whether they cause errors or not. When we started to implement this idea, we met the general software testing challenge that we found that many conversion parameters are not used on the simple workloads because the piece of the code that use these parameters are not triggered. Fortunately, we also observed that many cloud systems have rich unit test suites, which are supposed to cover the testing of most system function functionalities. And we also found that many of the unit tests are using configuration parameters when testing. This, this observation motivates us to design a testing framework that can reuse existing unit tests to test the heterogeneous configurations. However, implementing this idea is not easy. There are two major challenges we met. First, we need to reduce the testing time. In our study, we found it is common for cloud systems to have thousands of unit tests and hundreds to thousands of parameters. If we simply test all the combinations, the testing time would be completely impractical. Second, the task of assigning different configurations to different nodes is challenging in unit tests. I will discuss the detail of this challenge later in later slides. To solve these two challenges, we design and we design the implement ZebraConf that consists of three key components. At the top layer, test gen is responsible for generating test instance by given parameters as input. After the tests are generated, test runner will execute each test and ask the conf agent to assign the required configurations to nodes when running a unit test. We rely on test gen and test runner to address the first challenge and use conf agent to solve the second one. We have proposed several techniques for each, the component, each of the components. Due to time limitation, I will only discuss the design of conf agent in this talk. So the responsibility of conf agent is to assign different configurations to different nodes. This task is trivial in the distributed setting because we can directly assign different configuration files to different nodes when launching them so that the nodes will read the different parameter values automatically. Unfortunately, this approach doesn't work in unit tests 
where nodes are often created as threads within a single process. The key idea behind a convergent solution is to attribute every configuration object to a node at the runtime and hack the return value based on the attribution. However, there are two major challenges with this idea. First, one node can have multiple configuration objects. Second, configuration objects can be shared among nodes. If these two problems are not properly handled, a node may, use, may read inconsistent values, which will cause false positive. Now let's talk about the conf agent solution. First, to stop sharing, conf agent will clone the configuration objects that can be shared among nodes so that each node can only read from their own configuration objects. Second, conf agent will, tra will track the configuration creation flow at the wrong time and try to attribute the conversion objects to nodes by using some heuristic rules. For example, if we know configuration object B is cloned from configuration object A and A belongs to node, node 1, then we can induce that B also belongs to node 1. Please refer to our paper for all the, all the other rules. In the meanwhile, ConfAgent will keep track of those configuration objects that cannot be certainly attributed and avoiding testing them. Finally, to mimic different nodes are using different configurations, ConfAgent will manipulate the return value for every conf configuration read operation based on which node the configuration object belongs to. Now let me show you some evaluation results. We run all the, all the experiments on Cloud Lab and we have applied, we have applied the ZebraConf to five popular cloud systems and find that the modification overhead is generally small. The total running time is about 4,600 machine hours by using up to 100 physical machines, each running 20 Docker containers. In experiment, ZebraConf totally reports 57 unsafe parameters. After our manual analysis, we found 41 of them are two problems. Among these, among these parameters, some of them are quite unexpected to us. For example, there is a parameter called a max concurrent moves in HDFS, which limits the maximum number of threads that a data node can use for balancing. Notice that this parameter will be used by both data nodes and a balancer. When we set the parameter to 50 or to 1 on all the nodes, the balancing task can finish in 14 and 16 seconds respectively. However, when we set the balancer with 50 and the data node with 1, the task finishing time will be 10 times longer than the case when a single thread is used. After some investigation, we found this problem is caused by that balancer is unaware of the one thread capacity setting on data nodes and it sends too many concurrent move requests to data nodes. As a result, most of the requests will be declined by data nodes and the congestion control mechanism will be triggered. We observe, this similar, we observe the similar problem has been reported by HDFS developers. In conclusion, today I talk about our testing framework ZebraConf that reuse existing unit tests to find the heterogeneous unsafe parameters. It helped us find 41 unsafe parameters in five popular cloud systems. Our experiments on debugging these parameters shows that systems may need to provide better support when using heterogeneous configurations. This is all for my presentation today. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take questions now. All right, uh, thank you, Shishang, for the great presentation. Um, and uh, apologies to the uh, Zoom participants for testing your intellectual abilities of not matching the sound in the video. Um, so um, I do see, so I will uh, ask some questions on, uh, on Slack. Uh, Petros Maniatis asks, how hard is it to apply something like this to a different system? Uh, Okay, that's a good question. So, uh, 
we we think our experience uh, about applying these two five cloud applications shows that uh, the overhead the modification overhead is small and uh, we think uh, it is quite general to be applied to most uh, applications so i guess elaborating on that and going off of the second question can you could you um uh define more uh, carefully what are the assumptions under which uh, yeah there are several yes of course um so there are several assumptions um mostly there are two uh, so assumptions are that uh, first uh, the application needs to have a unified uh, configuration class and this is uh, th these assumptions is held in most applications and the second uh, assumption is that uh, the application application need to have a, a well defined uh, node uh, node in node initial initialization function yeah these are, are the two major um, assumptions and uh, our investigation shows that this is generally held by many applications um, so uh, thank you. We have uh, one more question uh, from Eric Eide. Um, Did you discover parameters that were not previously known to be hetero unsafe? Uh, what was the developer's response? Developers, okay. We found uh, we found the developers reports some similar um, issues in, in in for example in HDFS Jira. Uh, developers observe this issue and. Uh, we haven't uh, have a formal conversation with developers uh, at this moment, but we plan to submit the some report because for some heterogeneous unsafe parameters, it's more like a bugs. It can be fixed. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, so I guess we have. Uh, uh, I think we're actually running a little bit over time. So I had one more question, but let's not get to that. Thank you very much, uh, Sashang. Okay, thank you. So uh, let us move on to the. Uh, second paper, second paper is titled uh, Understanding uh, and Dealing with Hard Faults in Persistent Memory Systems. Uh, and uh, the presenter is uh, Brian Choi, who's a third year PhD student at uh, Johns Hopkins University, uh, working with Randall Burns and Ryan Huang on system reliability and emerging storage technologies such as persistent memory. Please play the video. Everyone, my name is Brian Choi and I am from Johns Hopkins University. And today I'll be presenting Understanding and Dealing with Hard Faults in Persistent Memory Systems, a work done with my advisors, Randall Burns and Ryan Huang. So first, a brief summary. We introduce a new class of faults in persistent memory systems called soft to hard faults. We have an in-depth study that examines the characteristics of 28 real-world persistent memory hard faults. Then we discuss our solution, Arthas, that uses dependency-based rollback in order to recover and mitigate PM hard faults with minimal data loss. So in today's modern society, whether it's a large distributed application or some personal computer software, errors inevitably occur in applications and computer systems. When this happens, it can be a frustrating experience. However, when a critical error in your system occurs, generally, what's the first thing you do? Most people tend to just restart their computer or application, as it's the simplest solution that many times leads to the problem going away. The reason why restart works is because these failures are soft where soft means your states are volatile and your bad states will be gone when you restart. But unfortunately, there are hard fault problems where this restart approach doesn't work anymore and the bad states will reoccur even after restarting. This problem is particularly going to be problematic with emerging persistent memory systems, and I'm going to explain why. But first, a little background on what PM is. Persistent memory is a newly emerging storage technology that has fast reads and writes comparable to DRAM while being able to persistently store data. With PM, developers now have the option to persist a much larger amount of data since PM is such a fast storage technology. Since you're persisting more states in PM, the likelihood that you encounter bugs that become hard faults in PM is higher. We call this class of bugs where soft states become hard states when they move into PM as soft to hard faults. Let's look at a real world example of a soft to hard fault. Here, let's first see the soft fault in traditional memcache. Memcache is comprised of several items of key value data and also some client connection data that are all stored in volatile memory as soft states. However, with this specific bug, Memcache ends up with two corrupted fields. The items ref count and hash table and next pointer end up becoming bad states. In standard Memcache, we can see that since the items are in volatile memory, these two bad soft states end up going away after restart. However, several developers have made persistent memory versions on Memcache 
where the developers may choose to persist the entire item data structure in PM. As a result, since the items are now hard states, both the bad states end up remaining as bad states, even after restart. So for our contributions, we did a hard fault study where we examined 28 real-world bugs in PM systems. We also created Arthas, a tool that aims to mitigate hard faults in PM systems while minimizing data loss using dependency-based rollback and static analysis. So first, we'll look at our hard fault study. In our study, we found 28 bugs from seven total PM systems that showcased the soft hard fault problem. The first finding we observed from our hard fault study was that the root causes of PM hard faults are diverse. In this chart, you can see the different root causes of PM hard faults, and even though the vast majority of bugs are due to logic errors, there is still a healthy mix of a variety of root causes for PM hard faults. The second finding we observed is that the consequences of PM hard faults are severe. In the chart here, we can see a large portion of the consequences leading to problems like repeated crashing and data loss, all of which are significant, non-negligible problems for any system. For our third finding, we observed that over half of the PM hard faults propagates bad state. Here we can see a categorization of the PM faults, where type 1 refers to faults where a PM variable has a bad value that is the direct cause of the problem. Type 2 refers to faults where the PM variable propagates a bad value and doesn't directly cause the problem. And finally, type 3 refers to miscellaneous faults, such as memory leaks. We can see that 68% of the bugs are type 2 and indirectly propagate bad state throughout the entire system. As a result, we see that PM hard faults are a diverse set of bugs, and it can be difficult to statically find all bugs with one single static solution. However, from our study, we are able to see the insight that during runtime, eventually all the PM hard faults causes bad states to be persistent. So instead of statically analyzing error patterns, we instead try and approach the fault by reverting bad states to good states. Other insight we see is that since most of the faults propagate bad state, even if one bad PM state is rolled back, the PM system could still quickly hit the same failure if the root cause of the bad state isn't reverted. We now ask the question, how do we revert the bad states? Our goal of effective mitigation is defined as complete when the hard fault is gone and doesn't reoccur after the system restarts. Therefore, for our solution, we aim to develop a tool that checkpoints previous older versions of persistent states so we can revert any bad states to previous older versions which are good states. Naturally, one might ask, why don't we just use standard checkpoint and rollback tools? However, these tools have their own limitations. In this example, we can see a PM key value store with two key value pairs when the checkpoint system takes a snapshot. Then, as we insert some more key value pairs, we eventually crash when inserting the 10,000 and first key value pair. Through some analysis, we are able to find out that the root cause of the issue is caused by the 10,000th key value pair. So standard checkpoint and rollback tools will roll back the entire system to the previous snapshot, where we only have two key value pairs. As a result, we end up losing all of the keys from key 3 to key 10,001, when there was only one bad root cause. This gets us to the main problem of standard checkpoint and rollback approaches. It causes a large amount of unnecessary data loss. As a result, for our tool, Arthas, we aim to avoid the problem of data loss that standard checkpointing has by using static analysis to find dependencies of bad states in order to only revert bad PM states. Our solution, Arthas, is a tool designed to mitigate PM hard faults in PM systems by checkpointing multiple versions of state, using static analysis and dynamic tracing to find bad state dependencies, and then use those dependencies in order to drive our reversion. As a result, Arthas will be able to recover PM systems quickly and minimize any data loss while incurring a small runtime overhead. Here we can see Arthas' primary workflow. First, our PM system code undergoes static analysis by Arthas' analyzer to construct our dependencies for minimal data loss during reversion. Then the PM system code is instrumented with checkpoint support so that we can save multiple versions of our persistent states. Then the instrumented PM system can then run while creating a checkpoint log of multiple versions of data. The instrumented PM system will keep on running until the detector detects a problem at which point the Arthas reactor will then mitigate the PM hard fault. In this talk, we'll talk in depth about the analyzer and checkpoint library, and more details on our detector and reactor can be found in our paper. First, we'll talk about the checkpoint library. As we previously stated, we need a checkpoint data in order to have multiple versions of our PM state so that we can revert any bad states to older good states. We accomplish this by intercepting PM framework API calls and then assigning global sequence numbers to each PMM update. Let's look at an example of this in action here. 
you can see that in our code, we first allocate some persistent memory in a pointer. So our checkpoint library will intercept the allocation call and then create a checkpoint entry by assigning the address of the PM pointer here. Let's say we then assign a value of 7 to the PM pointer and then flush it. So the value of 7 is saved as the first version of PM pointer's data. The global sequence number of 1 is assigned to this value and we save the integer size of 4 bytes. Let's say we change the value of the PM pointer to 4 and then flush it again. We then assign the value of 4 to be the second version of our data. We increment the global sequence number to 2 and assign it to this update. Finally, we keep the integer size of 4 bytes. The next component is the analyzer. As we talked about earlier in the talk, Arthas needs to only revert bad states and avoid unnecessary data loss. So Arthas' analyzer aims to use dependency-based rollback or use static analysis in order to find the data flow and control flow dependencies. In order to actually get these dependencies, we construct a program dependency graph of the PM system, where the instruction that causes the fault is used as a, the starting point of the dependency analysis, and individual slices of the PDG is used to see what instructions influence this fault. We can see an example of this in action here. This is some code that showcases a persistent memory write timeline of a PM system, where the blue segments are volta writes, the red segments are PM writes, and the arrows denote dependencies. Here we can see that the system ended up crashing at the right of the division instruction of variable z, since we divide by 0. However, we see that the root cause of the error was due to x, since this is the variable that initializes the value of negative 5 that eventually causes the division by 0. In order to avoid unnecessary data loss, Arthas takes a slice of the program dependency graph to only revert any bad persistent variables based on dependencies. So we can see here that Arthas will create a slice of the dependent variables, where z depends on y, which depends on x. Then Arthas's purge mode will selectively revert only the PMM variables on this slice in order to fix the bad PMM states while minimizing the data loss. So we end up reverting the writes at x, y, and z only. As a result, we can see that Arthas's purge-based rollback allows us to minimize data loss. However, it doesn't necessarily guarantee a perfectly consistent state. As a result, Arthas also contains a more conservative approach with the rollback mode, which reverts all variables between dependent updates. This rollback mode more carefully preserves dependencies of the system. For example, we can see that we also revert variable b as well, since it happens before the write to y, but happens after the write to x. So we run our evaluation on one 8-core CPU and two 128GB persistent memory DIMMs. We test on 12 of our bugs from our study from 5 PM systems. We then run Arthas against two baselines, PMCRIU, which is a state-of-the-art checkpoint and rollback system that does coarse grain time-based rollback, and AR checkpoint, an alternate, version, an alternate version of Arthas that only reverts without the analyzer component and rolls back at a time granularity with fine-grained rollback. We evaluated Arthas on 12 of our hard fault PM bugs. Each of these bugs are diverse with varying consequences, showing, showcasing how Arthas is able to handle a large spectrum of bugs. We evaluate Arthas' effectiveness, and Arthas is able to resolve all of the 12 bugs, while AR Checkpoint suffers from timeouts and is only able to resolve 2 out of the 12 bugs, and PMCRIU is only able to reliably mitigate 9 out of the 12 bugs. However, effectiveness is only one aspect. Equally important is the data loss aspect. Here we can see how much data Arthas, PMCRU, and AR Checkpoint discards. And our results show that Arthas discards up to 10 times less data than PMCRIU, the standard checkpoint and rollback solution. We see the recovery times that the three systems have. And Arthas is slightly slower than PMCRIU, but is still in an acceptable range, taking around one minute longer than PMCRIU, while also keeping much more data. In conclusion, soft to hard faults are an underexplored, yet new, significant problem in PM systems. And Arthas, our tool, will allow we detects and mitigates hard faults using dependency-based rollback to minimize data loss. And Arthas ends up being able to mitigate 12 faults with 10 times less data loss than standard checkpoint. And our tool is publicly available on GitHub. Thank you. Less data loss. All right. Uh, thank you, Brian. For the presentation. Um, so uh, there is a question uh, by Petros Maniakis. A static analysis can be very imprecise in the general case. Are you making assumptions about the PM system that enables precise static analysis? Um, yes, that's a good question. Um, generally, um, static, not the uh, static analysis that Arthas has to do relies on um, a 
an open source library that we used for called DG. And it can be imprecise, especially for, um, for larger systems like Redis and Memcache that have tens of thousands of lines of code. But um, the way we do it is that um, we also have um, specifically some um, filtering aspects in order to sort of filter the, the functions that we um, want to prioritize and also um, some timeouts in case the systems are too large. But we do acknowledge that um, the stack in us itself, itself isn't scalable and may have some limitations on the actual um, the accuracy. And that could, that's also something that we're contemplating for future work. Thank you. Uh, so I will ask a second question that we won't have time to get to all of them. Um, so by Miguel mm -hmm. Matos of the University of Lisbon, um, how much does Autos need to know uh, about the application semantics to identify the bad states? And how does the programmer specify those semantics? Right, so that sort of goes hand in hand with the, um, that's a good question. And that sort of goes hand in hand with like the Arthas's detector, which unfortunately I wasn't able to talk about in detail in this specific video, um, but more details on that are in the paper. But basically um, for the, in terms of what's bad states, generally it goes with, um, first it needs to detect the bad states, which um, we attach GDB to it. So then there's, um, you know, assertion failures, crashes, and we also have some infinite loops and memory leak detection. But in addition to actually identifying the persistent memory bad, um, bad fault, we also, when we begin the reversion, we also revert um, the dependent states that are PM states that are within the same program dependency graph as the, um, as the identified detected bad fault. So not all of the reverted PM states are gonna be bad necessarily, but it's gonna be um, all of the dependent ones. So it's gonna be the ones that sort of feed up to that essentially. Okay, thank you. Uh, so we're running a little bit over time. Uh, there is still one more question on the on Slack by Dushyam. If you can uh, please just go and answer it uh, after, um, after, after we're done. All right, thank you. All right, thank you, Brian. So uh, let us uh, move over to a uh, third paper, uh, which is titled uh, Rebound, uh, Defending Distributed Systems Against Attacks with Bounded Time Recovery. Uh, and the presenter is Niraj Gandhi, uh, who is a fourth year PhD student at UPenn. Please play the video. Today, I want to talk to you about how we can defend distributed systems embedded in things like factories, planes, trains, and automobiles from attacks with a new approach called bounded time recovery. I've been working on this with Ido Roth, Brian Sandler, Andreas Heberlin, and Lin Thay Swang Fan. In this work, we focus on cyber physical systems, which are systems that use sensor data to change the behavior of actuators. For example, let's take a look at this chemical vat that has attached to it a temperature sensor and a pressure sensor. It has a burner that can add heat to the system, a pressure valve through which the chemical flows in and out, an emergency alarm, and a live stream data monitor. The set of sensors and actuators are connected together through a set of control nodes. On these control nodes run applications. For instance, this application uses pressure sensor data to control the alarm. Similarly, there are several other applications that are used to control the other actuators. Cyber physical systems can be attacked, much like traditional distributed systems. Let's say that node 4 is compromised. Well, in this case, let's say the attacker now wants to control the burner. So they send a new type of signal to the burner, which causes the flame to increase in size thereby increasing the heat and pressure until a catastrophe occurs. Therefore, we need a fault tolerance technique for cyber physical systems that can tolerate more than just simple crash faults. One option is to use a BFT protocol, which can completely mask faults. However, there's a substantial cost because BFT needs at least two F plus one replicas. However, CPS are often resource constrained. For instance, they often use low power CPUs. If we were to try to reschedule BFT onto this example system, then we would need to schedule all of the replicas shown in gray, but only a subset of them are actually schedulable in our system, meaning we wouldn't be able to schedule all of the applications that we want to. So what else can we do? Well, many cyber physical systems do not actually need to perfectly mask all of the symptoms of a fault. Let's take another look at our burner application. Normally, the temperature will be reading within a small range when correct operation is occurring. When a fault occurs, the burner will increase its flame output, and this will result in the temperature steadily rising up until a point at which some kind of catastrophe occurs. After the catastrophe occurs, the system is non-recoverable. But 
during the time between when the fault occurs and when the catastrophe occurs, we have a kind of recovery period during which if we're able to resume correct operation, the system is recoverable. So our approach in this work is to propose a technique called bound to time recovery, which guarantees that so long as there is no fault within the past t seconds, correct operation will occur in the system. The recovery period is the period of time between when the fault occurs and t seconds after the fault, during which arbitrary behavior is allowed. Recovery must occur within this recovery period, after which correct operation resumes. There are two parts to providing the BTR guarantee. The first is scheduling F plus one replicas for every task in order to tolerate up to F faults. The second is recovery in which we change which nodes are responsible for which tasks in response to a fault. Let's start this example system in the root mode, which means that there are no nodes or links faulty. A mode maps to a particular set of tasks and the replicas assigned to a particular set of nodes. Let's look at the particular data flow of task 4 sending data to task 5 on node 2 and its replica on node 4. Now, when node 2 is compromised, task 5 on node 2 will misbehave, but task 5 on node 4 is able to catch when the misbehavior occurs. In response to the misbehavior, the tasks can be migrated as a mode transition occurs, and the data will be rerouted through the set of healthy nodes, leaving the faulty node isolated. Providing the BTR guarantee is non-trivial. We need to identify when a fault occurs so that we can recover by the right time. We need to identify which node is faulty. And at the same time, we need to prevent incorrect attribution in which a node believes that another healthy node is faulty instead of the actually compromised one. We need to prevent false negatives where a faulty node is able to convince the rest of the system as if that everything is okay, even though it's not. And we want to prevent false positives in which no node is faulty, and yet some node believes that other nodes are compromised. We need to do so while providing a guarantee that we can bound the detection and recovery time even when the adversary tries to delay detection or recovery. Now that we've introduced BTR and how they can be used in CPS, let's delve a little bit into details. First, let's talk about our model. We assume that all faults are observable Byzantine faults, meaning there's some kind of externally invisible effect of the attack. We are not concerned with bit flips occurring on some obscure node that will never affect anything. We assume a synchronous system in which the continuous time spectrum is divided into discretized rounds. We do not assume all-to-all -all connectivity between nodes because cyber-physical systems often do not have such topologies and use a combination of buses and point-to-point -point links. At maximum, uh, n-1 of the nodes in the system may fail. And finally, we have a mixed criticality system in which the least critical application might be dropped when a fault occurs in order to ensure that the most critical applications continue to run. This raises the question of how we can catch faults to trigger mode transitions. Well, we need at least one healthy node to catch a fault. So if there can be a fault, there must be at least F plus one replicas. And a quick example, here we see that task five runs on both node two and node four. Both copies run the same program. They use a set of inputs to an addition program to produce an output. Now, the two replicas cross-check one another to make sure the other one is behaving correctly. If node 2 misbehaves, then the copy on node 4 is able to catch the misbehavior and declare that node 2 is faulty. However, it's not quite so simple. Let's say node 3 is compromised and node 2 catches node 3 misbehaving. Node 3 can simply make a counterclaim that node 2 is misbehaving. We resolve this issue by making sure all messages are signed. So the input to a function will be signed and sent along. The inputs will then be used to produce an output. In both replicas, the output is also signed. The two outputs can be compared, and if they do not match, this constitutes evidence of misbehavior, which can be used to notify others of the need for a mode transition. So far, so good, but what about omission faults? That is, replicas cannot verify that a message was not received by another node. Our solution to this is to allow a node to declare a link to be faulty unilaterally, so long as it is one of the endpoints of that link, and it signs the link fault declaration. So in this sample topology, let's say that task one and task two are in a data flow where the data passes through some intermediate node. If the intermediate node is compromised, it may omit to send the data from task one on to task two. In this case, the node that task two runs on might notice the omitted message and declare the link between it and the intermediate node as faulty. 
In this case, the system will perform a mode transition and might reroute the data through another healthy node. Notice here that if the adversary tries to exploit the fact that it can unilaterally declare link faults, it will only be isolating itself as it declares more and more of its own links as faulty, in which case the system is still making progress because less data is being routed through the faulty node. There still leaves the complexity of what happens when compromised nodes start working together. Let's take a simple linear topology and look at them through time, divided into discrete rounds. In round 0, node 1 sends data to node 2, and node 2 forwards the data to node 3. If node 1 is compromised, it might omit the data. In this case, instead of sending data to node 3, node 2 is expected to send a link fault declaration. However, if node 2 is also compromised, it might omit sending the link fault declaration. But since node 3 knows that it should expect either data or a link fault declaration in round 1, then it can make a deduction about who is faulty after round 1 completes. Now, there's a lot more complicated strategies that adversaries can employ, but we don't have enough time to get into them, so you can read more about how the system works in the paper. There's a lot more that goes into setting up rebound. For instance, we require that all messages must be signed for proper attribution and to prevent forgery. We also require heartbeats to be sent by each node in every round so to all other nodes in the system so that we can ensure that the entire system operates in a consistent mode. We don't have enough time to get into the details for all of these, but you can read more in the paper. Now that we've briefly covered how our approach actually works, let's take a look at some of the sample results. Now there's quite a few experiments that we ran, but we don't have enough time to talk about them all, so we'll limit ourselves to discussing a few key results. First, let's take a look at what the costs of rebound are. For this experiment, we used synthetic workloads, applied in randomized network topologies, and compared rebound with and without optimizations. The unoptimized case shows that even at a 100 node system, the overhead is still manageable. For instance, in the leftmost graph for a 100 node system, we're consuming less than 20 kilobytes per link per round. We can see when we add the optimizations in that we scale much, much better, and the differential between the two approaches only grows as the system size increases. So we can see that the overhead is a manageable amount, and the scalability is greatly improved when we use optimizations like multi-signatures. Next, we'll look at our running example implemented in a real embedded platform. This is an oscilloscope reading of an experiment where no protection was given to the system. The yellow, blue, and green signals represent PWM signals that were sent to through the three actuators shown on the left. The vertical red line shows where the fault was injected, and we can see that after the fault was injected, the adversary sent garbage values to the pressure alarm, and that's why the pressure alarm will no longer work after the fault. In contrast, when we use rebound, we can see that after the fault is injected, garbage values are sent to the pressure alarm only for a short period of time, after which correct operation resumes. In the process, we drop the monitor application, but remember, since we have a mixed criticality system, we can drop the least critical application in order to ensure that all of the most critical applications continue to operate. So the takeaway here is that our approach can both detect and recover quickly in a real embedded platform. Bringing it all together, we have seen that Bounded Time Recovery, or BTR, is a new approach to defending distributed systems against attacks. It is low cost, since it only needs F plus 1 replicas to tolerate up to F Byzantine faults. And after a fault occurs, within a bounded amount of time, BTR guarantees that the system will both det detect the fault and recover from it. BTR is a good fit for cyber-physical systems, which are often resource-constrained and do not need to completely mask all of the symptoms of a fault due to properties like thermal capacity or inertia. Rebound is the first concrete algorithm to use a BTR approach to protect against Byzantine failures. It does so by designing a multi-mode system, in which the system transitions between modes in order to respond to faults. Rebound is able to keep the most critical applications running in the system by dropping the least critical ones as computational resources become more scarce as more faults occur. Thank you. Thank you, Niraj. Um, while uh, we get any, some questions in the uh, Slack, I want to ask, you seem to be considering different, um, different failures and different recovery periods separately. So I guess, so you're using the, let's say thermal capacity, right, I, it, to your advantage, but it seems to me that it might actually work against you. For example, imagine that 
you know, once I turn on the burner, it takes 100 seconds for this to reach the critical temperature at which it explodes. Now, I might recover at 99 seconds mm -hmm. and then start correct operation. But the question is, when the next failure happens, my system then might actually not have cooled down completely by that time. Right? So it, 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 it seems that there needs to be an assumption between one failure to the next as to how long will the system, which I haven't, I haven't quite seen you uh, express, right? So is, 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 that, is that really the case? Uh, do we need something, like, do we need to bound two different recovery periods together and, and make some assumption that between two failures, uh, you know, what, after we recover and start complete uh, correct operation, the system should be able to have come back to its whatever was the default mode. So all this inertia is already gone. Yeah, yeah, um, that's a good point. So in that case, what we need to do is um, basically account for that in the recovery bound that we set. So um, we want the system to have both detected who the faulty node is, and we need to have the system return to a state where we can now tolerate another fault by the time the, the recovery bound elapses. And so, um, for example, if in, your, in the example you gave, if we have another fault that might occur at 99 seconds, then we need to have accounted for that ahead of time if, when we did our system planning and we would have accordingly set, let's say the recovery bound at 50 seconds instead of 100 seconds. And that way the system would be able to tolerate both of those faults um, occurring consecutively. Right, but I guess it seems to me that seems those, those two are two different parameters, right? Because one, because it's not just about the duration of 50 seconds, because then if I have three failures, then I might need to, to make that bound larger, right? So now you seem to be conflating, the, there's three parameters that seem to be conflating. How long it takes to detect and recover, how many failures do I tolerate, and how many, and, and, and how long it does it take for me to come back to the normal state after I recover, right? So yeah, so that, that those three would be, three separate parameters of, 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 of a system. Yeah, um, so basically the way that we try to address that is by having the system designer effectively say ahead of time that, okay, let's, I'm going to want to tolerate at maximum F max faults. And concurrently, I want to be able to tolerate, let's say F uh, some number of concurrent faults. Uh, so, when the system plans for all of the different modes in that mode tree that we saw in an earlier slide, it has to account for each of the individual failure scenarios and the uh, number of concurrent faults that may occur uh, when, when it plans everything out. Yeah, I guess I'm, I'm not, okay, we don't have that much time, but I guess I'm not really talking about concurrent faults, right? Because the, the next fault could happen after you recover, right? Yes. And it's while you're still stabilizing into the, into the next one, right? So. Uh, okay. So okay. I guess we don't have we don't have time to go into, but I guess it, it'd be nice if, if that you know if, if you could you know somehow I guess decouple the recovery period from the from the from the I don't know uh, cooling down let's say of the system. Yeah. Um, so maybe I'm not fully understanding uh, your question, but the I can I can, I can follow up. I can follow up. Okay. Fine. Yeah. That yeah, sounds good. That's fine. All right. Thank you, Raz. Okay. Uh, so at this point, uh, let us move on to our uh, our third paper. Uh, of this session, uh, which is titled uh, Home Safe Home, uh, Smart Home Reliability with Visibility and Atomicity. Uh, and the presenter is uh, Ray Young, uh, who is a senior PhD student from the DPRG lab at uh, UIUC. Her research interests lie in distributed systems and she currently focuses on IoT reliability. Uh, please play the video. Hi everyone, I'm Ray from UIUC. Today, I'm going to introduce how to make our smart home more reliable, predictable, and safe with our system SafeHome. This is a collaborative work with Microsoft Research. In the smart home world, we have many kinds of smart devices, such as smart light, smart fridge, and extra. The smart devices we refer here are those who can connect to the networks and be accessed and controlled by home automation systems. Let's just think about when we are setting up or using smart devices, what are in our minds? Controlling a single action of a specific device? No, we want to control our lives. We want to make our lives easier. Then how do people control smart homes nowadays? 
either through command, for example, make an espresso, or through routine, which is a sequence of commands on the same or usually different devices. For example, make an espresso and make a pancake. The status code system executes commands and routines in a best effort way. They instantaneously attempt what are initiated, no matter what is running or whether there's any failure. However, such way of execution misses two natural expectations from users. When user put a bunch of commands in a routine, they expect to execute them all together. This is essentially atomicity, which is a well-known property. Another expectation is that when two different routines touching the same devices are triggered together, people expect them to run isolated so that their results do not affect each other. By that, we mean we want the system outcome to be equivalent to the routines being executed one after another, which is serial equivalence. A simple example is a scenario with a routine that opens the garage door, moves the trash can out, and closes the door. At the meantime, if another routine of closing garage door is triggered, but before a trash can can move out, the trash can will not be able to get out for garbage collection, or even worse, hit the door. Here, users will strongly expect these two routines to run one after another. However, such guarantee is poorly supported in nowadays systems. In our exploration with TP-Link smart clocks, the interleaved execution occur and ignorably. Another missing support is long-running routines, which have long-running intents from the users or by the device actions themselves. This brings extra challenges for a system to provide user-facing atomicity and isolation. Thus, we propose SafeHome, a home automation system that supports long-running routine expression, can properly isolate concurrent routines through providing serial equivalence, and can ensure routine execution atomicity. The key and unique challenge for SafeHome is that every system action is immediately visible to users. Any delay or device state change has higher physical world impact compared to non-smart home systems. Thus, in SafeHome, we introduce four visibility models. They provide a spectrum between latency and temporary incongruence, which we will introduce later. In the models, we utilize log-based mechanisms with leasing designs to help routine scheduling and execution. The visibility model we proposed include weak, eventual, partition strict, and global strict. Let me introduce them with an example. We have five routines touching four devices. We colored these devices differently. Three of the routines are initiated by three residents of the house to cook different breakfast. Two other routines are sensor triggered to clean the living room or the kitchen. All routines are triggered at the same time and we assume each command need to run one time unit and run sequentially inside one routine. Let's take a look at the status quo design. We call it weak visibility model. It executes the routine immediately when it triggers. Thus, all routines execute in parallel and can finish in two time units. However, Sending two commands simultaneously to one device may cause errors. For example, the first command may get interrupted, or more commonly, the second command gets ignored. If we don't want to see these potential errors, the strictest way is to only execute it one routine at a time. We call it global strict visibility model. It takes eight time units to finish. GSV is very strict, but it's still useful in those cases with resource constraints like energy. When there are limited maximum power supply, GSV can guarantee that the circuit breaker does not trip. However, GSV is too strict in most cases. Thus, a slightly less strict model would be partition strict visibility model. It allows routines touching disjoint devices to execute in parallel. This model can finish our example in five time units. PSV is useful when the commands have implicit dependencies so the users expect the whole routine to execute without interference. However, PSV can still take tens of minutes to execute with those long running routines. Thus, it's still not ideal. Then can we do better? Look back to our examples. Even for the routines touching the same devices, 
we can still place them in a way so that they can execute in parallel and follow some serial order. In the example placement shown here, it takes three time units to finish, and the five routines end with the system state equivalent to if running them in order three, one, two, five, four. This is eventual visibility model that we have. The way we achieve this design is by using locks. Note that the locks here are all held at a central device. All safe home logics sit here. No code is needed at other smart home devices. So goes back to our EV model. Each routine holds the locks for the device it touches, but can list them out under certain conditions. The intuition of leasing is to pipeline the routines when device is idle. We support post list and pre list. In post list, if a routine is done with a device, it does not have strong need to lock it anymore, so it can list the locks out. For example, after R1 has finished making the coffee, it can let R2 start. The serial order in the post list is always laser happens before lazy. With a similar intuition, in pre list, if a routine has acquired a lock but has a while before it accesses the device, it can lend the lock to another routine which uses it and returns it. This happens to the pancake maker in R1, where EV can start R3 immediately. In Prelis, the serial order is always let Z happens before laser. In summary, EV model can provide short waiting time and a serial equivalence guarantee. But in the middle, there might be times that a wireless serial equivalence, which we call temporary incongruence. As in our example, Pancake and Coffee Maker cannot be both on under any serial order. However, such incongruence is only temporary. It will get fixed automatically at the end, and that's why we call this model eventual. SafeHome manages the logic of EV with lineage table. It maintains at each time which routine will access which device so that the execution can follow a potential serial order. Here is a lineage table, for example. Each table entry is marked with a status of holding the device access, scheduled, lock leased out, or lock released. SafeHome handles dynamically arriving routines. I described a static scenario here just for simplicity. Also, to reduce search space, SafeHome utilizes backtracking to decide valid routine placement. We also explore two other scheduling policies of first come, first serve, and just in time. If you are interested in more details on these slides, welcome to read the paper. So far, the designs are focusing on the serial equivalence, but there is another property that we care about, which is automaticity. It relates to the design when failure happens. A naive way to provide autonomy is drawback, but it might cause high physical world impact. Thus, SafeHome minimizes drawbacks by serializing the failure and restart events together with the routine execution. Here is how it works in EV. If the routine does not touch the failed device, we can serialize it in arbitrary order. If the routine has finished with the device and the failure happens afterwards, this result is equivalent to serializing the routine before the failure. Similarly, if the device fails or recover before the routine touches it for the first time, we can serialize the routine after the failure or restart. If the device fails when routine is touching it, we have to fail the routine itself. We have implemented our safe home with around 2,000 lines of Java codes with long-running routine support. It also supports the integration with TP-Link plug and Vimo. We did experiments for both deployment and simulations. They provide nearly the same performance, so we focus on simulation results here. We explored our model with real-world benchmark, in which we derived the morning and party scenarios from IoT Bench test suite. We also extended our evaluation to a factory assembly line for a broader exploration. Besides, we did workload-driven experiments with an average of half million runs for each configuration. In the evaluations, we measured multiple metrics, but here we focus on the end-to-end -end latency, temporary incongruence, which measures the incongruence of intermediate state, and the final incongruence, which measures the incongruence of system end state. We can see that 
the, the green line EV is almost as fast as the Cisco system WV. EV provides comparable but slightly better temporary incongruence to WV, but the incongruence in EV is only temporary. When routines are done, EV can fix this incongruence and provide a serial equivalent end state. However, WV cannot. We also find out and evaluate how pre and post lists reduce latency with the cost of temporary incongruence. When both mechanisms are off, Safe Home runs with longer latency but zero temporary incongruence. If both mechanisms are on, the routines finish with shorter latencies but higher temporary incongruence. In summary, Safe Home is the first step to provide reliability from a routine execution level. It provides four visibility models, among which EV model provides the best of both worlds with good responsiveness and a strong guarantee. Our proposed lock leasing mechanism can improve latency up to four times. Here is my presentation for Safe Home. Thanks for listening. All right. Uh, thank you, Ray. Um, uh, we don't seem to be having any current uh, questions. So in the meantime, while people are uh, priming, let me uh, ask the following question. Um, so you, you mentioned this temporary incongruence. I'm trying to understand what is the practical importance of the temporary incongruence? Yeah, for the practical incongruence is it does not, uh, usually it will not have a very bad consequences for the users. So that's why uh, uh, even though it, uh, for the EV model, it sacrifices some of the temporary incongruence, but uh, as long as eventually it can satisfy what the user eventually wants, that's, that's not a very bad thing. Um, you uh, for the uh, for example in the example that uh, I show in the slides, for example, in serial order, the uh, coffee maker and pancake cannot do it together. But uh, uh, we we do like that, but it's fine. It's basically a pipeline uh, mechanism of that. So in theoretical, uh, in practical, it mostly will not have bad sequence. But in some cases, if the uh, devices are located to each other or they have some physical world connection which is not reflected in the routine or execution that might have some uh, influence. So that one, uh, the physical world impact connect between devices is not covered by our uh, safe home, but that's definitely a very valuable way that we can explore. But that's also the thing that we want to bring up with a temporary incongruence so that if user have this concern or they have this thing that they want to avoid this at all, they can choose the other model instead. I see, makes sense. Uh, there's another question in the chat by Mario Skoyas. Um, great work on very interesting domain. Uh, how can you guarantee deadlock freedom with the pre and post lease mechanism? Uh, so the question is the freedom of pre the deadlock freedom that you won't have any deadlocks with your pre and post lease mechanism. Uh, oh. Are you doing anything to, to guard against deadlocks? You, uh, for um, the pre the pre lease and post lease, it will not uh, uh, bring any uh, bring any deadlock. So this is a, a guarantee from the safe home. This is a conclusion. But how we do that is by our design of the lineage table. So it, your, uh, how it works is uh, when, uh, whenever a routine comes, it will uh, directly uh, be scheduled at that time point, and it will try to place it in the in the timeline schedule that we have. Uh, and uh, if any when placing it, if any possible violation of the serial order or the deadlock or those kind of thing, it will not happen. So uh, the deadlock check or that part is uh, is like is avoided when scheduling is already happened. So if I understand correctly, it's basically that you that that this the serialization order functions as a total order in which the locks are acquired, which prevents a deadlock. Yes. Does that understand correctly? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Thank you very much. I think we don't have time. We're a few few minutes over already. Thank you very much, Ray, for for the for the great talk. Thank um, you. So our final paper for this session uh, is titled uh, "Trace Splitter: A New Paradigm for DAO Scaling Traces," and the presenter is Sultan Mahmoud Sajal. Uh, who's a third year PhD student at Penn State. Please play the video. Hello everyone. This is Sultan Ahmad Shajal. I'm here to present our work Trace Splitter, a new paradigm for downscaling traces. This work was done with Rubaba Hassan, our advisors, Timothy Zhu and Bhuvanur Gaukar at Penn State, and our collaborator Siddhartha Sen from Microsoft Research. Here, 
will show an example system that you might find in production. It is a typical three-tier setup where a large cluster of web servers queries data from the database and caching tier. Now as researchers, we would love to run realistic experiments with production traffic. Developers would also benefit from the testing their new features and code changes in the production traffic. To perform such experimentation, a common approach is to collect the traces from the production setup and replay the traces on the experimental setup. These traces contain valuable information such as incoming traffic pattern, arrival time, payload size, etc. from real users. This information is valuable to both researchers and developers as they capture the real-world phenomena. However, with this approach, there comes a problem, which is the experimental setups are generally much smaller than the production setups. So, directly running the traces on a smaller experimental setup is not possible because the load would be too high. Thus, an ex important pre-processing step for running the trace on an experimental setup is to downscale the trace. Downscaling refers to the process of taking a trace and lowering its load to run it in a smaller setup. It is also important for the downscaling process to preserve the important characteristics of the original trace as much as possible for realistic experimentation. But how do we do this? One prominent approach in downscaling is to stretch out the requests in longer time period to reduce the load in the system. For example, to halve the load of a 24-hour trace, the requests in the trace are spread across 48 hours by doubling the interval time between the requests. We call this approach time span scaling. One obvious downside of this approach is the distortion of the temporal pattern. This would lead to problems in some systems such as autoscaling systems, where the autoscaler would think it has more time to react to the load changes than the original trace would have allowed. This can lead to incorrect evolution of the efficacy and agility of the autoscaling system. Another subtle and possibly counterintuitive pitfall of this approach is that it might create longer lasting temporary overloads than the original trace. This can translate into deceptive overload with correspondingly degraded performance. Another popular approach for downscaling is taking the average arrival rate in a fixed time interval and multiply that by scaling factor to get a desired arrival rate. Then, a new downscale trace is generated via an arrival process that has the calculated arrival rate. We call this approach average rescaling. The efficacy of this approach is highly dependent on the choice of the appropriate time interval. Choosing too small an interval can result in exaggerating the burstiness in the arrival process, while choosing a too large an interval may suppress it. In this example, we demonstrate the effect of choosing too long a time interval in the downscale trace. As you can see, the downscale trace does not represent the original trace. Learning the correct time interval requires extensive study of the trace, which is not always possible since such a study would be orthogonal to the actual work. And that is why this approach can easily lead to erroneous results. In this slide, we use an alternative representation of the trace for demonstration purposes. Here, we show a trace that has different request types and request sizes. Each request is depicted with a horizontal line. We depict the re different request types by using different colors and different request sizes by using different thickness of the line. The widely used approach for downscaling we are discussing here involves randomly picking requests to generate downscale traces. We call this approach random sampling. One key downside of this approach is that it can easily exclude important requests. Furthermore, the probability of being excluded is higher for rarer requests. As a result, the resultant downscale trace may not be representative of the original trace. On the other hand, this sampling approach can also overrepresent the rare requests. With traces where the rare requests have very different performance characteristics than the regular requests, such under or overrepresentation can lead to misleading results in experiments. Here we present results from our experiments. In the presented graph, the y-axis contains the percentage of rare requests in the trace. Along the x-axis, we present the different traces. We take a trace and, using random sampling, create 10 different downscale traces, which we label as RAND1 through RAND10. As you can see, the rare requests made up 0.25% of the original trace. And while RAND1 and RAND8 do a good job of preserving that percentage in the downscale trace, the others do not do so well. So how can we realistically downscale a trace that will not suffer from the discussed pitfalls? 
If we look closely to the production setup, we can see that each node in the web server tier is fronted by a load balancer. This means that each node in the web server tier gets a partial view of the whole trace. In a well-balanced system, it can easily be assumed that any two nodes would experience statistically similar traffic in terms of trace characteristics that affect latency. And this insight leads us to the key idea of trace bitter. The key idea of trace bitter is that we can use load balancing techniques to downscale traces. We suggest that we can have an entirely hypothetical construct to mimic the load balancer in the system, which would gener generate multiple downscale traces. We claim that one can take any subset of the traces and consider that a properly downscale trace of the original trace. And this is how we design our trace better framework. Our design framework of trace splitter utilizes this insight by using a simulated load balancer. This takes the original trace and a user provided scaling factor as input and generates multiple downscale traces using load balancing techniques. Each of these downscale traces would represent the requests seen by a subset of web server nodes. One key benefit of our approach is that we do not lose information in the sense that any rare requests would show up in at least one of the downscale traces. Our new framework for downscaling gives us several downscaling approaches borrowed from the load balancing policies. For example, we can use random load balancing for randomly downscaling traces, which is equivalent to the existing random sampling approach. The round-robin load balancing policy would result in deterministic sampling for downscaling. This, in this approach, at each round, it distributes the requests among the downscale traces in a deterministic manner. Another load balancing technique, joint shortest queue, can be translated to randomized round-robin where at each round, the requests are distributed in a random manner. This approach minimizes the skewed behavior in RR, resulting from deterministic pattern. However, in the presence of job size variability, we discovered that least work left policy performs best. When splitting a trace into multiple downscale traces, this policy assigns the requests to the downscale trace with the least work so far in the trace. We denote this as TSLWL. So in practice, how should one use trace splitter? The traces are collected from large production setups. We take the trace and use trace splitter to generate appropriately downscale traces. These downscale traces can then be used in experiments running in the experimental setup. One can take any one of these downscale traces and perform experiments with this as it would represent the original trace. If one wishes to have more requests in their experiments, they can easily choose any number of downscale traces for their experiments used one after another. And if they do not want to miss out on any of the requests, they can also choose to run all the downscale traces one after another. In this case, they are making up for their smaller setup size with longer running experiments. To evaluate trace splitter, we look at latency-based performance metrics. In our evaluation, we first run the original trace in our original setup and record the latency numbers. After that, we run the downscale trace in the downscale setup and record the latency. Finally, we compare the latency-based performance between the original and the downscale experiments. In practice, we do not expect or require the researchers to have access to the original setup. We only use this access to develop and evaluate trace later. For our experiments, we use multiple synthetic and real-world traces, one of which is the Microsoft OneRF trace. OneRF is a common web rendering framework that services web requests to Microsoft's storefront properties such as xbox.com, etc. The trace used in our experiments tracks the high-level web requests from users that arrive at OneRF. We compared the latency-based performance of the original trace with traces generated using multiple downscaling approaches. Here we have a bar chart of different percentiles of latency where the x-axis has the percentiles and y-axis has the value. In this graph, the closer the latency of a downscale trace to the original, the better it is in preserving the characteristics of the original trace. As you can see from the plot, TSRWL matches the performance of the original trace very closely, even in the tail. TSRRR and RR do not do as well compared to the TSLWL due to not considering the job size information. The poor result of average rate scaling comes from failing to capture the short-term burst due to poor, poor choice of time interval. The performance of random sampling is also bad for not considering any of the properties while downscaling. Finally, the degraded performance of time span scaling or T-span comes from the downscale system being overloaded 
for a longer period than the original, something we touched upon earlier. This and through several other experiments, we discovered that TSLWL performs the best in downscaling. That is why we promote this to be the superior approach. Please refer to the paper for details on all the experiments. To conclude, the target of this work is to show the downsides of popular downscaling techniques being used and to provide a novel solution that outperforms those. The key idea of our approach is that we propose using load balancing techniques to downscale traces while preserving trace characteristics. Our extensive experiments with both real-world and synthetic traces show the superiority of our approach. The source code of TraceSplitter has been open source for the benefit of the community. Thank you. Thank you, Sam, for the talk. Um, so uh, while we're waiting for questions in the in the uh, Slack channel, I have a question of my own. Um, I'm trying to understand to what degree one needs to know what is the load balancing policy of this, you know, um, proprietary uh, production system in order for this to work well, because it seems to be a, an assumption, right? Uh, yes, that's actually a very good question, and. I think uh, in here we made a reasonable assumption that it is somewhat load balanced according to the work that you're experiencing. And while we do not have any um, explicit, uh, any extensive experiments, we think that the if you can match the actual load balancing policy in phrase feature, it will give you the best results. So but our assumption you don't that know what it is, right? You, if you, I mean, you need to know what the load balancing policy is in order for you to match it, right? Yes, we do not know that, but we as uh, I think it's it's reasonable to assume that they use something or some sort of a variation of the least work left to maintain that each node or each subset of the nodes see the similar kind of traffic. And and I guess kind of a follow up to that is uh, you mentioned the LWL was the best. Is that across uh, all traces, or was it because you mentioned this was for one trace, right? Uh, okay, so the Yes, so across all the experiments, we saw that uh, LWL does consistently well. And the, while in some traces, some other technique does well, they fall, uh, they don't do well in other traces. So LWL is the only consistent approach across all the traces. So, so I guess that does it, I mean, could, could I then draw the conclusion that, that the policies that are actually on the, on the full production system are the ones that resemble LWL the most? Uh, that yeah. That, is likely doing that best? Yes, uh, in some way we can we can draw that conclusion that they they do, they also obviously have some proprietary uh, techniques of their own, but it's some variation of LWL so that the load is uh, distributed properly across all of it. I see. Um, so uh, one final question before we, uh, uh, David Holland asks, do you think this technique will work for other kinds of traces? Uh, for example, file system IO traces? Uh, I think, uh, I think it depends on the um, performance metric that you're looking at. Like for file systems, if you do, um, if you're thinking about latency, I think we can we can make that guarantee. But if you're talking about other uh, characteristics or other metrics such as let's say throughput or CPU utilization, you cannot directly take our approach. But we think that like one of the main contributions of our work was to show the pitfalls of the other other uh, approaches, so that those still apply, and you can take inspiration from our technique, even if you cannot directly use that. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Tom. Uh, uh, this is the sure. end of the fifth session. Uh, I would like to thank again the presenters uh, for the great presentation that they gave, and all of you for your attention. All right, so uh, Peter is here already. I think, Tali, are you there? Hello. Hello, hi everyone. Hello everyone. Welcome. So okay. we have a few minutes before okay. the session starts. Okay.
I, I thought we were going to play some kind of a uh, yeah, break video, but okay. <laughs> well, I think we can wait for a while. I would say uh, sure. in the meantime, more people will join in. Okay. Okay, I think we can start. So welcome back everybody. This is the fifth Ask Me Any Anything session uh, at uh, Euro 6 2021. Uh, so just a reminder from my side, uh, please join the um, 
Ask Me Anything channel on Slack. There is a pinned post uh, where you can post your questions uh, for our guest. And with that, I will pass it over to Thalia. So looking forward. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm very excited to moderate the last Ask Me Anything session. My name is Thalia Dimitra Dudeli. I am a PhD candidate at Georgia Tech, advised by Ara Gabrilovska. My research area is at the intersection of systems and machine learning. Uh, I will be graduating this year. I hope to continue in academia and keep growing in this community. And with that, I'm very excited to introduce uh, Peter Druschel. He's the founding director of the Max Planck Institute for Software Systems and currently the chair of the chemistry, physics and technology section of the Max Planck Society in Germany. Previously, he was a professor of computer science and electrical and computer engineering at Rice University in Houston, Texas. His research interests include distributed systems, mobile systems, privacy, security, and compliance. He's the recipient of an NSF Career Award, an Alfred Sloan Fellowship, the ACM SIGOPS Mark Weiser Award, a Microsoft Research Outstanding Collaborator Award, and the URSS Lifetime Achievement Award. Peter is a member of Academia Europea and the German Academy of Science Leopoldina. And this is just a brief summary of Peter's achievement. And with that, I'm, I'm glad to start asking questions. Uh, so let's start with what we have on Slack. Uh, from Antonius Katsarakis, uh, University of Edinburgh. Uh, specialization has the potential for rapid growth of a subfield. However, it leads to an overall structure of disjoint specialized fields that may encounters, uh, encounter and solve similar problems in isolation. In your opinion, the future computer science would benefit more by further field specialization, field merging, better communication among existing fields, or some mix of the above? <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Talia. And, uh, and uh, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me. It's a, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here. Mm -hmm. um, so if I understood, the question is, in the context of systems research, right? Is there a need for more specialization or more integration or communication across things? So let me first say that I actually, within computer science, I view computer systems as sort of a, um, a generalist subject, right? Where people typically have uh, a more generalist background and generalist uh, expertise. This is, to me, what partly characterizes systems research, that you're not hyper-specialized on a particular uh, technology or mechanism or particular theory, uh, but you are more focused on solving particular problems and then uh, designing a complete solution to that, at least at the level of a research prototype, right? But you are, you're not per se an expert on, you know, program analysis or cryptography or whatever it might be but we are sort of have a very general education. And then we tend to, once we're focused on a problem, bring in expertise from different, um, from different subjects, um, either by uh, reading up on it and relying on, on published work or by quite often collaborating with specialists in, in these subjects, right? Who can help us solve problems. We are maybe off the shelf existing solutions and from that field are not sufficient for the problem at hand. Um, so that said, I think it, it, it actually, just to some extent, right, I, I view the purpose uh, of systems research as being precisely of being, you know, more integrative, right, not being hyper-specialized, mm -hmm. but, uh, but being more focused on solving problems and building a complete system, a complete solution uh, towards that, relying on whatever expertise and uh, sort of specialty subjects are required to solve that problem. Great. Thank you for your answer. Um, let's move on. Uh, from Saurabh Bakchi at Purdue University. Do you have any advice for starting researchers in the field of computing systems who may be jealously eyeing the vastly longer publication records of someone in uh, AI or machine learning rel relative to someone of similar seniority in computing systems? So people in, you may be at the same age with someone else, but they may have much more papers than we do in, in systems. What is your take on that? Right. Well, I think this lies uh, precisely in the nature of what we do, right? And it's kind of um, uh, gels with what I just said, right? We're typically not 
um, uh, developing, you know, pursuing just one idea in a specialty area and, and kind of making an improvement, writing a paper on that and going on to the next. But we're typically focused on a um, on, on, on a problem space, right? And then we need we need time to pull in actually the different pieces that you need to solve that problem. And then we're actually trying to build a complete solution, right? Not just, you know, making an improvement to one algorithm or one particular technique, but actually solving a problem, building a complete system um, that addresses this problem. And that fundamentally requires more time, um, you know, not the least of which because we, we typically have to build some software, right? The, the, the actual prototype building takes time. And so as a result, I think even top systems researchers maybe, you know, publish two, uh, two papers a year where someone in AI or vision might publish uh, a paper every month, right? <laughs> Um, and so, I, but I think people who, are, who, who, who know their way around computer science, right, know this. And, uh, you know, you don't just compare publication counts. People know very well in systems that, uh, you know, what you can expect realistically um, from someone who builds systems and, uh, and, and builds practical systems. So I don't think, you know, why it might be a bit intimidating, especially for young graduate students, right, to see how your, your office mate's uh, publication list is growing by, you know, by, by the week or by the month. Um, and, and you're still kind of working on the same prototype uh, system. Um, it, you know, rest assured that people know how to evaluate um, uh, research contributions in different fields, right? And, and the measures are different. And in the end, what counts, of course, is not just publication count or citation count. What, what matters is, um, you know, how the community views the contributions and the importance of the research you're doing. Yeah, it's, it's very important to highlight that, especially for young PhD students, they shouldn't be discouraged. It just, it just takes a little bit more time. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Great. Uh, let's continue uh, with a question from Antonio Barbalas from University of Edinburgh. Uh, considering your experience, what is your take on the differences between doing academic research in U.S. and in and the Europe, Europe United States and Europe? Yeah. Um, you mean in the context of systems research, right? Um, yeah. You know, I am actually of the persuasion that I don't. I, I wouldn't overemphasize these differences. I know there is some some controversy around this, and I and particularly many of my Highly respected colleagues, right in the in the Euros in the Euros uh, community specifically, uh, some of them think that um, European systems research has a, a different profile mm -hmm. and is focused on different problems. I'm personally not so convinced. Um, what I what I appreciate personally very much about Eurosys, the conference, and Eurosys as the community very much is that it it, it from its conception has always tried to have a very open broad interpretation of systems research, right? So there were not kind of tight fences that say, oh, this is too much like a database that shouldn't be in the Eurosys, right? Or this has too much crypto in it, it shouldn't be in Eurosys, or this has you know, too much um, program analysis in it, it's not really a systems paper. We've always interpreted this very broadly, and I think this is important, and I like that very much about Eurosys. But beyond this, I don't really think that there is so much of a difference, um, you know, um, the standards or or the techniques or the or what is valued as important or important. I don't think there is that much of a difference really mm -hmm. um, between the U.S. and Europe in systems research. Great, good to know. Uh, okay, next one from Pramod Batotia from TU Munich. So he says that you bootstrapped, bootstrapped a brand new institute, the Max Planck Institute for Software Systems, a top institution for systems research. It's always challenging to start anything from scratch. What was your experience in establishing uh, the institute? What worked and what didn't? And he has a follow-on question. Uh, again, secondly, he says, how do you see landscape of systems research in Europe? How do we build centers for systems research beyond a few top places in the EU? So let's start with how did you build the institute and what are the challenges? Uh, yes, this is a, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, it also reminds me of the AMA uh, that happened earlier with uh, Willie Swenable, of course, who did a very similar thing at EPFL um, starting a few years earlier than, than I did. Uh, but we kind of proceeded in a, in a very similar way. I mean, I think the, um, there's probably, probably two sides of it. I think the most important 
thing that we did and that I think proved to be right is that we kind of adapted within Europe uh, a model that it was typically previously sort of more typical of, um, of how uh, uh, US departments were organized, namely around a faculty, uh, a very flat uh, organization, you know, with independent faculty of different seniority levels, but that each pursued research independently um, and a tenure track system, which enabled, um, you know, uh, qualified young people to give them full independence very early on, right? provide mentorship in a supportive environment, but give them full responsibility and full independence early on, which uh, at the time when both Willie at EPFL and I and at MPI started this in the early 2000s was still relatively new in Europe. Now it's, as you know, no longer so, so special, right? Many other organizations have, have gone similar routes, um, not just because of what we did, right? But, but of, because it just, I think it turned out to be the right thing to do. Um, and my thinking at the time was, you know, traditionally at the time, uh, at the time there was no Eurosys, uh, right? Uh, and uh, there was also, I think, uh, systems research in Europe as a community didn't really exist. There were a few pockets, a few groups that did um, sort of outstanding work in in in, uh, in computer systems in Europe, but was, there was not a broad community. And so it it seemed clear to me that if you want to have a strong presence in systems, you would have to be attractive for people globally, right? For people who were trained at US universities, you would have to create conditions that would um, make it attractive for someone say who has done a PhD in the US to come to, come to us and you know, be an assistant professor and, and go through a tenure track um, uh, faculty career ladder. And that required a similar model, right? And that's exactly what we did. It's what EPFL did, it's what we did. And I, and I think it was the right decision at the time. Um, I, I think that was probably a key the other thing that I, I somehow modeled actually after my experience at Rice, which was also a, a, a relatively small, very intimate uh, computer science department, still is, right, uh, between 15 and 20 faculty members, is to create sort of a very tightly knit um, uh, community, right, with a lot of open doors um, for students, for faculty, uh, for everyone, um, and encourage uh, collaboration. So, for instance, don't, don't try to build artificial walls among different groups, but kind of mix people as much as you can, encourage seminars and other events where people get to talk, right, across uh, boundaries of, you know, systems research and programming languages research and AI research and whatever it might be. And I, and I think that also turned out to be um, the right thing, uh, particularly in systems, because I think some of the most interesting, exciting systems research today uh, is is the one that combines systems thinking with another discipline, right? Whether it is uh, AI or machine learning, and I'm not just saying this to please you, uh, Talia, right? But uh, mm -hmm. but uh, but but it's just one of the most exciting things going on in in in, in systems um, or systems research that that um, you know builds on systems on, on on technology from cryptography or from privacy technologies. Uh, or from programming languages, right? Whether it be verification technology or uh, program analysis, right? Just, just to mention a few examples, but, but I think systems research that tries to bring in, um, you know, techniques from other disciplines, uh, I think sort of are among the most exciting. And uh, just to, to complete the question, so you mentioned some of the positive things that happened. What about some, some of the things that didn't work in, in your transition uh, from US to Europe and establishing? MPI. Um, what are some of the things that didn't work? Well, I think uh, one of the things that happened is it, everything took much, much longer than I thought. <laughs> I can understand. Um, and, um, and, you know, and some of the specific things that I thought at the time we would do, like, you know, specific expertise that we would build up within the Institute didn't exactly quite happen that way. For instance, I would not, I would not have predicted actually initially that uh, we would be known for systems in, in our institute, but that we would also be extremely well known for programming languages and verification, right? That, that was not what I had originally planned for. Not that I mind, right? But I, I didn't actually expect it. Uh, it's just that, it, you know, if you look for the, every year when we hired, we looked for the very best people we could get. And there happened to be a few very strong uh, people in, in programming languages at the time. And once you have a few good people and they're very dynamic, right, they attract more. And now we, we are we actually have a huge presence in, in programming languages and verification. And this is fantastic. It's not exactly what I planned, 
Now, I, I, I feel like I'm dodging your question, right? Because you want me to say something negative, but um, I'm not sure there is really something that was a complete disaster, but we had to, you know, we had to make adjustments, right? Uh, and I think this is the case in every research project. It is also, uh, is also the case for every project of building an institution. You have some initial plan, you know, some things work out the way you had expected, others don't. What do you do? Well, you change course, right? Like you pursue new opportunities. And so what you build is not exactly what you had envisioned earlier on, but this is how you avoid, avoid failure, right? If, if you were narrow-mindedly focused on the blueprint that you had originally set out with, you would likely uh, fail or, or achieve at best a partial success. But if you're, if you're dynamic, right, and you pursue opportunities as they arise, then usually you can't really fail. Um, by the way, this is also good advice for startups, right? M most startups don't deliver exactly the product that they had originally envisioned, right? But they are being opportunistic and flexible and, and they go, um, you know, the path of least resistance. And uh, just to follow up with the second part of Pramod's question, how can other places in the EU, in the Europe, uh, build centers for systems and, be, and become more prominent and, and more established in the systems research, apart from the big places that we all know about? Yeah, I, I, think, I think the field is fairly open, right? Because we, we don't have, I don't feel, See, um, for instance, if, if you look in, suppose you had a situation like um, in the United States, uh, maybe in the 1990s, right, where you had a, a, a very dominant uh, computer science systems research in, in Stanford, Berkeley, uh, and then MIT, perhaps University of Washington. Um, and then everyone sort of was a, a notch down. But these places all had metropolitan centers around them. They had massive industry around them. They had Silicon Valley in the case of, of Stanford and, and Berkeley, right? That's a hard, um, that's hard to compete if you're an up and, up and coming uh, organization. But I don't think we have that in, in Europe right now, right? I, I think there are some differences. Uh, some locations are more blessed with both great academic places and industry than others. Um, but I don't think we have these huge differentials. So I don't think it's that hard for any, I would say, European university. Um, all they need to do is hire a, a few strong people in systems and try to build on that, right? Try to hopefully be granted the flexibility and the resources by their organization to be allowed to hire additional young people. Um, and usually once you have just one or two groups that are doing great work that are very visible and published, right? That makes them attractive already for uh, additional people, as long as you have competitive, you know, competitive uh, sort of structural um, um, aspects such as, you know, competitive salaries and the tenure track system, and, and you give people the freedom, right, to pursue their own research. Great, great. Um, I'm gonna select a few more questions. Uh, so, uh, Amir Kordadi from University of Edinburgh. As you stated, doing systems research needs an integrated approach and you have to come up with a whole solution. It might seem overwhelming, especially for new research researchers. And it seems you have to know many things and code and debug a lot. What is your suggestion for young PhD students who just started doing systems research? Yeah, I think, you know, the, uh, the way I think you should have approach graduate school in general probably, but particularly in systems, is not sort of set out with the idea that I have to start graduate school and in my first year, I have to define my own project, right? My problem, my project, I have to do everything, right? I have to bring in the expertise, I have to define the problem, I have to you know, come up with the different design elements, I have to implement everything. Um, just you know, occasionally talking to my advisor to, to give me feedback. Maybe if you're absolutely brilliant, right, uh, you can pull this off. But I think it's not, uh, it's not uh, the safest bet for most of us mere morals. Uh, mm -hmm. I think a much better way is to join a group and in your first year, see what other projects are going on. Right? Usually there are projects, if it's not a, a, a very small project, there are multiple um, uh, grad students of different seniority levels already working on it, maybe a postdoc. Uh, maybe it's even uh, involving different faculty members, right, with different specialties that contribute. See if you can join one of these projects initially, right, and just kind of um, come along for the ride, right, uh, ask whether you can join, um, 
contribute uh, some part of it, but you will see how things work, right? And as you are joining this project, you will learn much, much more about the other aspects of the project, right? You, you'll see how such a project is actually uh, executed from, from the idea and how the idea is shaped and reshaped and, and you know, and, and finally formed and how you, uh, how you go from that all the way to writing a paper and publishing a paper. Um, and then, in, in fact, usually I think a typical way for systems, uh, young systems students, a PhD student is to join multiple of those projects, right? Maybe not necessarily at the same time, but play a larger and larger role in these projects until you eventually, maybe in your second or third year, right, you, you, you become a lead of, of one of those projects. But this makes the, the path a lot more manageable, right? You will learn these things. Uh, along the way, uh, the different dimensions of what it means to do decent research, uh, systems research, you learn it along the way, and you're not, uh, you know, in front of this huge, um, steep mountain, and you think that you have to do it all yourself. And, uh, yeah, just to follow on upon, upon this question specifically, so there is a question from Alireza Sané from Queen Mary University of London. How would you pick or prioritize which problem to work on? So you say, let be engaged in a couple of projects. Where do you start? Should you, uh, I'm just saying things myself now. Should a student pick a topic that is in general popular or based on their interest or from their advisor perspective? What's the best? Yeah. So again, um, I think the same thing holds that I just said is don't try to do, make that decision all by yourself in, when you're a young student, right? I mean, seek the guidance. Uh, from your advisor, uh, talk to other faculty members in the organization about what they think are interesting problems. If you do have an idea, run it by, you know, your advisor, other faculty, more senior students, postdocs, see what they think. They will probably give you feedback and help you shape the idea or point out related work that may, may already, you know, um, well, in the worst case, precluded. Often you find out, oh, it's already been done. But most of the time, it hasn't been exactly done that way. But uh, knowing the related work helps you to focus and reshape your idea. Um, and the other thing is one of the advantages of joining uh, ongoing projects in your first year is that this you know, responsibility of picking the problem is not on your shoulders alone, right? Somebody has already chosen it. Although you may have an influence on it, right? But by joining the project, you might also get to... Um, um, you know, help shape that idea. Mm -hmm. um, but it, I think, it, it, you know, what I said earlier about um, the, the whole endeavor of systems research is even more uh, important for problem definition because problem definition or problem selection is one of the hardest things in, in systems research. Mm -hmm. It's one of the, the things that you get good at uh, last. And in fact, um, I, I think you never actually finish learning how to do it uh, in your career. Um, so, uh, you know, seek help. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> uh, let's move on to a question from Petros Magnatis from Google Research. You are overseeing a much broader set of sciences in your current role beyond computer science. Are there practices you see outside computer science that we should be implementing in CS? Are there practices from computer science that the other science says should be implementing? So the, the synergy between the different sciences. Uh, this is a very fascinating question. And I'm, I, I have to say, I'm still learning this, right? Because if you come into this role as a computer scientist, um, you have to learn a lot about how things are done in physics or in chemistry or in material science. Um, and, and there are important differences, right? One is these are much, much older, much more established uh, disciplines um, with much more ingrained processes, which is both good and, and bad, right? They're, they tend to be a lot more entrenched, a um, lot less open to radically new ideas. On the other hand, they have this sort of amazing agreement on what are important problems and what are the relevant techniques. Like what we, you know, a thing that happens often in, in particularly in computer systems research is you submit a paper, right, that that you think is a really important problem and you actually come up with a very good solution. It's better than anything that, that is, is published. But then people say, ah, I'm not sure this is an important problem or, you know, ah, yeah, you may have a solution, but I think I have a better solution. And, you know, it's kind of an open field, right? Every, everyone's opinion counts, right? Uh, 
Someone doesn't like the technique. Someone questions your data. Someone questions whether the, the problem is important. This really happens in more established discipline. There's a lot more, there's a lot more um, agreement on, you know, what are the important problems? What are the valid techniques? Um, but on the other hand, I, I suspect also that, that this narrows the field, right? Uh, it makes it much more difficult for radically different ideas to, to, to set hold which in computer science is still amazing, right? I mean, the rate of innovation that we have, um, I mean, I constantly have to explain to my colleagues in other disciplines, right? That it's not surprising that people are working on, you know, AI now and, uh, you know, a deep learning. And 10 years ago, 15 years ago, people, nobody would have predicted that this is going to have that importance. This is just mind boggling to people in other disciplines, how that can happen. <laughs> Um, so there, there are these important differences, but I'm not sure I, I have the perspective yet, right, to really say, you know, what can we learn, what can they learn. One thing I will say is I wish we were a little bit more cognizant as computer scientists that we are part of a very young, um, but also very dynamic um, discipline. And this is fantastic, right? This is, this is really a great playing field. But I wish we were often uh, sometimes a little bit more open-minded um, when we review papers, when we look at other research and not pretend like we know exactly, right, what are the important problems and what are the important techniques, but sort of give a little bit more room and let more flowers bloom. Mm -hmm. In the end, right, it's not our job to decide when we review a paper that's been submitted, whether that is going to be uh, good and impactful research. That will be decided by the community and by the industry and by society. And we'll only know in perhaps 10, 15 years, maybe in 30, 40 years, right? Um, uh, it's not for us to decide, we can't do that. So let's, let's be a little bit more liberal and say, hmm, this doesn't look wrong, right? This looks interesting. Um, I might not completely buy whether the problem is, uh, is, uh, is important. I might not completely buy that this is the final word on it or the best technique or the best solution, but let's give it a try. Yeah, that, that's very encouraging for, for young PhD students having reading thoughtful reviews and uh, not being discouraged when you submit a paper and it gets rejected. That's something you learn how to deal with, but it's, it's very nice uh, for you to say that for sure. Um, let's move on to a question from Andrew Moore from Cambridge. He says that Dave P. Patterson once remarked that students are the keys, the currency of the kingdom, in which case it's academia. How does systems research continue to attract awesome talent without losing to the latest shiny bubble interest? So yeah, how do we keep our, our best students? Um, yeah. Yeah, um, that's a, a very good question. Um, I think uh, so first of all, I have to say I'm, I'm, not, I'm not too worried, actually, because um, as long as we have uh, brilliant students coming into our program and we get them to actually broadly explore, because most, you know, most undergraduates who apply to graduate school, particularly if you haven't, they haven't even done a master's yet, they have perhaps at best seen one area of research right, where they happen to have an opportunity to work with a professor and do some research. And of course, they have all heard of, um, you know, the, the most exciting things going on in AI, um, machine learning, vision, whatever, um, natural language processing, uh, robotics, autonomous cars, and so. Um, and, and it excites them for good reason. Um, but I think it's important to enter a program where you have the opportunity in the first two or three semesters to, while you're taking classes, actually explore different areas of research, right, and try to uh, try to get a sniff, um, uh, get a sneak preview on different things. And I think quite often during that course, someone coming in, uh, being that certain, right, based on their limited experience as an undergraduate that they want to do research X, then become interested in something different. And quite often they are attracted by what we do in systems, right, that we actually are problem focused, not so much technique focused. So I'm somehow not too worried the only advice I would give, and I constantly tell that also to people who apply to grad school, uh, please don't, I mean, you might be excited about AI or vision or whatever it might be, but please don't make that, don't make that the only box you check, right, mm -hmm. on your grad application. 
because you might actually, I mean, you, you, you may all know this, uh, most, uh, most uh, graduate programs now get something like, you know, 80% of applications that say we want to do AI and machine learning. Obviously, they cannot take that many students in those areas. Um, and if you just check that box, right, you needlessly cut yourself out from, <laughs> from, from an opportunity that you might, that you might really appreciate. Um, but I think uh, it's an open market, right? I think, and of course, we also need to, we need to continue to be attractive. When, when, we, when we deal with young students who are just joining a graduate program, we need to you know, make an effort to, to convince them how exciting systems research is. And as long as we, and, and as long as the, the students have an open mind, right, and as long as we are also making an effort to explain to them why we are so excited about systems research, I'm not too worried. Uh, I want to extend the question uh, personally. I want to ask, uh, how do we um, make academia exciting for graduating PhD students? And to that, I'm going to add, uh, add the question of, Vasilis Gavrilatos, he says, what is your career advice to the students, to your students that ju just graduated? So, yeah, what about yeah. after PhD? Yeah, this is, a, this is a more difficult question, right? Because um, I think uh, there are now, in particularly in computer systems, uh, for someone graduating that uh, with a PhD, there are so many really, really attractive uh, positions in industry um, that, um, that actually makes me worried a little bit more because not only do we you, you lose very many young uh, graduates uh, to, to industry or to industrial research labs, um, but increasingly also uh, established colleagues in academia, right, switch uh, to uh, enjoy an industry um, for, for reasons that are completely legitimate and, and, uh, and, uh, and quite reasonable. Um, but of course, there is a, a concern, right? If too many do this, then uh, who is actually going to produce the next generation of young people in systems, right? We, we can't completely deplete the pool of academic systems researchers. Otherwise, um, there is not going to be that pipeline of young people. Mm -hmm. um, that, that is a, a more worrisome question. Um, I think whether you, what career you pursue um, after a PhD is a deeply personal question, and I would not... Uh, I would not try to talk, or right? I've never, even though deep in my heart, of course, I like it when some of my students at least show an interest in academia, um, I would never try to talk someone into it, um, right? I will, I will discuss the pros and cons, but in, in the end, it's a very personal decision. Mm -hmm. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, and another one in, in relative terms from, again, Vasilis Gabrielatos. Uh, he says, what are things you would change in academia if you had uh, complete control? What would I change in academia? Well, I think I would probably, at least in computer science, and uh, I, I, would, I would even more accelerate this transition in Europe specifically towards systems that um, break down these walls among different groups and, and actually give young people independence um, uh, early on, right? Like uh, in the sense of a faculty model, in the sense of a tenure track system. I think I, 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 I wouldn't necessarily say this is the case for all disciplines. This is also something I learned since I'm, you know, after dealing more with other disciplines, but in computer science, um, I think there is, it's the, it's, a, it's the right model, right? You want to uh, give the people with the freshest ideas, right? Uh, the ones who are all on fire uh, because they want to advance their career, they want to pursue their ideas. Give them as much freedom as, uh, as they desire to realize their vision early on um, and, uh, and allow them to grow within an organization. Um, this is probably the one thing I would say. Otherwise, I'm not sure that... Uh, there's anything fundamentally wrong with academia per se. One thing that is a little bit more, it's not exactly the question you asked, but one thing that's a little bit more of concern is we're increasingly entering a phase or an era where um, access to latest technology, access to data, access to operational production infrastructure is a huge advantage. Uh, this, this has happened before, right? Uh, there, there were periods, and if you go look back to the 50s, 60s, 70s, 
there were periods when it was hard for academic systems researchers to get access to the, the, the tools they need to do meaningful systems research. Then came Berkeley Unix, right? And all of a sudden, everyone had an, had an open source system that you could actually work on operating systems. Mm -hmm. And now I think we're, we're entering a phase. Well, it's not, it's, it's not so black and white, right? Because so sort of public clouds, for instance, have, have also been a tremendously valuable resource for, for systems researchers to experiment and deploy large systems um, at relatively low startup cost. On the other hand, access to data, access to some cutting edge technology is, uh, is getting harder. And, uh, and this, is, um, this is somewhat a concern. Of course, there are ways to mitigate, right? You can collaborate with people in, in industrial research. You can send interns, uh, your students as interns. That quite often is a way of doing things um, jointly and get access to these kinds of things. But one has to be, um, you know, doing that, moving in that direction comes also with the risk of getting more short-term focused. And that's not, that's not, uh, that's a bit dangerous too, because I think academic systems research has to do the things that perhaps industrial research doesn't do so much. Namely, you look at sort of the next, you know, the five years ahead of um, beyond the current dominant technology. Great. Uh, this has been great. Thank you for your insight. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll just ask a quick random question from Eric Aide, and he says, is SOSP 2021 going to be in person? <laughs> is, is, is SOSP 2021 going to be in person? Mm -hmm. Unfortunately not. Uh, okay. We, we had, no, it, it is just, we, we delayed the decision for as long as possible, but I, okay. it, seems, it's, it seems just too risky. You know? <laughs> And uh, okay, I think we have time. We have maybe three more minutes. So maybe you can tell us a bit more of personal things like what hobbies do you have? How do you balance your work life and actual life? <laughs> like more <laughs> happier side. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, particularly with my latest responsibilities, I'm, I'm afraid I'm fairly unbalanced. <laughs> I work a lot, but, I, but, I, but it's not that I'm complaining about it, right? I think... Um, I think work-life balance also means uh, doing things that you love, and uh, you know I don't mind working long hours if I if it's meaningful to me and I find it fulfilling. Mm -hmm. uh, but yes, I do do work quite a bit, and when I'm not, then uh, you know I, I don't know I I enjoy a glass of wine, I enjoy good food, I, I sometimes do some cooking on the weekends. I like to ride a motorcycle when I um, when I uh, find the time. Um, and, and also try to do a little bit of sport. I used to play soccer, but it, I'm too old. But now I'm trying to do, you know, mundane things like play badminton or, or run or walk. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. No, we should all have such hobbies to, to get our minds off. Uh, a quick question from Andre Moore again. What is your favorite pa paper and the first paper you give your students to read? It's, easy to uh, it's a tricky question. Um, <laughs> You know, um, I'm not sure there is the one. It depends a little bit on what, uh, I mean, of course we have a reading list uh, of papers that we give all the first year students of just very seminal fundamental things that you need to know as a system student. but you all know that, right? It's on, on every reading list. Um, uh, beyond that, I would, um, I would, it depends on what problem or what space we're working on in, uh, Honestly, I'm also a little bit hesitant to sort of answer that, you know, so single out individual papers because that really requires a lot of thinking to, to give a fair and balanced answer, right? So, yeah. um, but, uh, but, but it, uh, of, of course, there are, um, I think it's easy to point out uh, papers that are a little bit, you know, 20 years ago, right? Everyone uh, sort of knows what, what were the really influential things. Uh, Rosenblum's paper on on virtual machines, right in the in the early nineties. I mean, it's clear that, uh, or the papers from Berkeley about uh, early papers about um, you know cluster based computing and so forth. Uh, uh, right. You know, it, it's uh, the, it, it's clear that these are, are very very important things. Um, and then again, I already hinted at this. I think some of the most interesting stuff currently in systems going on is when people combine systems thinking with programming languages technique, verification techniques, machine learning, um, cryptography, differential privacy, you have it. Great, great. Uh, I think now we're officially on time to end. So thank you so much. It's been very insightful. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, again, it's been an honor to be here. And uh, thank you so much. And, and uh, wish you great success with the rest of the conference. Thank you, Thalia. Thank you, Peter.
Yeah. Bye bye. 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 Okay, I think uh, we need to add our presenter, presenters for the next session. So should I just do the promotion or should I ask someone to do it? Uh, I guess, uh, so is it, uh, Young, yes, yes. Hi. So uh, you, you can we can promote your uh, yeah. So if if you can identify them, they can raise hands. For example, the speakers, please, and then we can promote them. Yeah. Okay. Great. For all the speakers, please raise your hand, please. I see Shaolin Chang is here. Yes. Okay. So let's see. See driving, yeah, please raise your hand, please. So that one just can promote you. Okay. Chang Hu Shu. Is it Chang Hu Shu? Yes. Okay, thanks. Uh, I think we are, we are having people raising hands for the next session as well. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, it may not be, we, those can wait, I would say. Uh, please raise only if you are part of session six uh, for databases and language support yeah so we have a lot of panelists now but that's okay okay one five please raise up your hands please so that we can add you to the presenter Okay, when we go, uh, please raise up your hand. Okay, thanks. Uh, I'm see here. Good. Okay. Okay, you can start now. Thanks. Okay, there it is here. Okay, good. I think everyone is here. Good. Okay. Okay, so let's start. Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to the database and language support session. Uh, my name is Yang Wang. Uh, I'm from the Ohio State University. Okay. Uh, our first talk is about how to perform incremental graph processing. Okay. Uh, our presenter, Xiaolin Jiang, is a fourth year PhD student from UC Riverside. And she is interested in industry intern opportunities starting in and after summer 2021. Uh, and two other students will attend the QA session as well. Shi Zhe Ying is a third year PhD student, and Chen Huo Xu is a fifth year PhD student. Chen Huo is currently looking for industry jobs, including both full time positions and interns. Okay, uh, please play the video. Hi everyone, my name is Xiao Lin, and today Xi Zhe and I will give a presentation of our work Fibling. In real world application scenarios, the stream of updates are continuously applied to the graph, often in batches for better efficiency. This is known as a streaming graph scenario. Taking Twitter as an example, as new followers are generated, new edges are added to the existing graph. To get query results up to date, a naive solution is to simply evaluate the query on the latest graph from scratch. But for iterative graph queries, this full query evaluation can be very expensive. As a result, existing streaming graph processing frameworks choose to evaluate the queries continuously and incrementally. 
Several streaming graph systems have been proposed to support incremental evaluation. The basic idea is that whenever the graph is updated, the query of interest will be evaluated based on the results of previous evaluation rather than from scratch because the updated part is a tiny fraction of the entire graph. The incremental evaluation usually converge much faster than a full re-evaluation. However, this approach requires to know the query beforehand, known as a standing query. Only if the users are the same query, then it can be incrementally evaluated. Otherwise, the user query has to be evaluated from scratch. This is especially an issue for vertex-specific queries, which carry a source vertex as a parameter, like BFS, single source shortest path, and many others. Taking BFS as an example, if the standing query is for vertex swipe, then only the BFS query for vertex swipe can be incrementally evaluated. If the user asks a BFS query for Vertex 7, it has to be evaluated from scratch because the results of standing query cannot be directly reused for the new query like Vertex 7. The primary goal of this work is to lift this requirement so that the user query for any force Vertex can be incrementally evaluated. The key to achieve this goal is a concept called graph triangle inequality. We all know the triangle inequality in the Euclidean space. The sum of lengths of two sides must be greater than or equal to the length of the third side. In fact, a similar triangle inequality also exists in the graph space. Considering three arbitrary vertexes in a graph, the shortest distance among them also form a triangle. This distance-based graph triangle inequality is well known to the theoretical graph community and have been used for graph optimizations before. More interestingly, we found similar principles for many other graph problems, such as single source credit paths, single source reachability, Witter B algorithm, and others. For different graph problems, the operators used for addition and comparison could be different. Take a single force credit path as an example. Here, the addition becomes mean as the greater than becomes less than. To capture all these different cases, we propose an abstraction of graph triangle inequality with a generalized addition and a generalized greater than operator. Here, the property refers to any path-based graph properties between two vertexes. With the triangle inequality, now we can connect an arbitrary user query U with standing query R. Their results must satisfy the corresponding triangle inequality. Based on this connection, we design a more general framework where the user query can reuse the results of the standing query, even when their source vertex are different. We call this triangle inequality based incremental evaluation. Each time the graph is updated, the standing query will be re-evaluated first. Then their results will be fetched to the triangle inequality module. The module will generate vertex initial values based on the triangle inequality and directly starts the evaluation of these initial values rather than the default initial values. As the latter must be no worse than the former, actually, often much better, it tends to take less iterations and computations to converge. At a high level, the triangle inequality module serves as adapter connecting the user query with the standing query. For correctness purpose, in this work, we assume that the graph evaluation function is monotonic and safe under asynchronized exclusion. Both assumptions have been commonly referred to in existing graph frameworks for various optimizations. First, the triangle encoding ensures that the calculated initial values are valid 
which means the initial values are possible states during actual evaluations of the query. Second, the monotonicity ensures that the converged values are no greater than the initial values. Then the converged values may replace the initial values. And finally, the asynchronicity ensures that even with asynchronized execution of the vertex functions, the converged values will eventually replace the initial values. Together, they ensure that the results from triangle inequality based evaluation must be the same as a non incremental evaluation. Due to time limits, there's some complexity I may not cover in detail. One of them is the handling of directed graphs, which essentially requires us to maintain the results of both the standing query and its reverse queries. Another complexity is the selection of standing query, for which we choose queries for high degree vertexes to maximize the reachability to the user queries. In addition, we also consider maintaining multiple standing queries and select the one with highest potential for each given user query. More details can be found in our paper. Next, Xi Zhe will talk about the implementation and evaluation of this technique. We implemented the triangle inequality-based incremental graph evaluation on top of an existing streaming graph engine called Aspen. We named the new system Tripolin. Aspen is a state-of-the-art streaming graph engine which supports low latency and high throughput graph updates. It maintains the streaming graph using a compression tree-based data structure and processes the graph in parallel in a way similar to LIGRA. The two new modules in Tripolin are the standing query evaluation module and the user query evaluation module. The former maintains multiple standing queries continuously and incrementally. Based on their results, the latter incrementally evaluates the user queries using triangle inequality. In addition to the vertex-centric programming model, Tripolin also provides an interface for developers to specify the triangle inequality for given graph problems. Here are some details about our evaluation setup. We run the experiments on a 32-core commodity server with 512 gigabytes memory. We evaluated Tripolin using eight graph benchmarks on four real-world large graphs to simulate the streaming scenario. We assume that a substantial portion of the edges has been streamed in. Then the rest of the edges are inserted into the graph in batches. By default, the update batch size is 10K. As for the number of standing queries, we vary it from 1 to 64, but by default, we set it to 16. This table shows the speed ups of tripling compared to the non incremental evaluation of user queries. Overall, we observed substantial speed ups for most benchmarks, which confirms the effectiveness of the proposed triangle inequality optimization. However, depending on the type of queries, we also find that the speedups vary a lot across different benchmarks, ranging from 1.1 to over 30 times. To further examine the variation of speedups, we measured the ratio of vertex function activations with and without triangle inequality optimization. Basically, a higher activation ratio implies less computation savings, thus lower speed up. As shown in the table, this ratio also varies significantly across graph benchmarks, which indicates that the effectiveness of triangle-based incremental evaluation highly depends on the graph problem. Taking single source YDS path as an example, the activation ratio is extremely low thanks to its min-max nature of the computations. In our paper, we provide a detailed analysis on how the graph problem properties affect the effectiveness. Besides the above experiments, we also vary the graph update rate to examine its impact on the standing query evaluation efficiency and the number of standing queries 
to study how it influences the effectiveness of a triangle inequality optimization. Moreover, we also try to apply it to a state-of-the-art general-purpose streaming framework called differential data flow. In general, we observe similar benefits. You can find the details of these experiments in our paper. In conclusion, we found that graph triangle inequality is a common property for many vertex-specific graph problems, and it is a key to enable a more general graph query incremental evaluation scheme. Based on this principle, we built tripling on top of an existing streaming graph engine and observed substantial performance improvements for a range of different graph queries. Thank you for listening, and we are happy to take any questions. Okay, well, we are waiting for questions. Uh, so that maybe let me start with one, okay. So actually I have a question about the scope of this kind of problems. So uh, you talk clearly said, okay, in order to use tripling, uh, the application needs to have several properties and uh, your evaluation will show that even with those properties, uh, sometimes tripling will not perform very well depending on the graph's properties. So I guess my question here is that, you know, for those applications which do not meet those properties or do not perform well on the triplings, is it possible that we can design some other methods to uh, make them perform well, or is that just uh, impossible in theory? Hi, uh, I'm Hidra. Yeah, I think if the, a certain graph problem uh, that you cannot derive, derive a good triangle inequality, maybe you can still use other optimization techniques and implement it, and then it can perform better than the baseline algorithm. Okay, cool, thanks, good to know, okay. Uh, okay, I think we are a little bit over the time, so maybe let's move to the next one. Uh, thank you. Thanks. So our second talk is about incremental graph processing as well, but with a different focus on how to optimize performance by taking sparsity into consideration. Uh, our presenter, Joanna Che, is a master student from Simon Fraser University. Okay. Her advisor, Professor Kawa Waro, will attend the QA session as well. Okay, please play the video. Hello everyone, my name is Joanna Chi and I am from Simon Fraser University. Today, I will be presenting DZIG, Sparsity Aware Incremental Processing of Streaming Graphs. This is a joint work done with my lab mate, Mugulin Mariapan, and our advisor, Kavul Voro. Graphs are a flexible data structure that can be used to easily represent a variety of data and are applicable to many situations. We can use graphs to represent social networks, roads, and even disease transmissions. With these varied applications, graphs can also be very large in size, with millions of vertices and billions of edges. As a result, it is important to have systems that can scalably and efficiently process large graph data. Graphs are also dynamic, and they naturally evolve over time as the data changes and grows. So we have streaming graph processing, where graph computations are run continuously in order to provide results that reflect the current state of the graph. For these graphs, being able to return results in a timely manner is important, as stale results may no longer be useful. So as time continues, the graph receives more and more updates via a continuous stream of graph mutations, and then the query results are computed on the latest result of the graph which contains all the previous updates. Thus, it is important to be able to compute results at a low latency. To provide timely results, Streaming graph processing uses incremental processing that reuses work that has already been done before so that it does not redo the same work again. This means as updates are performed on the graph structure, the computed results are incrementally refined to reflect the impact of these updates. The goal of incremental processing is to reuse the work that has previously been completed so that processing will only be done on vertices that are affected by the graph changes. Graphvolt is a state-of-the-art streaming graph processing system that does incremental processing to quickly compute final results that are fully correct. 
This means the final results are the same as if you were to perform a from scratch BSP execution on the updated graph snapshot. Graphpool tracks dependencies in form of intermediate vertex values as computation progresses, and then it performs dependency-driven incremental refinement that incrementally adjusts these tracked values. So let me quickly explain Graphpool's dependency-driven incremental refinement. Basically, we first identify the change in vertex values that happen as a result of graph mutations, and then we propagate these value changes to the outgoing neighbors in a stepwise fashion across iterations. In this example, we have the vertices u, v, and w, and I am showing how their values change across consecutive iterations, from iteration k to iteration k plus 3. The colors represent the values of vertices that are computed by the algorithm. So if the color is different across consecutive iterations, for example u here, going from maroon to red, then that means the value of u is different in those two iterations. So now, the whole point is to incrementally adjust these values when the graph gets updated. This is done by propagating changes or differences in values that result from the graph update. So here, first u and w receive changes from the updated graph with, and calculate new values for themselves. And then, because their values change, they push their changes to v during the next iteration. And then, based on these changes, v calculates its new value. Now, during this iteration, u and w once again receive new values from their neighbors, and so they recompute the results and once again push their values to v. This process continues iteratively to final results are computed. Now, an interesting thing to observe here is what happens when the changes start diminishing and the values start to stabilize. So here, only W's value changes in iteration k plus 2, but U's value remains the same, which is shown by the same light yellow color here. So W sends this change to V, which is fine, but V's value at iteration k plus 3 is not aware of U's value from iteration k plus 1. So in order for v to calculate its value correctly, it still needs to continue pushing its value to v. So this is unnecessary work that needs to be done, which causes more values to be propagated even when changes have diminished and values have stabilized. The issue here is that the vertices do not retain the changes that they received in the previous iterations. So here, even if v had received this change in the previous iteration, it did not retain this change in the next iteration, which forces u to resend the value. Processing changes in this manner is not friendly to computation sparsity. So then this begs the question, how can we retain high-performance execution with dependency-driven incremental processing during sparse computations? To address this, we developed DZIG. DZIG is a sparsity-aware incremental refinement technique that uses dependency-driven incremental processing while retaining high efficiency in the presence of sparse computations. DZIG also follows the same philosophy of Graphbook, where dependencies are tracked as iterations progress and the dependencies are then incrementally refined when the graph structure is mutated. So there are two things we need to figure out, how to identify sparse computations and how to retain computation sparsity as we perform incremental refinement. We first define sparse updates, which we call del0. Del0 is defined as the delta between a vertex's value across consecutive iterations. Basically, if the change in value, or delta, is less than the algorithm supplied epsilon, then that change is a del zero. In our previous example, we can see that vertex u in iteration k plus 2 does not have a new value. So the delta for vertex u is a del zero, because there is no change, and hence, u does not need to push any value to v. These del zeros are usually naturally expressed in graph algorithms to identify whether vertex values have stabilized. For example, in the page rank algorithm, after the vertex value is computed, it is compared with the old value to see if the difference is above a threshold. This comparison directly determines whether the update is a del zero or not. Now that we have identified sparse computations as del zeros, let's see how we can retain them. We basically want to make sure that we express the computation in terms of changes across consecutive iterations. That is done by expressing incremental refinement in a recursive fashion. So in these equations, we want to compute g, t of i, which are the dependencies for the updated graph using g, i values, which are the dependencies from the old graph. This happens recursively, which is captured from the t, delta t i minus 1 on the right side. Effectively, this means there is an implicit dependency between consecutive values of the same vertex. 
and the self-dependency retains the changes that were propagated up until the previous iteration. So then, we are only left with changes that happened in the previous iteration, and this is captured by the remaining terms in the equation. So first, there are the direct changes resulting from the edge mutations. For example here, a new edge from G to D is added so that the old change needs to be propagated from G to D. Similarly, edge B to C is deleted, so we retract the old change that was propagated before the deletion. And then there are the transitive changes that trickle down from these direct changes. So for instance, as Steve's value changes significantly, the change is sent out to his out neighbors. Now because all of these changes are based on the previous iteration, we can directly identify del zeros, which is our sparse updates, and suppress them. And that is captured by the precondition on the operations here. Finally, going back to our original example, we can see that the vertexes u and w once again push their values if and only if their own values have changed. And we can also see that b maintains the change from the previous iteration. So when u's value remains the same, u's value is not sent again, and thus sparsity is retained in the computation. We have a formal proof of correctness showing that results computed by our del zero aware incremental refinement will always be consistent with the baseline VSP execution that starts from scratch. I won't be going through this proof here, but do check out our paper if you are interested. There are several other details present in DZIG that I won't be covering in this talk. I have presented the del zero aware incremental refinement strategy in DZIG. We also have the adaptive sparse incremental processing that automatically limits the overheads of dependency-driven execution using performance monitoring and a simple linear regression-based estimation strategy. There are also details about dependency tracking, our efficient dynamic data structure based on adjacency lists that enables fast graph mutation, and our programming model that exposes del zeros to the runtime. All of these details are present in our paper. Coming to the evaluation, we thoroughly evaluated DZIG across different synchronous graph processing benchmarks, page rank, belief propagation, collaborative filtering, code training expectation maximization, and label propagation. And we ran these algorithms on multiple input graphs going all the way up to 6.6 .6 billion edges. And we conducted the experiments on a 32-core server. Here, I am showing the execution times in seconds across different mutation batch sizes. So apart from a single edge mutation, we simultaneously applied multiple edge mutations, all the way up to 100 million edge mutations at a time. So we have resync, which basically restarts the execution upon graph mutation and performs incremental computation. And we have DZIG, which significantly outperforms resync as expected. DZIG's del zero aware processing retains high performance even across very large mutation batch sizes. In fact, it pushes the scale of dependency-driven incremental refinement to over 10 million simultaneous mutations. And the consistent high performance delivered by DZIG is visible when compared with Graphbolt across different configurations. For instance, Graphbolt's dependency-driven execution works well for up to 1,000 to 1 million mutations depending on the graph algorithm. Finally, we compared the performance of DZIG with other streaming graph processing solutions, including Aspen, Graph1, Llama, and Stinger on PageRank and the Shortest Path benchmark. Since these systems focus only on graph mutation times, they do not have any incremental su su processing support, like GraphBolt or DZIG. So here, I am also showing the execution times separately for the graph mutation phase and the analytics phase. When it comes to end-to-end -end processing, incremental processing in the analytics phase is much more important than just graph mutation, and that is why DZIG and GraphVolt significantly outperform all of these systems. Specifically, end-to-end -end processing in DZIG is about 30 times faster than Aspen, and is about 120 times faster than Graph1. For graph mutation times, DZIG's dynamic graph data structure enables fast graph mutation and is competitive in modern solutions. In fact, for a large number of simultaneous mutations, DZIG's data structure is much faster than recent works like Graph1. There are also plenty of other experiments that I haven't covered in my talk. For instance, we studied the performance across different degrees of sensitivity to changes and the memory consumption by our dependency tracking mechanism. I would highly encourage you to check out our paper for these details. To conclude, Dependency-driven incremental processing is important to maintain high performance while processing streaming graphs, and GraphVolt already took a large step in this direction. 
DSIG takes the next big leap in pushing the scale of dependency-driven incremental processing to high mutation rates, and it does so using a Stella Zero aware incremental refinement strategy. DSIG also incorporates important techniques like adaptive incremental processing, merged edge updates, and efficient dynamic graph data structures that enable it to deliver high end-to-end -end performance and significantly outperform the state-of-the-art solutions. DSIG is implemented in GraphBold as its core engine and is open sourced under the same GitHub repository. We invite you to check it out. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Joanna. I think uh, we have time for one question. Okay, so there's a question on Slack from Zhijia Zhao from UC Riverside. Uh, thanks for the nice talk and interesting work. Does this work assume a push-based value propagation model? I guess a natural follow-up is that if so, can your approach be applied to other models? Hi, thank you for the question. So um, the uh, we can have a, it can do both the push-based and a pull-based model. So it is, the model is flexible enough to have both support for push and pull based. And the, um, I was sorry, what was the second part of the question? No, I guess you already answered that. Oh. If, uh, you was, if you just implement a push based model, can it be further applied to other models? Other models, I think uh, uh, you just said it's flexible enough to support both push and pull based, right? Okay. Okay, anyway, thank you. Okay, so, so let's move to the next one. So our third talk, Chameleon DB, will talk about how to build an efficient key value store on persistent memory. Uh, our presenter, Wenhui Zhang, uh, will be answering questions after the talk. He was a postdoc at the University of Texas at Arlington when this work is done. And now he is looking for jobs in the related field. Uh, please play the video. Hello, my name is Wen Hui Zhang. I'm glad to present Chameleon DB, which is a key value store designed for uptime persistent memory. Here comes the first question Why should we have a key value store designed specifically for uptime persistent memory? already has so many key value store designs, designs for DRAM, for block devices, and for persistent memory. But optimum persistent memory is very different. It's different from DRAM, different from traditional block devices, and it's even different from what was assumed about persistent memory. All these differences make existing key value store designs not optimal for optimum persistent memory. Optimum persistent memory is like DRAM. It is by adjustable and can be assessed by the CPU directly but data can only be assessed in the unit of 256 bytes inside Optum PMEM. So rendering assessed data with size smaller than 256 bytes greatly harms its performance. These two figures show the piece loop we can achieve from Optum PMEM with different assessed unit size. It is easy to conclude from these two figures that the write and read bandwidth of Optum PMEM cannot be fully utilized with a assessed unit size smaller than 256 bytes. The smaller the assessed unit size, the lower slope we can obtain. This property makes optimum PMEM different from what was assumed about persistent memory. The assessing data in cache line size is efficient. Therefore, QR store designs for persistent memory that employing small random writes of persistent memory, light level hashing, CCH, are unable to provide high write performance on optimum PMEM. Now we know that optimum PMEM is kind of like traditional block devices as its assessed unit size is larger than cache line. And we have LSM chip based key value stores designed for block devices. So, another question will be are they efficient for optimum PMEM? They use sequential writes to persist data so they can be good at write performance, but analysis indicates that its read performance can be poor. LSM chip is a multi level structure, curing a key usually needs to check multiple tables in different levels. When these tables are stored in a slow block device, the read performance will be really poor. A common practice to expedite the get operation in LSM tree is using Bloom filters. Filters are built for each level and are placed in DRAM for fast access. When curing a key, these filters are used to determine whether the target key is in the level or not. 
So we can bypass reading tables from those levels do not contain the target key. This is a great solution and it works well when using traditional block devices as storage. Because when using block devices like SSD as storage, the time to check filters in DRAM for multiple levels is negligible compared to the time reading data from the storage. This figure shows the time breakdown to carry a key from a multi-level structure with Bloom filters. Reading tables from SSD contributes to 99% of the read latency, while checking filters is nearly negligible. So the read latency of such a multi-level structure on SSD can be stable and as low as a single level structure. But when it comes to using Optum PMAN as the storage, whose read latency is only three times that of DRAMs, the time to check filters for multiple levels becomes significant. This finger shows the time breakdown of querying keys from a multi-level structure on Optum PMAN with Bloom filters. The time of checking filters from DRAM is compar comparable to that of reading table from Optum. When the number of levels increasing, checking filters contributes to a large portion of the read latency. That means a multi-level structure on Optum PMAN with endurance filters cannot achieve similar read latency as a single level structure. The multi-level structure itself becomes a major barrier to achieving consistently low read latency. So on one hand, a single level structure index on Optum PMAN can result in small random writes, which turns out to have poor write performance. On the other hand, a multi-level structure turns out to have poor read performance. So why not just move the index to DRAM? Small random writes to PMAN are avoiding. The write performance can be good. We can also avoid checking multiple levels. The read performance can also be good. But DRAM footprint for the index can be large. Moreover, recovering such a large index during a restart may take an unacceptable long time. In designing Chameleon DB, a keyword store for Optum PMAN, we would like to achieve four goals. They are high write performance, low read latency, small DRAM footprint, and short restart time. Next, I'm going to detail the design of Chameleon DB. Chameleon DB uses a storage log in Optum PMAN to store KV items. Items are batched and written to the storage log according to their arrival order. To query items in the storage log quickly, Chameleon DB maintains an index. The index can roughly be regarded as two parts, one part is placed in DRAM while the other part usually is the larger part, is placed in PMAN. The structure of the storage log is simple, so we are going to focus on the structure of the index. The index is organized as a multi-shot structure. Each shot covers an equal and non-overlap range of hash key space. Each shot is organized as a multi-level structure similar to LSM tree, except that each table in Chameleon DB is hash table but not sorted string table. Each shot has its own main table to gather items in DRAM before flushing them to Optum PMAN. We have a structure named auxiliary bypass index in DRAM for each shot. I will detail this structure later in this talk. Let's first focus on the multi-level structure of a shot. Each shot holds only one table in its last level while holds multiple tables for other levels. And accordingly, we utilize size tier compression in levels except the last level for lower write amplification and utilize level compression in the last level for less sub levels. Let's see an example of size tier compression in Chameleon DB. In this example, a level is regarded as full when it holds four tables. And now level zero that holds four tables is full and need to be compacted. The four tables in level zero are merged to a single table which is then being inserted to level one. After the compression, level zero becomes empty, while the number of tables in level one becomes four, which means uh, that it is full and also need to be compacted. Therefore, another compression from level one to level two will be triggered immediately. The four tables in level one, including table one, three, that was just generating are merged to level two. We try to avoid generating and reading table one, three in such a situation by using a scheme called direct compression in Chameleon DB. Let's first recover the scene to this one that level zero is not compatible. The direct compression scheme in Chameleon DB allows a compression to involve multiple levels. In this situation, level zero is full and level one will be full where compression from level zero to level one is complete. So a direct compression from level zero to level two will be triggered. All tables in level zero and level one are merged together as a new table in level two. By this scheme, the overhead to generate and read table one three is avoided. Actually, this direct compression will 
may level two become full. And last level compression will therefore be triggered. So next I'm going to explain the last level compression of chameleon DB. Again, I recover the same to this one that level zero is full, while both level one and level two already have three tables and there is no other levels between level two and the last level. In such a situation, a direct compression from level zero to the last level will trigger in chameleon DB. To maintain only one table in the last level, we use level compression for compressions to the last level. So not only the tables in level zero to level two, but also the last level table are involved in this compression to generate a new last level table. And after the last level compression, all levels except the last level become empty. For now, we can see that each shard in chameleon DB employs a multi-level structure, which I have mentioned in the previous slides that has poor re-performance because a get operation will need to check multiple tables one by one. That's why we introduced our serial read by pass index in chameleon DB to improve the re-performance. The serial read by pass index, API for short, is an enduring hash table that holds all items in all the levels except the last level. To make this happen every time chameleon DB flushes a main table to level zero, it also inserts the items in main table to the ABI. And then after the last level compression, chameleon DB clears the ABI as all levels except the last level are clear. By using this ABI, we can bypass checking the tables in upper levels. We check at most three tables during a get operation. The last level table will hold a large portion of the index. Only a small portion of the index items will be buffered in the ABI. So the DRAM footprint of ABI will not be large. In Chameleon DB, only the main table and the ABI of each shard are maintained in DRAM and may need to be recovered during a restart. The main table, which is pretty small, is definitely need to be recovered. But the ABI, which is a larger structure, actually is not necessary to be recovered immediately during a restart because its items can be found by checking upper level tables, which are persisted in optimum PMAM. Without recovering the API immediately during a restart, the chameleon DB will be operated in a degrading mode in which get, operation, get performance can be poor, but we can recover the API gradually, so the degrading mode will not last long. Now let's have a look at the experiment results. This finger shows the write performance, read performance, and DRAM footprint of, DRAM of chameleon DB with five counterparts. The right most scheme, DRAM hash places its whole index in DRAM while PMAN hash scheme uses a single level in PMAN structure as index. The other three counterparts utilize multi-level structure similar as chameleon DB. We can see that chameleon DB has higher write and read performance than its counterparts except DRAM hash, while it has much smaller DRAM footprint than DRAM hash. Besides, chameleon DB can restart in one second while DRAM hash needs nearly two minutes to recover its large index. The results presented in these slides are very brief. We have much more experiment results on the paper. That's the end of my talk. Thanks for your interest. Thank you, Wenhui, for the talk. Uh, I see there's already a great discussion on Slack. Some questions are already answered. So let me pick those have not been answered yet. So uh, there's a question from George. He said, nice work. In the paper, you mentioned that you store keyways in a log. How and when do you reclaim the memory in the log? Hi, this is Wenhui. OK, thanks for the question. So. Um, the log in the in the chameleon db is actually like other logs used in the log structure uh kv stores so uh, it needs to be a uh, garbage collection uh, when the log is too large um we do not mention the the garbage collection scheme in in our paper because um lots of paper ha have this discussed it and and we do not do some uh, like uh, novel skins in in our in our design. So um, you can you can say that we just use a, a like just just do do the uh, reclaim of the of the log just like uh, other skins. Okay, thanks. Uh, okay, uh, I have a 
Time for a second question. Giorgio says, hello, nice work. Uh, what as I understand is that Cameron is towering plus KV separation. Uh, how does it differ from previous systems such as Django? Also, how ABI differs from a DRAM cache? Okay. Um, so firstly, Chameleon, Chameleon DB is a multi-shark structure. So we can have high concurrency. We can do uh, insertion. We can do curia and do compressions concurrently. And uh, the, a the ABI is very different from a DRAM cache like a LRU cache. Because like LRU cache just cache the uh, most recent, recent items in, in the cache, but uh, the ABI caches uh, the upper levels, the, the items in all the upper, uh, upper levels in, in the multi-level structure. By this, we can, we can uh, definitely skip the multi uh, the the upper levels when doing a query uh, by by checking the uh, ABI, but with a uh, like a LRU cache, uh, if if we we have a miss in the LRU cache, we cannot skip the multiple uh, levels. We still need to check the multiple levels uh, one by one. So um, I I would say by using an an ABI, we can have uh, consistently low uh, latency, but with a LRU cache, may, maybe uh, when the data has high locality, we can have low latency, but when the data, ha ha uh, the, the locality is not very strong, uh, we can still have very poor uh, get performance. Uh, okay, thank you, Wenhui. Uh, I think there are more questions on Slack. Uh, let's take a look. Okay. So let's move yeah. to the next one. Okay. Uh, in our first talk, uh, we will see how to perform incremental graph processing again. Uh, but this time we will see it with different problems and uh, in a distributed setting. Uh, our presenter, Laurent Bing Chandler, uh, is currently a postdoc at MIT and will be on the job market in the fall. Okay. Please play the, play the video. presentation of our EuroSys paper, Desera. I'm Laurent. This is joint work with Yasmina, Baptiste, Ashvin, and Willy. We're going to talk about graph pattern mining. In short, graph mining aims to find instances of interesting subgraphs, which are called pattern in a graph data set. Basically, our goal is to enumerate all instances of the pattern within the graph, where each instance of the pattern is called a match. One thing to note is that graph mining is quite different from graph analytics problems like page rank or connected components. In particular, what's unique about graph mining is the fact that there is significant intermediate data. Even for small graphs with a few million edges, you can actually end up with billions or trillions of matches. Uh, another thing is that graph mining applications are generally more CPU intensive. So here's an example of a graph mining application called graph keyword search. Our goal here is to find all minimal subgraphs connecting a set of labels of interest that are attached to the vertices of the graph. Here we represent the labels using colors. So in this example, you can see on the bottom right that there are three matches for the particular pattern in the graph. So generally graph mining algorithms and systems concern themselves with static graphs. Uh, in this paper, however, we're going to talk about graph mining in the different context of evolving graphs. So our goal is going to be to find the matches in an evolving graph that receives a stream of updates that changes its structure. Specifically, we want to incrementally maintain the set of all matches so that it always reflects the new state of the graph. So designing systems for graph mining with evolving graphs introduces a new set of challenges. First, we need to make sure that the system is correct. That is, it shouldn't miss any matches and shouldn't produce duplicate matches. Second, we need an efficient system that can support thousands to millions of updates per second. And we always want that system to be able to maintain the results in near real time, that is somewhat interactively. And in particular, that means we can't afford to recompute entirely on the whole graph after each update. Finally, in order to scale out, we need to minimize the amount of synchronization and data exchange across workers. So here's our graph keyword search example again, but this time with an evolving graph. 
Now you can see what incremental computation means. So on the left, you have the original input graph. On the right, you have the input graph after we applied some updates. So here updates are just adding or deleting edges. And at the bottom, you have the corresponding matches. So our goal is to compute the differences as efficiently as possible between these two sets of matches. So here, for example, we have three new matches after the update, and we have two matches before the update that are no longer valid. So this is the problem that our system Tesseract is designed to solve. Tesseract incrementally mines evolving graphs, which is generally thousands of times faster than naive complete computation of the new match set after the updates. Intuitively, this is somewhat expected because updates to the graph have generally a local effect. Like for example, an update should only affect the vertices in its neighborhood. Tesseract is also a distributed system, meaning it can scale out to a cluster of nodes and it supports a general programming model. That is, it can match arbitrarily patterns that are defined in code. Interestingly, Tesseract also happens to be faster than static distributed graph mining systems when the goal is to compute the full set of matches on a static graph. Now, there are two key ideas in Tesseract. The first key idea is update-based exploration, where we process one update to the graph at a time in isolation and completely independently of other updates. On top of that, we use a differential mining technique to find all the corresponding changes to the match set resulting from this update. The second idea is a series of techniques to avoid exploring duplicate matches. So these three techniques are an updated symmetry breaking approach that works for evolving graphs. The use of a separate multi-version graph store with various versions of the graph corresponding to updates and an optimization that we call snapshot-based exploration. Now the result of these techniques is that no data exchange or synchronization is necessary across workers which allows Tesseract to process updates in a truly task parallel fashion. So core to Tesseract is this update-based exploration approach. The idea is in fact quite simple. We want to process a single update at a time on a single worker and fully enumerate all subgraphs that include the update in a depth first search manner. So here, assume that the update is this edge between vertices one and two. The exploration process will start from this update and it will expand to enumerate all possible subgraphs that include this update. So here we would start by expanding with vertex three. We would find that this is a match. We would expand with vertex four. We would realize that this is no longer a match. And we would keep expanding. Here we wouldn't find anything until we backtrack. So then instead of expanding with vertex three, we would expand with vertex five and seven, and we would actually realize that this is also a match. And we would continue doing that until all matches have been found. Now, obviously the exploration process I described before does not address the problem of actually finding what has changed. This is why we combine it with the change detection technique that will essentially look at an expanded subgraph simultaneously in the graph just before the update and just after the update. This allows the system to figure out whether a match was present before the update in which case it should be deleted, and whether a match is present in the graph after the update, in which case it should be outputted as a new match. So here in the example, we're going to start the exploration again from the vertices 1 and 2, which correspond to this updated edge. And you can see that as we expand with vertex 3, we're going to find a match in the graph after the update. This is in green here, and we'll output that as a new match. We keep expanding and we're going to find a match in the graph before the update in red here and we'll output that as a deleted match. So one challenge with this update based exploration that I described is it's quite easy to end up with duplicate matches. These are undesirable both from a correctness and from a performance standpoint. So here are two examples of what can happen. The first example is for a single update and is essentially a situation where the exploration order could differ. So you could find the graph on the top left here, either as one, two, three, four in this order, or as one, two, four, three in this other order. Same subgraph, but it would be explored twice. It would be outputted twice. Now, a similar issue is also possible when you have two updates. This is here exemplified at the bottom. You could find the match twice, starting from each update. So in order to deal with duplicates in Tesseract, we combine several techniques. 
The first technique addresses the single update case and is an adaptation of symmetry breaking in the context of evolving graphs. This works by rooting the exploration at the update and then enforcing an order for expansion so you cannot possibly find the same graph with multiple explorations. The second technique addresses the case of multiple updates. And in this technique, we leverage our multiversion graph store to essentially force each exploration to only work within the graph snapshot corresponding to that update. Now, this prevents a situation where two explorations from different updates would find the same match. Finally, we also propose an optimization called snapshot-based exploration, where we group multiple updates into a single graph snapshot. This allows us to decrease the overhead of maintaining multiple snapshots and also to speed up mining by skipping intermediate matches between two snapshots. More details about that are in the paper. So how does this work when we have multiple workers? Well, interestingly, it works exactly the same way. There's no need to change anything else. We basically get parallel exploration for free. And this is because each update and its exploration is completely independent of the others thanks to the techniques that I described before. Now, this also means that updates can be processed in any order and that any update can be processed by any worker. In particular, it also means that several workers can process different updates in the same snapshot without having to coordinate. Now, to sum up, here is Tesseract system architecture at a high level. So the system receives a stream of updates that it timestamps in increasing order. Each update is then added into a shared multi-version graph store that tracks the state of the input graph over time. And then the update is inserted into a work queue. After that, we have distributed workers that can fetch updates from the work queue and compute the changes to the match set by exploring the graph, just as I described before. Now, an important thing here is that the graph store is not partitioned across workers, but it's kept separately. That means any worker can always read any part of the graph. Finally, the output of the system is simply a stream of changes to the match set that are ordered by timestamp. So let me summarize the key results in the paper. So the first result is that Tesseract is significantly faster than completely recomputing the matches from scratch. The second result is that Tesseract outperforms the closest system supporting evolving graphs. The third result, which is kind of surprising, is that Tesseract is actually faster than distributed graph mining on static graphs. Finally, we can also use Tesseract to track the updates to the match set in very large graphs after we've computed the original match set. So the result I want to show you here is the benefits that are achieved by incremental computation. So here we have the live journal graph. We're running that on eight machines. This is a fairly reasonably sized graph. And we compare Fractal, which is a static mining system, with Tesseract. So in this case, we report for two algorithms, click mining and frequent subgraph mining, how long it takes to process a graph with an additional 0 0.1, 1, and 10% of updates. In other words, the runtime here shows how long the system takes to compute the updated mining result. So Fractal, as a static mining system, must recompute the algorithm from scratch on the entire graph. And obviously, this can take a long time. Tesseract, on the other hand, simply computes the changes. And you can see that this provides very significant performance benefits. In particular, it allows us to provide fresh results or interactive results for graph mining. Now, this was just a very brief overview of the results. There are a lot more results and a lot more details about the experiments in the paper. Please check out the paper if you're interested. Please also check out the longer version of this video where we discuss additional results. So to conclude, I have presented Tesseract, a new incremental graph mining system for evolving graphs. Tesseract provides a general purpose API. It supports distributed execution in a cluster, and it can mine evolving graphs with millions of updates per second. Now, the key ideas in Tesseract are this update-based exploration approach, which can happen in a totally task parallel fashion, thanks to the fact that the system makes processing a single update completely independent of other updates, as well as our various duplicate elimination techniques that support this design. And with this, I'm signing off. Thanks for watching. Bye. Okay, thank you, Laurent. Uh, okay, while well, we are waiting for questions on Slack, uh, maybe let me ask one. Yeah, so. Uh, we have seen three incremental graph processing papers in this session. Since you are the last one, I leave this question to you. 
so can you maybe comment on uh, you know, whether your techniques and the techniques proposed in previous works, are they complementary? Can we combine those works to get the benefit of both? Or are they you know, targeting totally different problems? So they are all solved. Um, sure. So actually, uh, yeah, that's, that's a really tough question. Um, so my, like, as I said at the beginning of the presentation, essentially graph mining is a pretty different beast. Um, now, some of the techniques uh, in this work, I believe may be interesting uh, for analytics and, 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 uh, and just uh, graph queries. Um, for example, this idea that we want to have a separate like disaggregated graph store. Uh, that, that's like, I've seen that like briefly explored, but uh, like, like in, in, in analytics papers and others, but uh, I, I think this could be used. Um, this sort of other idea of, of essentially task parallel exploration uh, on, a, on a per update basis. Uh, yeah, um, like my sense is not for analytics. Uh, I, I think definitely for, um, for like graph queries, it could make sense. And then actually, I think some systems even do that. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, that's very helpful. Uh, okay, I think we are over the time limit. So maybe let's stop here and move to the next one. Thank you again, Lauren. Uh, our, in our final talk, we will see a different topic about how to make memory management systems flexible uh, across multiple software stacks. Okay. Uh, our presenter, David Leon, uh, is from the University of Toronto and he will be answering questions after the talk. Please play the video. Hello. Today, I'm here to talk to you about the work done with my colleagues at the University of Toronto on memory management in elastic system software stacks. Traditional data center provisioning has its hands tied. For example, with the traditional working set model, an application must have its working set in memory to avoid thrashing. Therefore, we must allocate an application to account for its peak working set if we care about performance. However, this also means that outside the peak usage, much of the allocated memory is not utilized. On the other hand, today we see new Elastic applications break these old traditions. An Elastic application practically never stops benefiting from additional memory while still being able to make progress given less memory. In the figure, we see two Spark jobs, k-means on the left and PageRank on the right. We can see that as the heap size keeps increasing along the x-axis, the job completion time drops significantly along the y-axis. As more and more data fits in memory, we see a decrease in the time Spark spends managing memory, shown by the green bar. This creates an interesting opportunity. If we can provide these elastic applications with more memory, we can improve their throughput. But how do we get them more memory? Well, we want to dynamically adjust application memory usage to match physical memory availability. We could try to do this in the OS, but the OS lacks critical domain knowledge about application memory usage. So we want to perform the adjustment directly in the application where all the information is. However, existing memory abstractions greatly hinder application memory management. And this problem only gets worse as complex applications have multiple layers of memory management, each with their own abstraction. So let's walk through an example of the problems created by memory abstractions in each layer of a Spark stack. First, at the very bottom, we have the OS, which abstracts away physical memory. This leads to applications falling back to static settings, such as the JVM heap size, to try and limit memory usage. By limiting memory usage, these applications attempt to avoid paging, but are completely unable to adapt to changes in both their own memory demands and system memory availability. Next, the JVM further abstracts memory by automatically managing all object allocation and reclamation in its own heap. However, since the heap management is not based on physical memory availability, the JVM becomes opportunistic. To improve performance, it'll delay GC even if it holds mostly garbage. Additionally, it'll optimistically hold on to unused heap space on the chance it'll be used again later. 
This leads to the JVM memory footprint growing to the max heap size without ever returning memory to the OS. The poor OS must assume that the JVM requires all of its retained memory. Therefore, when physical memory is exhausted, the OS has no choice but to page. However, a much more efficient solution could have been for the JVM to perform GC and return its unused memory to the OS. Finally, Spark further abstracts memory as it must partition its large input data into smaller blocks. Therefore, it manages a block cache which it statically sizes off of the JVM static heap size. However, the memory management of the block cache happens with absolutely no coordination with the JVM's GC. For example, the JVM may wish to perform GC, but as long as Spark holds on to memory, the JVM's efforts will be wasted as it finds no garbage. Spark could have simply evicted blocks, allowing the JVM to reclaim memory, but without coordination, memory management efforts are wasted. Spark could also perform eviction, leaving large amounts of garbage memory in the heap that go completely unutilized. To summarize, we've seen that memory abstractions are hindering elastic applications. They lead to static settings that cannot adapt to changes in memory demand or availability. And the problem is only made worse with modern complex applications containing multiple memory abstractions. Therefore, we created M3, whose goal is to improve the throughput and utilization of elastic applications. M3 works by bridging memory abstractions so that the memory management is coordinated and dynamically reacts to changes in memory demand and availability. For the remainder of this talk, we'll discuss the design of M3 before going over its evaluation results and concluding. To start, in M3, static memory settings are removed and applications are allowed to continuously allocate more memory. Next, we build a monitor that watches the system's physical memory. When physical memory passes certain thresholds, the monitor sends out a signal to the applications. We use two thresholds that are updated dynamically based on the system's memory demands. Applications under M3 require two modifications. First, a signal handler must be added to reclaim and return memory on demand. Second, the application must implement the adaptive allocation protocol on its allocation path. The job of the protocol is to slow memory growth when the system is nearing exhaustion, while still allowing applications to grow when memory is available. M3's design is rooted in a practical implementation of the end-to-end -end argument. The monitor only notifies applications of memory pressure and is completely up to the applications how they reclaim and return memory. To keep modifications simple, existing mechanisms such as GC or cache eviction are utilized for reclamation. These principles allowed us to only modify up to around 250 lines of code at any one layer. Now, let's walk through an example of a Spark stack handling a signal from the monitor. On startup, Spark will first register its signal handler. Then, when the monitor detects system memory passing a threshold, it'll send a signal to the process. In this case, the monitor sends a signal to the JVM, which then calls the Spark handler. The topmost layer then begins reclamation. In this case, Spark will evict from its block cache. Once reclamation is finished at one layer, it must notify the layer below it. Once notified, the next layer performs reclamation. In this case, the JVM will perform a GC cycle. Finally, the lower layer returns memory back to the OS. For the JVM, it'll use the mAdvise system call. With this step, memory can be allocated to other processes, avoiding paging. Now, let's take a look at the adaptive allocation protocol. The goal of the signal handler was to return memory to the OS, but is not enough to avoid exhaustion. While memory is being reclaimed in return, the adaptive allocation protocol must slow down the application's growth. This is done by dynamically adjusting an allowed allocation rate. An allowed allocation is an allocation allowed to grow the application's memory, while a disallowed allocation must first reclaim memory equal to its request before continuing. We can see in this simple code example, a cache can simply evict the same amount of memory as the allocation if it is disallowed. This is very similar behavior to when the cache is at capacity, so there are no correctness issues or complex modifications required. Now, let's revisit the monitor. To maximize memory utilization while still avoiding exhaustion, we dynamically adjust the high and low thresholds so that signals are sent based on the current workload's demand. If applications reclaim memory quickly, 
and the thresholds are too low, memory will be underutilized as the applications return memory before there is any danger. Conversely, if the thresholds are too high, memory may be exhausted if the applications do not reclaim memory in time. Now that we've seen M3's design, let's look at how it performs. We set up a cluster of nine servers. We have four jobs. PageRank, NWay, and KMeans are from the high bench suite and run on Spark in the JVM. Additionally, we create a cache and go that runs a mixed read and write benchmark. We create 16 workloads make up of combinations of these four jobs with different schedulings. We evaluate M3's performance by comparing the average speed up of each application's completion time. We compare M3 with four configurations that increase in how unrealistically well they perform. First, we compare against a default configuration with all the parameters left unchanged. Second, we compare against a global optimal configuration. This configuration sets each job's parameters to maximize the average throughput of all 16 workloads. Third, we compare against an Oracle configuration where the parameters of each job are tuned individually for each workload. This configuration requires separate parameter tuning for each possible job scheduling, which is completely impractical. Lastly, the Oracle with Spark parameter configuration extends this by also tuning unadvised and highly sensitive Spark parameters. But these last three configurations produce completely unrealistic results that M3 must compete with, as they require Oracle knowledge and endless tuning to achieve. In this figure, we see the 12 workloads where M3 has an opportunity to improve throughput, and it does just that. Each bar shows M3 speed up over a configuration for a particular workload, and M3 outperforms every configuration in every workload. Even compared to the most unrealistic configuration, the Oracle with Spark parameters, M3 is 1.6 times faster on average and 3.1 times faster in the best case. Now, let's investigate exactly where M3 speed up comes from. There are three jobs with the Oracle with Spark configuration whose memory is represented by the solid lines. The dotted line represents total memory. The jobs never reclaim memory and reach their peak memory usage, so statically, they cannot be given more memory. Now, let's look at M3. This figure adds in the parts of the monitor. Top is shown as a solid line at the physical memory limit, while the thresholds are shown as the dashed lines. The orange dots signify that applications are receiving a low threshold signal, while an X signifies a high threshold signal. Unlike the unmodified version, we see the first job aggressively utilize the available memory at the beginning. Once the second job starts, the first job begins to receive signals and return its memory, which the second job promptly allocates. Here, we can see M3 balancing memory as its demands of the second job allow it to grow while the first job shrinks. By being able to use all available memory, all three jobs finish significantly faster under M3. Now, over the years, there have been many works attempting to distribute memory and coordinate memory management. M3's uniqueness comes from its combination of crossing every memory abstraction layer in complex elastic application software stacks, following an end-to-end -end design, leaving all policy to the applications and its practicality. In conclusion, elastic applications suffer from memory abstractions as their performance is limited by uncoordinated memory management and static settings. We've created M3 to bridge multiple abstraction layers to coordinate memory management and dynamically react to changes in memory demand. We've open sourced all of our work on GitHub and I'd like to thank you for your time. Thank you for the talk, David. Okay. Uh, while we are waiting for questions, okay, maybe let me uh, actually have two questions. Okay. So first, uh, virtual machine seems to be a natural place to, you know, to do those things. So, uh, have you considered how the adding virtual machine as a, maybe as a, another layer affect the design of M3? Uh, yeah, I think that's a natural addition. Uh, there, there's uh, other works that have kind of covered that mechanism required to add in virtual machines. So I think we could definitely extend to use those mechanisms. It gets a bit confusing if you try to manage the memory both inside a virtual machine and across all different virtual machines. So combining those together would add some complication. 
Okay, what is next? Let's see whether we have some other questions. Okay. Okay, so there's a question from Ram on Slack. So thanks for the nice insight. Uh, what is the effect of M3 on lattice? Oh yeah, that's a good question. Uh, we didn't specifically measure latency, although uh, there could be issues when handling a signal as like uh, when you're handling the signal, it could uh, decrease your latency if it's in the middle of a critical request. Although if you're experiencing memory pressure, uh, you could also have latency problems even without M3 if you end up with a GC pause. So, you know, under memory pressure, we might add some latency issues, but you would be experiencing them anyways, very likely. Okay, okay, six. Uh, okay, I think we are around on time. Okay, uh, uh, thank you, that would be for all. Okay, that should conclude our session. Uh, let's thank our speakers again. And also thanks for all your uh, interest in this session. Okay, thank you.
Hello, can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, great. Is that a parallel system for this? Uh, I'm sorry, what? Okay, so I guess we are ready to go. Yeah, I think so. All right. Uh, so I'll get started. Welcome everyone to the final technical session of Euro EuroSys 2021, which is on operating systems and virtualization. Uh, please post your questions for the speakers in the Slack channel, and I'll read them out to the speakers after each uh, talk. Our first paper in this session, which won one of the best paper awards, is HASH, Light Touch Data Parallel Shell Processing. This work is being presented by Nikos Vasilakis, who's a postdoc at MIT, and Konstantinos Kalas, a PhD student at University of Pennsylvania. HASH is open source, and you should definitely try it out. Uh, so please play the video now. Hi, I'm Nikos. Hi, I'm Konstantinos, and uh, today we're going to talk to you about FAS, um, a data parallel system for the cell. Shell scripts are everywhere because the shell is everywhere. It is a default system interface, even in environments that do not contain other programming languages. It's a universal composition environment that allows the composition of programs that are written in any programming language. This allows really succinct program composition for data processing or system administration. To explain the basics of Unix pipelines, we'll show you a classic example. Given an input document, how to compute the top n, where n could be five, words and their counts. In Unix, you can express the solution to this problem using a single line Unix pipeline. The first stage, TR, converts any non-alphanumeric character to a new line character. The next stage converts everything into a lowercase character. The stage after that sorts words in the stream so that identical words end up being next to each other. The next stage eliminates any duplicates and counts the repetition. The last of one stage sorts all these counts in reverse numerical order, and the last stage outputs only the number of lines necessary, in our case, five. This works great if we have one input file, but how would it work if we had hundreds of files? It would take a long time to process the input. Why is automated shell script parallelization so difficult? First, even if we look at an individual command, it may be written in any of many programming languages, so it's not amenable to a single analysis. In several cases, a completely opaque black box. On top of that, the shell language primitives provide additional constraints that have to be taken into account. And finally, there is some runtime support necessary for hooking things together, making sure the results are correct, accelerating the computation, and other issues. 
We have developed a system called PASH that solves these challenges and offers mostly automated parallelization of Unix shell scripts. Suppose you have a shell script like the one on the left. The first thing that PASH does is parse the script to create an abstract syntax tree. And then it attempts to compile this abstract syntax tree into a data flow intermediate representation. It then applies several transformations iteratively, depending on key information about these commands. Next, it generates the parallel script that is ready for execution. Today, we will discuss three components in detail. The first is the annotation language that provides key properties about the parallelizability of individual commands. Second, the data flow model and associated transformations. And third, selective components from the runtime library. Let's start with the annotations. We conducted an extensive parallelizability study across individual Unix commands and designed an annotation language for extensibility purposes. Now, the average Linux path contains thousands of commands, so we wouldn't be able to study and characterize all of them. Instead, we opted for two smaller, but representative and widely used sets of commands. The first is the POSIX set. The second is the GMU core utility library. Studying the commands in these sets, we devised four broad parallelizability classes. Rather than describing a command's full observable behavior, these classes focus on key information that's important for data parallelism. There are lots of interesting details here, like the interaction between flags and the order of input consumption that you will have to read in the paper. This study led to the design of a small domain-specific language for annotating commands. This language essentially defines a bidirectional correspondence framework between commands and nodes in the data flow model. They effectively instruct PASH on how to translate a command instance to a data flow node, but also back from the parallel data flow graph to the parallel shell script. In turn, we use this parallelizability DSL to annotate commands in POSIX, a GNU code util, as well as commands found in the wild. So let's now move to the second contribution of our work, which is the data flow model and the corresponding transformations. So, as we mentioned in the challenges, the shell language enforces dependencies and scheduling constraints that, we, that, the, that the parallelizing compiler needs to be aware of. So, in this case, the first cut needs to execute before the second cut due to this semicolon here. Therefore, passes compiler frontend first identifies all regions of the code that do not have any scheduling constraints and transforms each one of them into a data flow graph. For example, in this case, we have two data flow graphs, and let's look at the first one. As you can see, there's cut uh, a processing node for the flow graph that reads from two inputs, f1 and f2, and then writes to, to out.txt. Um, the semantics of the graph is of the flow graphs in our model is that they have no scheduling constraints. So all nodes of them in them execute concurrently, uh, communicating with channels that behave exactly as uh, Unix FIFOs. And uh, each data flow graph uh, takes as, a, as input a set of input files and writes to a set of output, of output files, uh, possibly including its standard input and standard output. Um, the important thing to note is that uh, each data flow graph does not do any other side effects on the environment. Um, here, similarly, the second data flow graph would be, would be this, the cut reads from out and then writes to its standard output. So let's now focus on um, a slightly more complex um, uh, pipeline that is only one data flow graph so that we can look at the transformations that a patch um, uh, performs. Uh, and note that all of the transformations that patch performs are semantics preserving. So the, given the semantics of the input files and the uh, output files, patch will perform transformations that will ensure that the output, um, so the output files of the, the transformed data flow graph will be exactly the same um, as the original ones. So. Let's look at the first. So, so this is this is our pipeline here. So as you can see, there's cat that reads from F1 and F2, writes to TR, writes to sort, which then writes to out.txt. And um, let's look at the first transformation that we could do. So first, uh, we could actually parallelize TR by splitting its input um, and then merging its output using a cat. And this we can actually do because TR is stateless, um, uh, from our, uh, which is something to know from the correspondence framework. So after that, uh, we can apply a second transformation that removes a cut followed by a split that has um, where the cut has the same number of inputs as the split has outputs. So in this case, uh, by removing those two, we get that F1, the first TR reads directly from F1 and the second TR reads directly from F2, getting rid of this unnecessary merging and splitting. In our paper, we uh, we have um, the transformations that we showed here, and and we give a lot more details about them. 
So um, if you want if you want more details, uh, you can read the full paper. Let's switch to Pasha's runtime system. Pasha's runtime support solves several challenges, a few of which I'm going to outline below. These challenges are related to performance and correctness characteristics of the parallel scripts. Details about these and other problems are in the paper. Consider the parallel grep program on the left as a result of Pasha's compilation process. The problem with this program is that cat will first read from the first input stream up to completion and then will start reading from the second screen. That means that the second grep will block until the first grep completes. A possible but inadequate solution would be to use intermediary files. This solution would allow the two grep commands to proceed in a data parallel fashion at the cost of pipeline parallelism. Pash's runtime support solves this problem by offering a buffering primitive that pulls incoming streams eagerly, thus allowing upstream commands to execute in parallel. Eager is a normal Unix command available outside of the Pash context and is designed in a way that fits into the data flow model. Great. So let's now look at the demo. Let's figure out how does it look like running Pash on a real cell script. So to start, we'll show the cell script that we showed in the beginning of the presentation. This cell script has uh, the pipeline uh, that finds the top 100 words in, the, in a piece of text. And before that, it exports this input variable pointing at this input file. Note that this export has to be run before the script itself for, um, for this to work. So let's first set this um, input to be 100 megabytes. And um, Let's run the script with bash and see what is the output that we get. One eternity later. Great. It took 43 seconds. So let's try running the same thing with bash. Where with pass and width two, where we keep the output of pass on this separate file. Amazing. It took 29 seconds. So let's now run this. Let's first of all look at whether the outputs of these two are the same, and they are actually the same. So let's now look a little bit at our evaluation. We will show a case study, um, some information from a case study that is a long weather analysis script um, that was taken from the Hadoop book. So this script actually contains several stages of data fetching, data pre-processing, cleanup and filtering, and finally the calculating. And uh, Hadoop, the Hadoop book only focuses on this part, which is actually about 100 lines of Java code and only four stages in the shell script pipeline. So we actually re-implemented this calculation as a cell script. And then we run this whole script um, using bash. And bash, as you can see, the first part, which is only pre-processing, takes 33 minutes and 58 seconds for um, five years of weather analysis data. And the second part takes 10 minutes and four seconds. This is for 82 gigabytes of data that are four years of um, weather data. And if we execute the same thing with bash, with bash, we can see that it speeds up the first part by almost two times uh, for the pre-processing. And then the calculation part, it speeds up by 12 times. And uh, the combined speed up is about 252. But the important thing to note is that traditional parallelization frameworks do not focus at all on this first part. And this actually, in this case, has the biggest impact for um, execution time. Um, in our paper, we actually have more evaluation that you can go check out if you want to. So to conclude, PASS proposes a parallelizing compiler that takes a shell script and returns a parallel shell script that can be executed on top of the user standard shell. It also addresses extensibility issues by proposing a correspondence framework that is based on the study of many commands, including the full set of POSIX and GNU core utils. PASS is open sourced and can be found in the link here. I finally want to close with the fact that there is a lot of recent research on the shell, enabling fresh perspectives on old problems. Let's rehabilitate the shell together. Thank you. Thank you. 
so we have a few questions from Slack here. Uh, so the first one is from Eric Aide from University of Utah. Uh, the question is, how fragile are PASH's optimizations? For example, in section 6.2 of your paper, you discuss the non-optimizability of an ARC pipeline that is e equivalent to a single sort, where that single sort would be optimizable. In this sense, minor differences uh, in the way one writes pipelines can have a big impact on optimizability and little changes can possibly break optimizations. How often have you observed these kinds of issues in the scripts you have experimented with? Thank you. Uh, thanks for the question. Um, yeah, uh, we didn't find this that often, to be honest. Um, uh, the, the difference, I guess, is that if you... Um, um, you could use, uh, if, if you change the commands that you're using uh, and you use different commands that have exactly the same output, uh, but have completely different um, annotations, then in, indeed uh, pass cannot, uh, applies different uh, optimizations or maybe cannot even optimize or maybe can optimize better. So in the long version of uh, the video, we actually show um, some uh, specific script that. I think this is a script that uh, Eric actually refers to, uh, where we get huge performance improvement by, the, by replacing this up with a uh, sort. Okay, we have one more question from Taeyang Zhao. I'm wondering if PASH works with arbitrary command line programs. So the question is, does, does PASH work with arbitrary command line programs? I can offer an answer. So, um, so command line programs are, are built in the language of the shell. So, um, so in that sense, yes, it, it can work uh, with uh, programs, shell scripts, programs, lead, arbitrary programs written in the shell uh, language, uh, but they're primitives. Uh, so the, the commands that these programs use uh, are arbitrary, it can be binaries or, or shell scripts um, themselves or, or Python programs. So there, Pash does require these annotations that we presented at the at the very as, as the first contribution of the talk. Of course, it's a crowdsourced effort, like in other uh, systems. Uh, so it can work with arbitrary programs there as well, uh, but it will require some information. Otherwise, um, conservatively, it will just not parallelize uh, that fragment of the program. If that makes sense. Yes, just to to, to clarify this point, I think uh, if uh, as Nico said, if it does not have the annotations. Uh, it still is conservative running the original script in that part. So the shell script can actually execute correctly, but not in parallel. Okay. Uh, so let's thank our speakers and we'll move on to the next talk. Uh, the second talk is on virtual machine preserving host updates for zero day patching in public cloud. The presentation is from Mark Resinovic, but we have Naga Govindraju with us to answer the questions after the talk. So please play the video. Welcome to Virtual Machine Preserving Host Updates for Zero Day Patching in Public Cloud. The other researchers on this project are Naga Govindraju, Malur Raghuraman, David Hepkin, Jamie Schwartz, and Arun Kishan, and we're all with Microsoft Corporation. In Azure, we have millions of servers running tens of millions of virtual machines. We periodically have to update the hypervisor, the host operating system, and the virtualization stacks on those servers to deploy reliability fixes, security updates, and roll out new features. One of the challenges that we face is that our update mechanism needs to be able to deal with zero day fixes, those secure, ur security urgent fixes that need to be deployed not in days or weeks, but within hours. We will also want to avoid full host operating system reboots that cause virtual machines to also reboot because that causes major application downtime, also causes loss of cache state for applications, which is extremely disruptive. So our goal when we started out this work was to come up with a, an update mechanism for our fleet where we could update millions of servers without rebooting virtual machines and apply that mechanism for zero day updates where those updates would have to roll out across the fleet in hours and not days, as I mentioned. Back in 2012, we started working on Virtual Machine Preserving Host Updates, or VMFU. The idea behind VMFU is fairly straightforward. 
the first step is to simply freeze the virtual machine state in memory, then soft reboot the operating system underneath those virtual machines, and re then restore the state of those virtual machines and continue running them. The virtual machines in this case, instead of experiencing a shutdown followed by a restart, simply experience a small blackout time. And our goal is to, of course, minimize this uh, period, period of blackout. We faced several challenges as we continued to develop this, as our fleet got more sophisticated. We have several types of hardware accelerated devices that virtual machines can use. One of them is our network adapter, which is accelerated using SROV. With these types of devices, we first, before the VM foo operation, fall back to a, a software shadow version of the network adapter. This causes a small brownout to the network performance of the virtual machine, followed by the blackout through VM foo. After the resume, we enable hardware acceleration and the network performance goes back to normal operation. The second type of accelerated devices we have are direct uh, discrete device assignment devices or DDA devices. These are devices where, that are directly attached to the virtual machine and so have no data path through the host. There's no software fallback therefore. So we need to handle DMA and interrupt processing while the host operating system is being updated. The solution for this is to keep the IOMMU active during the soft reboot. Maintaining the DMA and interrupt mappings across the reboot so that the devices are mapped to the same addresses into the virtual machine. So when the virtual machines resumed after the soft reboot, we inject interrupts for the, each device that were missed while the hypervisor was online, and that causes the virtual machine not to lose any of its IOs. So let's go take a look at, at a rebootless update demo on a production server with GPU DDA VM on top of it, where we're gonna update the store VSP virtualization storage driver. Here I've got two remote desktop windows open. One of them on the right side is connected to a virtual machine running in Azure's infrastructure. That virtual machine you can see here in Device Manager has four NVIDIA GPUs connected to it in DDA mode. It's running a GPU intensive 3D Mark benchmark, and I've got a script running on it that will detect blackouts caused by VM foo through clock drifts. On the left side, I've got an RDP connection to the host that that virtual machine is running on. When I run the update command script, it's going to do a VM foo update of the store virtualization driver on that host. Pausing the VM for just one second, you can see, as detected by the blackout script. The 3D benchmark continues uninterrupted. Like I mentioned, one of the key goals is to reduce the blackout time caused by VM foo, which has three main contributions. One of them is the reboot time for the hypervisor and host operating system. Another is the time it takes to close virtual machine devices. And the third contribution is the memory preservation time. Let's take a look at each of these. The first, the time it takes to reboot the operating system is impacted by all of the IO operations it takes to read the new kernel image and drivers and other components off of the storage medium. This can take tens of seconds on hard disks. So our solution in this case is to cache the reads and writes in memory and preserve them across a reboot. And this causes the reboot to actually occur from an in-RAM image. You can see the difference on the right, a logarithmic scale look at a normal reboot of the host operating system compared to a KSR soft reboot, which avoids the hardware reboot. And then finally, the KSR cache optimized reboot. You can see that the cache optimized reboots are below 10 seconds, even on hard disks SKUs, where the host operating system is stored on a hard disk, whereas can be upwards of 100 plus seconds in the normal reboot case. The second primary contribution is through the time it takes to close virtual machine devices. And in this case, if there's a straggler device, for example, a remote disaggregated disk that takes a long time to acknowledge the close operation as a virtual machine is being frozen and about to, uh, we're about to enter the blackout time, that wait for that straggling IO causes blackout times for all virtual machines because we can't actually enter the soft reboot phase. 
So our solution here is to fast close the devices. What we do in that case is to serialize any in-flight IOs. Uh, IOs by definition are idempotent. So once we save them, we after the soft reboot and we resume the virtual machine, we can restore the virtual machine and replay those serialized IOs. And we didn't incur any delays in closing those devices. We implemented this as a storage resiliency feature in Windows Server 2016. And then the final optimization that we made was to minimize the time it takes to preserve memory. The Windows Memory Manager by default uses linked lists for maintaining free regions of memory. So marking these pages is in use, which is required for the VMFU operation is an order n squared operation where n is the number of memory runs for the virtual machines. If virtual machines memory has become very fragmented, this operation of marking those pages as in use can delay again the time that those virtual machines are sitting in blackout. In fact, we've seen cases where on the right side you can see blackout times of above a thousand seconds when memory is extremely fragmented. So what we did was change the memory manager data structure to introduce an ON algorithm, which is based on a sorted list for the virtual machine memory runs. Using this approach, we are able to minimize the time it takes to preserve memory down into just a few seconds. Let's go take a look at a demo of a rebootful update on a production system running active VMs. Like before, I've got two remote desktop windows. On the right side, a connection to a virtual machine running on an Azure host. In that virtual machine, I'm gonna start a download of a very large file, which will represent a running application in that virtual machine. I also have a script that is be detecting VMFU blackout through clock drift. The remote desktop on the left side is connected to that Azure host that that virtual machine is running on. And I'm gonna run a script that's gonna update the kernel image of that host. That update is gonna proceed in several steps. In the first step, the kernel image is loaded into memory. That will take a few seconds. After that's complete, the virtual machine will be fast saved. At that point, VM will enter blackout period. The host will then kernel soft reboot into the new kernel image and then resume the virtual machine. When the kernel soft reboot starts, we're gonna lose a connection to the host. And so the remote desktop window on the left side is gonna close. We'll see at the same time a pause in the output of that application on the right. When the virtual machine is resumed, the script will print the blackout that was experienced. And you can see at that point, the application continues its download. We've been using VMFU in production since 2015. And at this point, we use it approximately two to three times per year to apply a rebootless update and approximately one time a year for rebootful updates. The failure rates we achieve, which are largely due to hardware issues that are uncovered during the VMFU operation, is about 0.1%. And the graph shows the blackout times that we see across VMs for both rebootful and rebootless updates, where for rebootful updates, we see blackout times ranging anywhere between roughly 12 seconds up to about 20 seconds at the P100. And for rebootless updates, blackout times range from roughly two seconds up to about nine seconds at the P100 with the average rough right around five seconds. Our VMFU has some limitations. It's designed for host operating system updates, like I mentioned. It can't be used for some of the other data center, data center scenarios where we wanna minimize impact of virtual machines, like for moving virtual machines off of hardware that we're gonna decommission onto newer hardware or dynamically load balancing virtual machines across server for better resource utilization or power efficiency across the data center, or to migrate virtual machines off of a server that is about to have an imminent hardware failure. For these types of operations, live migration is a better fit, and that's what we employ. There's also cases where applications can't tolerate the VMFU blackout pause. So for those types of applications, we send a scheduled maintenance event into the virtual machine roughly 15 minutes before the VMFU operation will take place. And that gives the applications in those virtual machines an opportunity to either fail away from the VMFU operation or prepare for it. And for customers that want full control over VMFU or opt out of it completely, we support that with our dedicated host offering.
So in sum, BMFU represents a fast in-place update mechanism that we can apply universally for all updates, security, reliability, and feature updates across the entire Azure fleet with no requirement for turn space. And importantly, it can serve as an update mechanism for zero day updates that have to be deployed across the entire fleet within hours instead of days or weeks. We've applied it in production. We've achieved very low blackout times within the second range. And we continue to make optimizations to bring that blackout time down. If you have questions or feedback, feel free to contact me at markrus at microsoft.com or naga at nagag at microsoft.com. Do you have questions or feedback? Great, thank you. Uh, there are a couple of questions on the Slack which have been already answered. Uh, so I'll, I'll ask some other question. Um, are there any kind of uh, host OS updates that still cannot be deployed without requiring a complete reboot of the host uh, of the yeah of the entire system? I think the technique that we have. Um, uh, assumes that the memory mappings do not change. So if there is any kind of an issue which requires the memory layout to change, then obviously virtual machine preserving updates uh, will not work. Um, in those cases, things like layer migration would be a better fit. But uh, as far as we've seen you know, um, in our fleet over the last decade, um, we were able to manage the um, updates to the host without requiring any of those changes to the memory layouts. And we are very strict in terms of making sure the development processes um, do not break those constraints. Um, okay, so would it be compatible with, say, if you were to use address space layout randomization? Yeah, uh, ASLR, all of those uh, work uh, fine. Those are not an issue because the memory being preserved is actually the VM memory. Um, and the host components, which are basically like, I mean, having um, you know the drivers which get enlightened and they can store their data, it's serialization and deserialization. Um, and the remaining host reboots, just like you know any normal reboot. Um, so ASLR works fine. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, let's thank the speakers um, and we'll move on to the next talk. Uh, so the third talk in the session is parallelizing packet processing in container overlay networks. And this is being presented by Manish Munikar, a PhD student at University of Texas at Arlington. Please play the video. Hi everyone. I am Manish Munikar from UT Arlington. And our paper is called Parallelizing Packet Processing in Container Overlay Networks. In this paper, we propose an improved packet processing framework in Linux designed to improve the performance of container overlay networks by utilizing idle CPU resources in a multi-core system. So let's start with some context and the problem statement. We can all see that container technology has been a revolution for the cloud because it provides many benefits compared to traditional virtual machines. For example, they provide lightweight operating system level virtualization that is smaller, faster, and easier to manage. Using orchestration tools like Kubernetes, most of the modern cloud applications are deployed on a swarm of containers coordinating with each other. And therefore, the inter-container traffic in the cloud is increasing day by day. But how do containers actually communicate? Note that containers belonging to the same virtual network can be running on different physical hosts. So it turns out there are a number of ways to connect containers with their own, with their own pros and cons but the overlay mode is the de facto method due to their uh, support for proper isolation and flexibility. Overlay networks work by encapsulating the container packet with an outer packet that is routable on the physical host network. In this way, containers can have their own private IP addresses independent of other networks in the system. VXLAN is the most popular encapsulation protocol which encapsulates the container packet as an outer UDP payload. As an example, the original, the original container packet is shown here in the orange color, and it is encapsulated by an outer UDP packet shown in blue color. The VXLAN header in the middle is used to identify this as an encapsulated packet, and the destination of the packet is determined by matching the VXLAN network identifier or VNI in the VXLAN header. Now, while they provide all the convenient features, the problem with overlay networks is that they're significantly slower compared to host network. 
For instance, when doing a single flow stress test, overlay network degrades the throughput to um, about 50% for both UDP and TCP. Similarly, it also increases the per packet latency by at least two times. So to find out why overlay network incurs so much overhead, we did extensive packet tracing and code analysis in Linux and came up with two main sources of overhead in the packet processing pipeline of Linux. And to understand them, let's first see an overview of how a packet is processed in Linux. For the host network, the NIC sends a hardware interrupt and the, and the interrupt handler will raise a software interrupt to be processed asynchronously. The software interrupt will parse the packet headers and deliver the packet, the payload to the application. Note that the packet path contains one hardware interrupt and one software interrupt for the host mode. Now for an overlay packet, the story is much more complicated. In the first software interrupt, the outer headers are parsed and the packet is identified as a VXLAN packet. It will then strip the outer headers and send the inner packet to a software bridge connected to the VXLAN virtual device by raising another software interrupt. The bridge will then forward the inner packet to the appropriate um, virtual NIC by raising yet another software interrupt. And finally, the inner headers are parsed and the payload is delivered to the container application. Therefore, an overlay packet has to go through one hardware interrupt and three software interrupts. So the first source of overhead is the need to process extra protocol headers on multiple virtual devices by raising multiple software interrupts. This makes the path of an overlay packet much longer and complicated, and this adds time and CPU overheads. And second, all the software interrupts for the same flow are raised on the same core, causing longer queue delays and load imbalance. Theoretically, different software interrupts of different packets are independent and can be executed parallelly, but they are currently serialized in Linux. The performance issue of overlay networks is a well-known and is a hot topic in network research and different solutions have been proposed to address this problem. For example, one popular class of existing solutions is kernel bypass, where packets are processed directly in custom user space network stack using dedicated cores to pull packets directly from the NIC. This avoids operating system overheads, such as interrupts and context switching, but introduces security management and compatibility issues, preventing it from being um, widely adopted in the public clouds. Another class of recent solutions work by manipulating connection level metadata to translate host and container addresses during connection setup time, which essentially avoids the overhead of virtual devices, but they only work for connection oriented protocols and have limited scope, flexibility, and limited support for data plane policies. Finally, hardware manufacturers have been trying to free the CPU by offloading network processing to the NIC, but they either require expensive hardware upgrades provide limited flexibility or are not backward compatible. In this paper, we take a different approach, which we call Falcon. Our main idea is to accelerate overlay packet processing in Linux by leveraging multi-core architecture. Falcon is a purely software-based solution that is <clears throat> that provides all the convenient features of Linux powerful network stack, but with better performance. Next, I will describe the main designs of Falcon. The first design is software interrupt pipelining. Remember I mentioned that different stages of different packets are independent and parallelizable? Well, that is exactly what we are trying to exploit here. When selecting the destination core to raise software interrupt, currently Linux only hashes based on flow ID, which contains IP and port numbers only. Um, in this illustration, the numbers in the square boxes are packet IDs and the three colors represent the three stages of an overlay packet. And right now, it shows the serialized execution of stages in Linux. But in Falcon, we modify the hashing mechanism to also take device ID into account so that different stages of the same packet are processed on different cores. This figure shows the execution timeline for Falcon. However, for each device, the packets are processed in original sequence and um, therefore we avoid any out of order delivery problems. This technique is most effective when, dif when the different stages of um, different stages have similar processing costs, such as for UDP flows. However, there are flows where one stage is much heavier than others. For example, when GRO is, in when GRO is enabled, most of TCP packet processing happens on the first stage, and the other stages are only invoked for a fraction of the packets. For such flows, we propose a second design, which is software interrupt splitting. The key idea here is to split one big software interrupt into two smaller software interrupts 
so that they can be pipelined onto multiple cores effectively. With dynamic tracing, we found out that for TCP flows, especially um, with large packet sizes, the packet processing is dominated by the first stage, which includes two um, expensive functions, SKB allocation and GRO processing, shown here as A and B respectively. So in Falcon, we split them into two stages by adding a defer function in the middle. The result is a packet processing pipeline with more fine-grained parallelization potential. Note that this design can also accelerate host network processing, as we will see later. Our third and final design is software interrupt balancing. <clears throat> we realized that if the destination core is already highly loaded with other kernel tasks, then dispatching a software interrupt on that core may incur even more queuing delay and may even degrade performance. Therefore, static hashing does not give optimal performance. To mitigate this, we employ a simple dynamic balancing algorithm. For this, we asynchronously monitor the current load on all cores periodically, for example, every timer interrupt. And when we hash the flow and device ID to get the destination core, if the load on that core is already high, then we simply uh, rehash to get a second choice of the destination core. The threshold for this is configurable with a default value of 90%. We also realized that Falcon incurs a small overhead due to loss of packet cache locality and therefore can even degrade performance when the overall system is highly loaded and there is no room for parallelization. To avoid this, we dynamically disable Falcon if the overall system utilization exceeds a certain threshold, which again is configurable and 90% by default. With this, the improvement brought by Falcon gradually decreases with increasing system load, but will never be worse than vanilla performance. Finally, um, I'd like to present our experimental results our test bed contains two Intel servers, each with 40 logical cores and 128 gigabytes of RAM, and they are connected directly by a 100 Gbps link. The operating system we used was Ubuntu 18.04 with Linux kernel version 5.4. For most of the experiments, we compare the performance of Falcon with vanilla container network and sometimes also with the host network. I will show some important results in this talk, but there are many other experiments in the paper that you can refer to. First of all, this is the single flow stress test UDP throughput. As shown in the figure, Falcon significantly and consistently improves the throughput from vanilla container by more than two times. Falcon's performance also gets closer to host performance when the packet size is increased and the per packet overhead is reduced. We also observe similar improvements in single flow latency. The figures show median and tail latencies for single flow stress test for both UDP and TCP. Note that um, compared to host, vanilla container network incurs more than twice latency for both UDP and TCP. But Falcon reduces the latency to be closer to the host network. Now for multi-flow tests, we used a fixed number of cores in the receiving host for packet processing and uh, measured the throughput by increasing, increasing the number of clients on the center side. For UDP, Falcon improves the overlay performance by as much as 55%. And for TCP in the right figure, the host plus represents the effect of Falcon on host performance. So Falcon not only improves the overlay performance by up to 45%, it also improves the host performance by up to 56%. So even though Falcon is designed for overlay networks, it can also improve host performance as well for TCP. Next, we evaluated some common cloud benchmarks such as cloud suits, web serving, and data caching. For web serving, Falcon increases the operation throughput by as much as 300% and reduces the response time by up to 31%. Similarly, in the data caching benchmark with 10 clients, Falcon reduces the latency of memcached queries by about 50% in all cases. So to conclude, the packet processing pipeline in existing operating systems is not optimized for overlay network. Falcon tries to bridge that gap by accelerating overlay packet processing in Linux by leveraging multi-core architecture but without compromising on any features such as security, flexibility, or compatibility. It is a purely software-based solution that is easy to deploy and upgrade. And last but not the least, our implementation is available on GitHub right now. Thank you very much. But without compromising on any features such as security, flexibility, or compatibility. Thanks a lot. Um, so let me get started with... Uh a couple of questions. So one, what is the CPU cost of Falcon? So how much reduction in the 
container workload that can be sustained on a server will be experienced because of Falcon's overheads? Um, so uh, as I mentioned in the presentation, um, when the system is overloaded, uh, for example, greater than 90% used, uh, then if we uh, enable Falcon, then the, we get a performance drop that uh, degrades significantly as, it, as the system gets closer to 100%. So, um, um, for example, um, in our experiments for about 90% uh, system utilization, the, de um, the de degradation was about 10 to 20%. But if the, um, but if the CPU utilization was uh, close to 100%, then the degradation was um, about 30%. Okay. And the other question is, is there any impact on the cache clearance traffic when packets are processed by different parts of the network stack on different cores? So how would that affect the throughput of the flows? Yes, um, so uh, as I mentioned, we do uh, incur some um, mo um, more cache misses than the vanilla Linux, but the, uh, the benefit of our approach due to the parallelization of processing outweighs the, the loss of uh, the performance degradation due to loss of packet uh, cache locality. So um, we are basically compromising a little bit of cache locality to get better performance. Okay. All right. So thank you very much. You. Uh, we'll move on to the next talk. Uh, so this is a talk on confidential computing for open power, uh, which is presented by Gurney Hunt from IBM Research. Please play the video. Good evening. My name is Gurney Hunt. I'm a research staff member at the IBM TJ Watson Research Center. Today, I'm going to be talking to you about our work on confidential computing for open power here at URSYS 2021. The authors would like to point out that this work represents our views and not necessarily those of the IBM Corporation, All the code discussed in this presentation has already been open sourced. We would also like to thank a number of people without whose contributions, this work would not have been possible. Secure computing technology at IBM has been produced since 1998. The first item we did was, a, was an HSM. The next thing we did was produce a secure processor for about six years, and we continued on with additional research as is illustrated on this board. Confidential computing exploits a trusted execution environment to enable a user to confidentially utilize the computing infrastructure. Uh, the infrastructure that's being utilized could be a cloud infrastructure as illustrated in this picture or an in-house infrastructure. Now we're interested in server and in servers, obviously. So the TEs are supported on multiple platforms and generally based on hardware and firmware modifications and support. Examples of server class TEs include IBM Secure Execution for Linux One, AMD SEV, and Intel SGX. Intel has also announced Intel TDX, which will be coming in the future. Properly using a TEE in a cloud infrastructure enables the user to exclude the cloud provider and their staff from their trusted computing base. Now, looking at these server class TEEs that we mentioned on the previous slide, the first one that came into the market was Intel SGX, which uses a remote attestation model, but does not naturally have natively have application transparency. However, application transparency can be added through additional software. The next one into the market was AMD SEV, which is a VM-based TEE as opposed to the process focus of Intel SGX. Since it was VM-based, it natively has application transparency and it also uses remote attestation. The next available commercial server class TEE was IBM Z Secure Execution for Linux One. It introduced the concept of local attestation and is also VM based. The next one is IBM PEF, which is the work we're talking about in this paper. It also uses local attestation, it's VM based and it allows sharing of secure memory between, between executing TEEs or SVMs and it's fully open source. Intel TDX, which is coming at some point it's similar to AMD SCV being VM-based, achieving native application transparency and using remote attestation. The objectives of our work include creating this open source server class TE for open power and balancing between isolation and confidentiality, minimizing the new 
the number of new elements that we introduce, creating secure virtual machines with more protections than normal virtual machines, simplifying lifecycle management for the cloud provider and balancing the needs of the, in, those involved in the cloud infrastructure and having minimal impact on normal virtual machines. The threat model for a secure virtual machine is ra rather straightforward. It could be attacked by another secure virtual machine, by a VM running on the same platform, by the hypervisor, by the operator of the, of the platform, and in certain situations, by, through a physical attack. We're trying to protect again. We're, inter we're interested in protecting against all of these. Our approach was hardware enforced access control for isolation, which means memory is partitioned into secure memory and normal memory. Cryptography for integrity and, and confidentiality. We create this new power processing state called Ultravisor state, which is higher privileged and has new firmware called the Ultravisor. Everything that affects the security of the system is under the control of the Ultravisor. And this enables secure virtual machines. And the function and purpose of the hypervisor is unchanged. But that means it utilizes the Ultravisor to accomplish some tasks. Verifying the integrity of the system is important, and this verification relies on secure and trusted root to generate a value representing the hardware vendor and the hardware state, which is placed in PCR6. During verification, the Ultravisor uses the TPM to confirm that the value specified by the creator of the SVM. The verification relies on the creator of the SVM to specify which machine is authorized to run the SVM. All of this is done by specifying a a public key of a target machine and a PCR6 value and policy. A lockbox gives the target machine access to a symmetric seed protecting the SVM. If the alternizer does not find a valid lockbox, the machine is not authorized. If the PCR6 value and policy are not correct, the ultravisor will not have access to the symmetric seed. Each time the SVM starts, the state of the system and the integrity of the SVM are verified. Balancing the need among cloud providers, users, and equipment manufacturers means that some, we found that some applications require to be able to have two SVMs share the same memory. Others are facilitated more, more easily by that, and ver most of them don't need that particular feature. Open power manufacturers supply firmware to update their customers to fix issues, bugs, whatever. Cloud providers want to be able to add and subtract machines from the infrastructure without affecting their TEEs. This includes transparently applying firmware updates. Users of TEs often want to be able to exclude their cloud provider from their TCB. Some customers want to retain control of their secrets. Users of TEs want to be able to specify the requirements of an acceptable platform. Now for cloud integration, we have these points. Our design allows the authorization for a TE to execute on a particular machine to be inserted just prior to execution. To the per we propose to utilize a hardware security module to generate an authorization which meets the, the creator specification. It's important to note that HSMs are already in cloud infrastructures. They're used by customers to do computations without releasing customer secrets to the cloud provider that provides the infrastructure. The HSM is controlled by the creator of the SVM, but part of the cloud provider's infrastructure allows the creator of the SVM to specify the requirements that tar the target system must fulfill. And our evaluation of this approach focused on functionality and security of PF, not performance optimizations. Functionality was tested by running multiple virtual machines with different workloads. We investigated the difference between the NVM and SVM performance. We ran our evaluation on IBM AC 925s configured to run with PEF enabled. Now spec CPU int rate and int speed there is basically no difference. You can see that in these charts. You, on one of the in-speed uh, demos, you can see that the NVM on, on PEF was affected a little bit more, but by and large, there's essentially no difference. We use this, real, we use the Apache AB benchmark to measure the impact on real world applications. What we're showing here is a slowdown factor. And, and, you can, and as you would expect, smaller blocks have more overhead than, than larger blocks. And the concurrency also causes, causes more slowdown than if you're not, if, it's, if there's no concurrency. Summarizing this, the, CP, the CP, computationally intensive code will see no, no impact. 
There are also no impact of no significant impact to boot time, which we didn't illustrate in this talk. The network and block performance tests showed some impact for, for PEF, but as I indicated, smaller blocks have more overhead than larger blocks, and the extra overhead appears to be because of the bounce buffer. Now, the complexity of the approach is it's not very complex. You can see from the K-lock and K-byte size chart that the that the number of lines of code is significantly less than the than the lines of code of a minimal Linux KVM implementation that supports virtual machines upon which it can run. You can also see that it's substantially smaller in memory size. In our, in our Linux support, all of these changes have been upstreamed as I indicated. Post-kernel power virtualization was only 248 lines of code. The HMN support was only 267 lines of code. The secure VM kernel enablement was 461 lines of code, and, and adding the 6H cost to QMU was 292 lines of code. Now, there are some limitations in our approach. Though we can do all, though, though the, the architecture supports all of these things, they're not implemented in what has been upstream today. Specifically, suspend, resume, and migration of secure virtual machines, over commit of secure memory and secure virtual machines, dedicating a device to a secure virtual machines, the XIV interrupt controller, which is a performance optimization, and the sharing of secure memory between secure virtual machines. Sharing of secure memory between secure virtual machines was demonstrated in an earlier prototype. Protected execution facility architecture also does not support transactional memory. This means that if an application uses transactional memory and runs in an SVM, it will crash. There's some con contact information for myself if you're interested in doing some research on the or on this area or on this stuff, you could get a hold of me. If you're interested in getting hardware to play around with or to, to, to use, talk to your, your favorite open power vendor or your IBM representative. If you want to know about open power vendors, you can talk to the Open Power Foundation as illustrated here. Now on the right are the two badges that our research earned. The first one showing that the artifacts are available and the second one showing, showing that they actually are functional. They were, they were generated as part of our submission process and they verify that these instructions that we put in GitHub along with our code, if you have them and you have the hardware, you can get to this environment. Thanks very much for attending this talk. Do you have any questions? Thank you very much. So we have Granny Hunt and also Ram Pai, one of the co-authors of this paper, available to answer the questions. And we have one question from Slack here from Andrew Bowman. Could you expand on what you mean by local attestation? How does a remote user attest uh, cloud hosted DEE? So local attestation is not remote attestation. It means that the ultravisor verifies the measurements that are required by the user prior to allowing the, the SVM to execute. The ultravisor, the user, it's explained in more detail in the paper basically there's a parameter to a, a a new call that passes to the to the ultravisor securely the necessary numbers and the ultravisor takes the measurements of the of the vm and verifies that it's correct as we pointed out in the paper remote attestation can be supported but it is not currently supported okay we have one more question from marno uh, the question says, could you use this confidential computing system to protect small parts of applications as opposed to whole virtual machines? This is a VM-based approach, not a process-based approach. So everything that must be protected is embedded in a VM. Uh, SGX, Intel's approach, is a process-based approach and assumes that you're partitioning the application. SEV, AMD's approach, and IBM's approach, and others including Intel TDX, all assume you're protecting an entire virtual machine. Right, and so actually a follow-up to that, uh, do you think there will be support for in future for an SGX like uh, a TEE on the power architecture? Is there any reason to consider it or not consider it in your case? Uh, since I work for IBM, I'm not allowed to talk about future hardware. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, and we'll move on to the 
Last talk of the session, this is on-demand fork, a microsecond fork for memory intensive and latency sensitive applications. The presenter is Kayang Zhao from Purdue University. Please play the video. Hello, I'm Kayang Zhao from Purdue University. Today, I'm going to present on-demand fork, a fast design and implementation of the fork system call. A lot of us interact with shells every day. If I type in Vim in the bash shell, the Vim text editor is started for us. Behind the scene, a fork system call is used. To recap, a fork system call on Unix-like systems create, creates a child process by duplicating the calling process's kernel state, including a version memory, file descriptors, permission, etc. Traditionally, fork is used to run a new program. For example, when a user types bin in a bash shell, bash creates a child process with a fork system call and then runs bin using another system call, exec. Fork has many more modern uses than simply running a new program. Applications also use fork to clone a process instance. For example, buzzers and testing frameworks use fork to take test inputs. Serverless frameworks use fork to run Lambda functions serving user requests. Databases use fork to take snapshots. These applications, unlike shells, can have significant memory footprints from megabytes all the way to terabytes. Fork might be fast enough that an allocated memory is no more than a few megabytes, but with increasingly large memory footprints of applications, fork is getting slower. How slow, you might ask, at 50 bytes of allocated memory, a fork call can take over 250 milliseconds on average to complete. We will look into why forks become slow in a moment. But first, let's see how bad is this 250 milliseconds of latency. The high latency of fork is detrimental to sensitive latency sensitive applications. Take Redis and the memory key value store, for example. It supports persistence by taking snapshots and periodically calls fork to take snapshots of its data. But during the fork system call, which will last a very long time if the database is large, Redis is unable to serve any user requests. In the meantime, requests from users just keep queuing, resulting in noticeable latency spikes. Fork call blocks Redis from handling user requests. And just like Redis, there are many other applications that call fork on their critical paths. Such high tail latency caused by fork is unacceptable in many latency-sensitive settings. Fork also has an efficiency problem. During the fork system call, the entire address space of the child process is set up, but some applications only access a small portion of the memory in the child process. For example, when an application is being fussed, most of the, most of the input will exercise the application's error paths, and executions will mostly be short-lived. As a result, most of the work of setting up the address space of the child process will be wasted. We want to know why does fork have the latency and efficiency problems, especially when the size of an application gets get large. The answer is that fork provides distinct address spaces for the parent and the child processes by copying page tables from the parent process to the child process. As shown in the diagram here, Page tables are structured as a tree and have four levels, typically. Each level has typically 512 times more tables than the upper level. The more memory a process consumes, the more page tables it has, especially on the last level. This might be fine when applications only use a little bit of memory, like shells. But as memory gets large, the tree will get fat, especially on the fourth level, or we call the last level. This makes copying the entire paging tree prohibitively expensive. Copying page tables will progressively get slower and dominate the cost of fork. In fact, the cost will be linear to the size of allocated memory. People have attempted to use huge pages to speed up fork for large applications. What happens is that instead of having four levels of paging tree, the huge page is described by a three-level tree. For a given size of allocated memory, Larger size pages are fewer in number, meaning fewer page tables copied during the fork system call, therefore faster fork system call. 
huge pages can lower the latency of fork but suffer from the following problems. A page that is over 500 times larger is more likely to experience internal fragmentation and takes longer to copy in a page fold. Also, finding contiguous physical memory large enough to form a huge page also takes longer, causing system-wide latency spikes. In fact, if you Google huge pages, a very common question people ask is how to disable huge pages. Can we have a solution that is compatible with fork, but is faster and more efficient? We propose on-demand fork, a novel design and implementation of the fork system call. On-demand fork only copies top levels of page tables and shares the last level of page tables during the system call, therefore avoiding the cost of copying them. On-demand fork can substantially reduce the fork system call latency, achieving microsecond level latency for up to 50 gigabytes of memory in our experiments. On-demand fork does not suffer from issues plaguing huge pages, such as fragmentation and pulses. After a call to on-demand fork, if the application reads from a memory address, the access goes through by translating virtual addresses using the dedicated top-level page tables of the process, and then by shared last-level page tables. This means that applications using on-demand fork won't incur cost of copying page tables for read access. There are several challenges involved, one of which is to preserve the copying rights semantics of the traditional fork. Copying right refers to the rule that the parent and the child process after fork have the same view of the memory, but changes to memory are not visible in the other process. This is achieved by disabling the write permission in lasso page tables during the fork system call. Here we use a simplified paging tree to illustrate this. But if either of the two processes try to write to memory, the process will trigger a page fault and get its private copy of the physical memory page, and the corresponding page table entry will be updated. On-demand fork disables the write permission in the second to last level page table entries, utilizing the hierarchical attributes capability of common architectures to control the write permission of the entire region mapped by the last level page table. Because processes may eventually write to memory after on-demand fork system call, which necessitates updates to page table entries, unshared or dedicated page tables may be required eventually. So on-demand fork copies page tables on demand during page folds. The rule is that there are page folds for write access only. The page fold handler checks whether the last level page table is shared. If so, it makes a copy of the shared last level page table for the faulting process. It then proceeds to handle copy and write of data pages. Notice that the increased cost due to copying of a huge copying of a page table in the page fold handler only exists for the first write access to each two megabyte region after fork. Now that we have an understanding of on-demand fork, let's look at how it performs. We tested on-demand fork with microbenchmarks on system call latency and page fold handling time. For system call latency, we measured the time it takes to call fork and on-demand fork for a process with different allocated memory sizes. We showed that on-demand fork runs 65 times faster than the traditional fork at one gigabyte of memory. On-demand fork runs 270 times faster at 50 gigabyte of memory. Also, on-demand fork runs faster than using huge pages with the traditional fork. Because on-demand fork may have to copy one page table plus one data page when handling a page fault in the worst case, we want to make sure that its page fault handling time is reasonable. From our experiments, on-demand fork has 5.3 times longer page fault handling time in the worst case, whereas huge pages take 86.3 times longer. Recall that the worst case of on-demand fork happens only when the, during the first access to each two megabyte region after fork and subsequent memory access will not incur additional cost compared to the traditional fork. On-demand fork delivers much faster system call latency while keeping page fault overhead acceptable. On-demand fork benefits real-world applications by reducing fork latency. As we have discussed earlier, Redis is a key-value key store that calls fork on the critical path when taking snapshots. 
In our experiment, Redis initializes about one gigabyte of data and takes snapshots periodically. Comparing fork with on-demand fork, on-demand fork gives Redis a 98% lower fork latency when, when doing snapshots. When measured from the client side, on-demand fork gives Redis a 65.95% lower tail request latency at 99.99 percentile. This improves the responsiveness of latency sensitive applications and helps mitigate high tail latency in data center settings. On demand fork also benefits world war applications by increasing throughput. We tested American Fuzzy Lob or AFL to demonstrate this. AFL is a coverage guided fuzzer that instruments the target application, which is CQLite in our experiment to execute to a customizable point in its code and repeatedly calls fork to take new inputs. Comparing when using the traditional fork versus on-demand fork, on-demand fork gives AFL a 2.26 times higher fuzzing throughput. This allows bugs to be found sooner during a fuzzing campaign and improves the cost effectiveness of fuzzing as a bug finding method. In conclusion, the traditional fork is slow, whereas on-demand fork is low latency and efficient. It's low latency because of deferring work of copying page tables from the system call to the page flow handlers. And it's efficient because of, per, it per, per, because of performing the work of copying page tables selectively. From our experiments, we show that on-demand fork is up to 270 times faster than the traditional fork. It gives Redis a 65% lower tail request latency, and it gives AFL a 2.26 times higher fuzzing throughput. It is also our hope that on-demand fork and its characteristics will enable novel design in software. Finally, you can find the source code of on-demand fork at the GitHub link below. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have lower tail request latency. We have a few questions on Slack. Uh, I'll start with the first one from Antonio Barbales. Uh, it says, hi, love to see a pure OS paper at Eurasus. This sounds like the old idea of the VFOX call. Can you comment about the differences? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Uh, so we briefly talked about this uh, in our paper, uh, but here I'll just uh, uh, very briefly explain. So uh, the VFOX system call does not copy page tables at all during the uh, process creation, and uh, therefore it does not allow processes to run concurrently. The, uh, that doesn't allow the uh, child and the parent process to run concurrently. And v fork also does not have uh, the copy and write semantics of the traditional fork supported. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, there's another question from Tom. He says, I love a good old lazy page fault handling mechanism, great work. Is there any reason why you clone at the page descriptor level and not all the way up at the PML4? Yeah, uh, that's also a, a very, uh, very good question. So uh, we, we put a lot of thought into this and uh, uh, we decided on the design based on the, uh, the two, the, these two factors. Uh, the first of which is that there are far more, la la far more lasso page tables than upper level page tables. And because the, uh, the paging structure is a tree. And we thought that by doing on-demand page table copying at all the levels, we will only achieve very limited improvement of latency, but introducing much more complexity to the already complicated uh, virtual memory system of the kernel. And also the second reason is that for the uh, range of memory sizes that we consider, so up to dozens of gigabyte of memory sizes, the, uh, uh, the, uh, our approach of only doing this for the last of page table uh, makes sense uh, in terms of a uh, implementation uh, standpoint. And uh, finally, I want to point out that our design is general and uh, if the need, ar need arises uh, to, to extend this design to all the levels of page tables, we can definitely do that in the future. Okay. We have another question from Saurabh Bakhti. Uh, nice piece of work and well presented. I wonder if you worry about the security implications of sharing memory pages. It would seem that you're messing with the isolation properties of traditional folk. 
Uh, yeah. So, uh, at, at least from the uh, from from the uh, semantics of the uh, system call, our uh, our uh, on-demand fork is uh, identical to the uh, traditional fork. Uh, but uh, for security impl implications, we uh, uh, we we haven't dis discovered anything that's uh, that that will be problematic, but. Uh, we we do we uh we, we will uh consider this uh for our uh, for our future work and uh if uh, there's any specific types of attacks that you have in mind uh feel free to uh discuss offline with us we'd love to uh, hear your feedback on security implica implications yeah okay uh well there's one more minute, so I'm going to ask you a question of my own. So your work seems to focus on fork and using page table sharing, mainly for optimizing the fork performance, right? There yes. could be other scenarios such as when different applications share libraries and where sharing of some of the page table entries could be useful between the different application processes. So in fact, I think there is already some work in this space uh, which might also be able yeah. to then apply to optimizing fork performance, right? So have you looked into it? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, we, we haven't, but I, but from, uh, from your description, I, I feel like our work could be another piece of the puzzle to uh, increase the uh, overall uh, latency or efficiency of the, of the whole system. Okay, thank you very much. And this brings us to the end of this uh, session. And uh, I would now like to hand it over to the organizers. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, thanks Asta for organizing the last session as well, chairing the last session. I think uh, we don't have much to say. We already covered everything. Uh, so thanks again uh, to all our volunteers as well as our local organization team for running the conference. And we hope uh, we will be able to meet each other in the physical world next year. So that's it from our side. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.